My Twin Sister's Extremely Famous and Incredibly Hot Neighbour by Victorine E. Liskey. Chapter One I swipe my paintbrush across the watercolour paper, loving the way the paint spreads on the wet surface. The spindly feathering mesmerises me. A quick flick of my wrist sets another burst of colour into the first. My soul soars as the colour blends and takes shape, and I know this one is going to be fantastic. This will be the perfect background for my next painting. As I reach for my paint tray, my sleeve knocks over my water, and I screech as it splashes over my painting, muddying it and ruining the entire thing. Blast! I jump up and grab a rag to mop up the mess. I try dabbing the paper to see if I can salvage it, but it's no use. The paint comes up as I dab and the magic is gone. I sigh and look around my tiny living room. My desk is crammed in the corner and all of my watercolour paint supplies are stacked against the wall. I film my online classes in here and that equipment takes up half the room. I can barely walk around the space. My bedroom isn't any better. It's so small my bed takes up the entire thing. I seriously need a bigger apartment, but this is all I can afford. My phone sings out my sister's ringtone, which surprises me. It's been several months since we last talked. I pick up. Hello? Mackenzie, how are you? Her unusually chipper voice gives her away. What do you need, Jera? She scoffs. What? Can a girl call her sister just to see how she's doing? I sigh as I mop up muddy water from my desk. I can already tell you want something. Jera is my older sister, but only by a minute and a half. Having a twin was awesome until Jera got a lead role in a movie and became wildly famous. Now I can't go anywhere without being mistaken for her. This explains why I hardly ever leave my Denver apartment. That and crowds of people give me massive anxiety. All right, here's the thing. I need you to come to LA and be me for about a week. I bust out laughing. You're kidding. It's not funny, Mackenzie. It's an emergency. I'm used to Jera being overdramatic, so I don't panic. What happened? Something terrible. Her voice hitches. That's not like her, and I get a bad feeling. Are you crying? My heart lodges itself in my throat as the worst things come to mind. Did she have a car accident? Is it cancer? Is she dying? What is it? I, I had my eyelids done. All my worry whooshes out of me in one big breath. That was not what I was expecting to hear. You what? I know it's shallow, and I know it's cliché, but this business is brutal. I had to fix my eyelids. I gape at the phone. Jera had plastic surgery? What was wrong with them? I desperately needed a lift and tighten. I mean, they were saggy and just... gross. Your eyelids look just like mine, I say, my voice flat. I pick up my soggy rag and walk to the sink. I have to hold my hand under it to make sure it doesn't drip paint on the floor. The landlord already doesn't like me because I spilled paint on the carpet in the hallway. In my defence, the hallway could use new carpet anyway. My stain isn't the only one there. Oh, I'm not saying your eyes are gross. They're fine. You don't have to live with a camera in your face all the time. I think she just insulted me, but I ignore it and move on. I squeeze my rag out and turn on the water. So, why do you need me to trade you places? You don't understand. I've got horrible bruising. It's all around my eyes. I look like a raccoon. She's screeching, and I'm about to hang up on her. Stop. I can't be you. Aside from us both being tall and blonde and wearing the same face, Jera and I are nothing alike. She's outgoing and always the life of the party. I'm awkward with people and would much rather stay home by myself. Yes, you can. No one will know. It's only for a little while and you can stay in my house. I bite my lip as I watch the muddy paint flow from the rag and down the drain. Jera's home is a Barbie dream house, only bigger and with two pools. Don't ask me why she needs two pools. I asked once and got chewed out and never really got a good answer, except that they're different and stop being so judgy. I try not to salivate as I shake my head. I can't. You know I don't accept charity. Jera was always trying to buy me stuff, but I don't need her money. I can make it on my own. I wring the rag and turn off the faucet. 
I sink down on my chair and pull a doggy treat from my pocket. Squint jumps onto my lap and gobbles up the treat. My ex jokingly called my little chihuahua that name when I first got him because he said he was so tiny he had to squint to see him, and the name stuck. The boyfriend didn't. I pet my dog and wait for Jera to respond. No sound comes out of the phone, and for a minute I hold my breath, hoping she's finally come to her senses. But then I hear a sniffle. It's not charity. It's a trade. A moment passes before she whispers, Kenzie, I need you. And I fold like a cheap pile of laundry. My sister and I were best friends growing up. Our family didn't have a lot of money, so we had to find our own things to do. We made up games and played in the neighborhood, but somewhere between high school and movie stardom, we drifted apart. Her pleading with me brings me back to that time when we would do anything for each other. I suddenly want to be there for her. I take in a breath and stare at a mystery stain on my ceiling. What would I need to do? Nothing. I mean, just go to one party in my place. Oh, and one photo shoot, but it's no big deal. A party and a photo shoot? There's no way I can do that. My stomach clenches just thinking about it. I can't be around lots of people without my anxiety flaring up. Jera, I love you, but I can't do that. I have responsibilities here. I have classes to upload. Gah. Why can't I think of something better? It was a dumb excuse, and I can hear how flimsy it sounds. You can do them here, in my house. I'll buy you whatever you need. All new art supplies. My heart leaps at the offer. I've been working with a discount set of paints, but it's all I can afford. I've been wanting new paintbrushes, too. Jera knows my weaknesses. I want to tell her yes, but instead I hear myself say, you don't have to buy me stuff. It's a trade. She elongates the word, and I can't help but seriously think about it. Then I think about the airport and all the people there. I hate flying. I'll send my jet. It's luxury, and you won't have to fly with anyone else. Parties aren't my thing. Even though I'm hedging, I'm already thinking of all the things I'll need to pack. I must be insane. It's a small one. You just need to be seen and then you can leave. Simple, right? Do this for me. Her voice takes on a pleading tone. I want to say yes. I want to help Jera. I'm just not sure I can handle all that entails. Another thought enters my mind and I freeze. What about Luke? Luke was her famous on-again, off-again boyfriend. They were in the celebrity news all the time. He's some big shot actor. He would definitely know I wasn't Jera. We're not seeing each other anymore, so don't worry about him. See? This will be like a vacation for you. I pause, trying to gather up my courage. I could do this, right? Plus, I hadn't seen my sister in forever. We'd get some quality time together. I've missed her. Jera must think I'm going to say no again because she begs. Please, I'll upgrade your apartment. I know you complain about it. I'll get you a three-bedroom in a nicer neighborhood. When I don't say anything, she continues. And I'll pay you for the photo shoot. Five thousand dollars. It's yours. I wonder if I continue to be silent if she'll offer me even more. But instead of holding out, I laugh. All right, all right. You don't have to keep promising me stuff. I'll do it just for the art supplies, as long as I can bring my dog. I'm really excited about the art supplies. Yes, fine. Bring him. Thank you. Squint licks my face as I end the call with my sister. Guess we're going on an adventure, I say as I scoop him up. But even as I try to keep all the perks in my head, the daunting feeling of having made a bad decision squeezes my chest. I shove away the ominous feeling. It's just a week. I only agreed to leave her house twice. Everything should be fine. Chapter 2 I wipe the foggy mirror with a washcloth and try to see my reflection, but the steam in Jera's bathroom is too thick. The second I arrived at my sister's house, her hairdresser whisked me away to get highlights and a cut. Now it's the next day and I'm trying to figure out how to style it. I open the small window to try to let out some steam so I can see my new look. Well, not my look. Jera's look. I comb through my wet hair, one of Jera's expensive oversized towels wrapped around me. It's like being wrapped in fluffy clouds. It goes all the way down to my knees. The shoulder-length cut suits my heart-shaped face, and I smile at my reflection. 
My phone rings and I quickly pick up. Hello? How's everything going? Jera asks. Fine. I slide my feet into a pair of white slippers that Jera had sitting by her jacuzzi tub. This is luxury. When will you get here? I'd been surprised she wasn't home yet. Oh, I'm staying at an exclusive spa until I heal. You have my house all to yourself. What? I thought we'd get quality time. Don't worry, they're taking great care of me here at the spa. The mirror is now clear, so I go to close the window, but it's a bit stuck. I tug at it while I try to collect my thoughts. I was really hoping for some sister time. Are you sure you don't want to come here? I stop tugging at the window when I notice someone in the backyard next door. He's dragging something heavy. What in the world? It looks like a person. I'll be fine, Mackenzie. You get some needed relaxation at my house. I don't want anyone knowing about my surgery, so I told my PA and most of my staff to take a vacation. I'll text you the details about the party, my hairdresser's number, and everything you'll need. I promise the party won't be a big deal. It's a charity gala for the sea turtles. You'll love it. It's tomorrow. I'm staring out the window like a stalker on steroids, not even paying much attention to what Jera is saying anymore. Uh, huh? Turtles? The neighbour sets the person down, but then he kneels, and the fence blocks my view. Is that someone passed out? Or is he... I stick my head out of the window so I can see what's going on better. You can wear anything in my closet, Jera's voice continues. If you wear my clothes, no one will notice you're not me. Remember when we'd switch as kids? No one found out. Okay, I say, absent-mindedly. I crane my neck. The neighbour presses his ear to the man's chest. Is he checking to see if he's breathing? My heart pounds in my ears. What is happening at the neighbour's house? And I'll send you my driver's number, Jera says. I'm pretty sure I'm not even breathing as I watch the neighbour drag the body once again. And now I can't see a thing. I worm my shoulders out so I can lean further. The top half of me is now out the window and I'm on my tiptoes but at last I can see him fiddling with the man's head. What the heck is going on? I'll text you everything. I have a busy schedule, so don't stress if you don't hear from me for a few days. I'm going to go off grid. If you have questions, ask my driver. He's super helpful. Thanks a ton. I've got to go. Bye. Jera hangs up, but I don't even care. I'm pretty sure there's a dead body next door. My phone slips and I lunge for it, forgetting I'm half out a window. My foot loses purchase and I screech, the world suddenly tilting at a crazy angle. My fingers push my phone out just enough for it to plummet into the pool. No, I need that! I wildly kick my legs as I try to grasp anything to keep me from falling, but there's nothing to grab. Luckily, my hips are too big to fit through the window, or I'd be a pancake. But even as I thank the heavens for not falling to my death, I panic because I can't lose my phone. It has important things on it. Plus, that's how Jera's going to tell me everything I need to do. I need to fish it out of the pool, now. I try to wiggle my way back indoors, but I'm stuck. Oh no, this can't be happening to me. Squint scratches at the bathroom door and I can hear his little whine. He must have heard me screech. The neighbour must have heard me too because he stands there, staring right at me with his piercing blue eyes. Dang, this dude has some serious tall, dark and handsome radiating from him. I desperately try to worm my way back inside, but my hips are stuck tight. Oh, why do I have to love Oreos so much? I suddenly remember I'm in a towel and I tug on it to make sure I'm still covered. Thankfully, I am. Yay for oversized towels. The neighbour steps around the dead guy to get a better look at me, and I'm still wiggling like crazy trying to get my booty back inside. The sill is starting to cut off my circulation. What are you doing? Mr. Hansom calls out, and I realise I recognise him from somewhere. Have I seen him on a wanted poster? Is he really a murderer? My throat tightens. He's still staring at me, waiting for me to answer. Nothing, I call out, acting like it's absolutely normal for me to hang outside of a window while wearing a towel. A puzzled look crosses his face. Do you need help? No, I say as nonchalantly as possible. I'm fine. I'm not fine. The windowsill is now cutting me in half and I'm going to pass out at any minute. I can't get a good breath in. You look a little... 
Purple? Are you sure you're okay? I grunt as I desperately flail around to get back inside Jera's bathroom. It doesn't work. I'm hopelessly stuck. But I don't want to admit it to the murderer next door. I'm okay. He watches me struggle for another minute before he shakes his head and calls out, I'm coming over! No! I scream. Don't! He ignores me. I try not to panic as I watch him scale and then jump the fence that separates his property from Jera's. He walks around the pool to the sliding back door. The back door I didn't lock because I was too excited to have two stinking pools to swim in. My palms grow sweaty as I hear him enter Jera's house. My hips are screaming at me now and at any moment my legs are going to fall off from lack of circulation. But no matter which way I try to wiggle, I can't get out of the window. Footsteps squeak rapidly down the hallway, then are muffled by the carpet in Jera's bedroom, and the bathroom door opens. I pray that this towel is covering my entire backside. I do not want to moon the murderer. Squint barks as Mr. Handsome grabs me and pulls, and I feel like I'm about to be ripped in half, but whatever he does works because I pop out of that window like a cork. Unfortunately, the force knocks us both down, and I sprawl on top of the man. I roll off him, desperately grabbing the towel so it doesn't fly off me. Squint licks my face, his whole body wagging. I lay on the tile floor staring up at Mr. Handsome, kneeling beside me. His dark hair falls to his forehead and he's trying to catch his breath as he examines me. Are you okay? My heart beats a million times a second. I stare into his face and suddenly I recognize him. He's Dustin Sawyer, a famous movie star, and he's staring at me while I'm lying on Jera's bathroom floor in a towel. I gasp and manage to scramble up as I hold on to the towel for dear life. You, you... I can't seem to get any intelligent words out. Squint thinks this is a fun game. He dances around my slippers, merrily barking at me. Dustin's forehead wrinkles as he puzzles over my incoherent mumblings. Me? he asks as he stands, wiping his hands on his jeans. You killed a man, I blurt out as I point at him. Chapter 3 I... what? He looks me over like he's sure I got a head injury. What were you doing with that body in your backyard? Realization dawns in his gaze. That was a CPR mannequin. I'm auditioning for a role. His voice trails off. You thought I killed someone? Heat assaults my face. Of course, Dustin Sawyer isn't a murderer. I'm an idiot. Squint doesn't care. He's still happily barking. Dustin scoffs. Is that why you were hanging out your window? I must be twelve shades of red by now. I'm talking full body blush. I look like a lobster spending a day at the spa. Sorry. I suddenly remember my phone in the pool. If there's any way to save it, I must go fish it out fast. I drop my phone, I say as I brush past him, trying to explain why I have to rush off. Were you filming me? Is this all part of your plan? He follows me into Jera's bedroom. My plan? Was he daft? Who would plan to get stuck in a window? No. I look around for a dresser, but Jera doesn't have one. He swipes a hand through his hair. I know you're upset about the fence, but I swear I didn't know it was on your property. It's only one inch, for Pete's sake. One inch. I have no idea what he's talking about, and I need to find a bathing suit, so I open the closet door. Holy cow, there's a whole country in her closet. Why is her closet larger than my apartment? I flick on the light. Er, uh, I should say lights, because every inch of the place has a spotlight on it, and all the glitzy, bedazzled clothing lights up like a Christmas tree. I'm sorry, can we talk later? I have to go fish my phone out of the pool. Dustin shakes his head. You never want to talk. I'm tired of trying to talk to you through my lawyer. I just want to know why you won't take my offer. It's quite reasonable. You'll get to collect rent for a stupid fence. I know nothing about the argument between them, so I keep my mouth shut. He stares at me. Are you still mad at me for what happened last year? Jera really didn't tell me enough about her life to prepare me for this. No, I'm not mad, I say, before I realize Jera may be indeed mad at the man. Oops. Dustin comes into the closet with me. Just take the deal. It's a fair price for the space my fence is taking. I can't take a deal for my sister, so I shake my head. I'm sorry, I can't. 
I pull a two-piece striped suit out of a cubby hole. It still has the tags on it. Sheesh, why is there so little fabric to it? Couldn't she have a one-piece somewhere? I don't understand why you're being so unreasonable, Dustin says as he rubs his neck. Please, talk to me in about a week. I've got a situation. I shove him out of the closet and shut the doors, resigning to putting on the little strappy thing. If it's money you want, I can increase the offer, he says through the doors. Squint sniffs all the shoes. I don't want your money, I yell as I yank the suit on. Jera doesn't need any more money, that's for certain. She's paid off my mother's debt, bought her a big house in Seattle, and gave her a nice nest egg. I know she'd do the same for me if I'd let her, but I don't want her to. It doesn't sit right with me. Then what's the... Ah! He stops mid-sentence as I fling open the doors and rush out. Wow, he says under his breath. I shoot a glare at him. Was that a remark about my cellulite? Because Jera definitely looks better in a swimsuit than I do. Did I mention my love for Oreos? But I don't have time to call him out for being rude. I rush down the stairs, squint barking again as he follows me. Jera! Dustin calls out as he races after me. My phone! I shoot back at him. It will be fine. They make them waterproof now. I doubt my phone is waterproof. It's a dinosaur. If smartphones made fun of each other, mine would be the one always picked on. I can't even take any more pictures with it because the memory is all full. I don't wait for Dustin. I jump into the pool and grab my phone. I surface, holding it up, and water drains out of it. It's toast, I can tell already. I try not to think of all that I lost. I rush to the stairs and climb out as Squint barks at Dustin. He looks down at my dog as if seeing him for the first time. When did you get a dog? I don't answer. I don't want to lie to the guy. He looks pretty nice now that I know he's not a murderer. I need rice, I say under my breath as I rush inside the patio door. I race to the kitchen, Dustin at my heels. I start opening the cupboards. Rice, rice, rice. Jera must have rice somewhere. Dustin stares at me. What are you doing? Rice! I screech at him like he should know. Where is it? He holds out his hand. Let me see your phone. I don't even stop to think. I toss it at him while I'm searching for the rice. Jeesh, Jera, get a new phone. This one's like a hundred years old. I blink back tears as I realize the only photo I had of my father was on that phone. He left when I was six, and Mom tore up all the pictures she could find. I kept one hidden from her for years. I'd snapped a picture of it once, so I could use it as my screensaver. I've since lost the original, so the one on my phone was all I had left. Why didn't I back it up on my laptop? I open the last cupboard and grab a box of instant rice. Finally, I pull a bowl out and shake the rice into it as I grab my phone back from Dustin. I can't, I finally say, emotions choking me. Dustin looks at me like I'm a math problem he can't solve. Why not? I keep shaking rice out until my phone is buried and there's no rice left in the box. My hands shake as I set the bowl down on the counter and stare at it like it's going to do something. What's wrong? Dustin asks me, his voice soft. I realize I'm crying. I quickly wipe my face and shake my head. It's nothing. His jaw muscles tighten. It's not nothing, he says. He sounds like he actually cares. What happened between him and my sister anyway? My heart does funny things in my chest. What is it? He says, his voice quiet. Tell me. My breath hitches. He's so stunningly gorgeous, I can't think. I'm exposed, standing there with just a bathing suit on, my feelings on display. I turn from him. You wouldn't understand. He lets out a breath like he's giving up. All right, have it your way. He moves to leave, but I grab his arm. I feel bad for everything. He was just trying to help, and I'm being rude. I'm sorry, I'm not myself today. Please forget this ever happened. He looks down at my hand on his arm. You're not kidding. I have no idea what he means by that. Huh? I ask as I remove my hand. You've never apologized to me, not once, until today. Now you can't stop saying it. He raises one eyebrow, and I about faint. Why does that make him look even more handsome? I resist the urge to apologize again. 
I'm messing this whole thing up. What on earth made me think I could pretend to be Jira? Dustin is going to figure me out, and I just met the guy. I bite my lips to keep from saying anything else wrong. His gaze softens and he takes a step toward me. Heat radiates off him on my skin. My heart picks up speed. What in the world is wrong with me? I think we got off on the wrong foot last year, he says, his voice low. I don't know what happened, but let's start over. Starting over sounds good, I nod. Okay, come over tonight, bring your phone, I'll see if I can fix it. I shouldn't, I know this, but I need my phone. I bite my lower lip, trying to decide which is worse, me pretending to be Jera in close quarters with her hot neighbour, or me not having a phone where Jera can tell me all the things I need to do. I'll make you dinner, he adds. Chapter 4 I gape at Dustin Sawyer, the famous movie star. You cook? He smiles and hooks his thumbs in his belt loops. There's a lot you don't know about me, and I'm willing to bet there's a lot I don't know about you as well. His voice is warm and low, and it wraps around me like a fuzzy blanket. Is he flirting with me? And do I want him to? I glance at the bowl of rice sitting on the counter. I need that phone. Jera's going to text me. Plus, a home-cooked meal sounds really great. I usually eat my meals from a box. I'm quite fond of the mac and cheese variety. I didn't see any box meals when I was searching through Jera's cupboard, and now I can't even order DoorDash. I waffle for a moment before I make a rash decision. All right. Dustin smiles at me, and I think I'm going to melt into a puddle on the floor. Wow, how do regular people handle being around this man? I'm going to start hyperventilating. Great, he says, his smile widening. I think he knows what he's doing to me. Come over at seven. I nod, because I can't form a complete sentence. Dustin leaves, and Squint does a little potty dance before he scratches at the back door. I welcome the distraction, and let him out to do his business. As Squint runs around the backyard, I search Jera's drawers for her scissors, so I can clip off the tags from the swimsuit because they're digging into my armpits. I find the scissors in the fifth drawer I open. I take a swim since I'm dressed for it. The water is warm, not a cloud in the sky, and I begin to relax. I love Jera's pools, and her house is three levels of amazing. I swim for about an hour as Squint takes a nap in the sun. After I rinse off and dress in a cute pink top and white shorts from Jera's closet, I explore her house. On the coffee table in the living room, I find the credit card my sister left for me. She left a note as well. It says, Dear Mackenzie, you can go to any art store. LA has a lot of them. Get all the supplies you want. I'll text you my driver's number so you can have him take you. Well, that's just perfect. All my new art supplies are a phone call away, and I can't even get to them. I frown as I go to the kitchen to stare at the bowl sitting on the counter. How am I going to pull off being my sister without her help? She never checks her email. I have no idea what her phone number is. I don't know the name of the spa where she's at. I look at the ceiling and pray Dustin can fix my phone tonight. To get my mind off the predicament I'm in, I open my suitcase and start setting up my filming equipment. I grab my stuff and go into what I assume is a library, due to all the books on the shelves. My sister doesn't read much, unless you count fashion magazines, so I have no idea why she has so many books. I figure this room isn't used, so it's a great place for me to film my watercolour classes. By the time I'm done setting up my camera and tripod, it's time for me to go next door. I pick up Squint and tuck him into his carrying case. He fits so nicely in there, and he likes going on outings with me. I jokingly call him my emotional support animal, but I don't know how much of a joke it is. He keeps my anxiety down. Hopefully Dustin doesn't mind. I grab the bowl of rice with my poor phone and leave. As I walk down the long driveway to the front gate, I realise why Dustin jumped the fence. It's a much longer walk than it looks. I finally get to the front of Jera's gate, but there's no sidewalk so I have to walk beside the intimidating iron fence that keeps out creepers. Dustin's gate has a keypad and a video screen. I press the call button, and a minute later he appears on the screen. Hey, he says when he sees me, I'll buzz you through. The door clicks open and I go in. 
I walk up his enormous driveway. Dustin's house looks like it was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's modern, with a balcony that juts out in a way you wouldn't think was possible because of physics. It looks cool, though, and I wonder what the view is like from there. He pulls the door open before I can ring the bell. He's wearing a light blue dress shirt with khaki pants and a black apron. He smiles at me, and my heart does a backflip. You came. You didn't think I'd come? He shrugs. Not really. Come in. That's weird. Why did he think I'd stand him up? Can I bring Squint in? He's house-trained and doesn't bark a lot. I motion to my dog carrier. Sure, he chuckles. Cute name. Do you have any pets? I ask as I walk into the foyer and set Squint on his hardwood floor. A grand staircase curves up to the second floor. A large painting hangs on the wall and a skylight keeps the foyer bright. Dustin crouches down and scratches under Squint's chin. No, I've never had time to take care of one. The way he said it made me sad. You work that much? He stands and takes the bowl of rice from me. I've been lucky to have work my whole life. This business can be brutal, but of course you know that. He pulls a Ziploc from his apron pocket and fishes my phone out of the rice. I read on the internet that silicone packets work better than rice, and to draw out the most moisture, it needs to be sealed. He slips my phone inside the Ziploc full of packets. I stare at the baggie. It had to have 20 silicone packets in it. Where did you get all those? They come with a lot of products, like shoes and stuff. I nod. I know, but I just throw them away. You save them? He shrugs. I don't usually, but when I read that silicone packets are best, I went looking for some. I had quite a few just in with various things. I blink and try to process what he said. So, you searched your house for those little silicone packets? For me? Yeah, it was no big deal. It may not have been a big deal to him, but it meant a lot to me. It must have taken him forever to find 20 of those packets. I walk with him into the kitchen where something smells amazing. What are you making? My mouth is watering already. Chicken Alfredo, I hope pasta is okay. I googled and the internet says you don't have any food allergies. He sets the Ziploc on the counter, then lifts a lid and stirs a creamy sauce. Pasta is my favourite. He smiles. Good. I wasn't sure you'd be able to eat it. I give him a puzzled look. Why wouldn't I? You know, all the carbs, I normally avoid them, but I'm between gigs. Oh, I hadn't even considered Jera might be on a diet. Well, I wasn't going to starve myself for a week. The fake Jera was just going to have to splurge. Me too. I'm between gigs. I'm not counting carbs until my next job. Do you have something in the works? He glances at me and lifts one eyebrow. I had no idea. Maybe. I can't talk about it yet. That sounded like a safe answer. I get it. Good luck. He takes the sauce off the burner and turns the knob. He plates the pasta, chicken, and tops it with the Alfredo. When he sprinkles on some chopped parsley, my mouth falls open. You really like to cook, don't you? He nods as he finishes up with the plates. My parents were gone a lot when I was a kid. So you had to learn to cook in order to eat. That was so sad. I felt so bad for him. He laughs. No, we had a cook. Her name was Elise, and she was fresh out of cooking school. I had a major crush on her. Dustin smiles and gives me a wink. I nudge his arm and my pulse jumps. He's flirting with me again, and I'm not going to lie. I like the way it makes my insides all fluttery. So, you learned how to cook from Elise? She taught me a lot, and I follow a few YouTube channels. He carries the plates into the dining room where the table is set for two. Squint follows us, sniffing the floor before curling up in the corner. A pillar candle flickers, and fresh-cut flowers are in a vise. Did he order flowers just for me? I point to them. You didn't really think I'd stand you up. Look at all the trouble you went through. Dustin pulls out my chair, and I sit, feeling like I'm suddenly at a fancy restaurant and I didn't dress up enough. He sits next to me and leans close. Do you want me to be honest? Of course. A pang of guilt shoots through my chest. I shouldn't demand honesty from him when I wasn't giving him the same courtesy. 
I can't believe you're here. I never thought you'd set foot in my house again. Chapter 5 Again, my voice squeaks. I find out this is not the right response, because Dustin cocks his head at me as if he doesn't understand. What? What? I repeat. Great. Now I'm gaslighting him. I shake my head. I mean, why did you think that? I believe it's because you shouted at me that you would never set foot in my house again. His grin fades and he stares at me. Fantastic. I'm going to kill Jera for not telling me any of this. What exactly happened between her and Dustin? I'm sorry, I say, my gaze falling to my lap. I behaved badly. Well, I had some blame in the matter. I honestly wasn't trying to embarrass you in front of your friends, and the wine down your front was a complete accident. I'm dying to know the whole story, but I can't ask him. Accidents happen. Let's forget the past. I'm glad you feel that way. I take a bite of the pasta and gulp back a moan. This is amazing. A smile spreads across his face. Thanks. I'm not just saying that. This is probably the best Alfredo sauce I've ever had. I scoop up another generous bite. I admit, this is one recipe I've worked hard to perfect. A lovely blush graces his cheeks. And now I've revealed how much I wanted to impress you. Me? It's my turn to blush. I'm not sure what else to say, so I spend time chewing. Finally, I say, consider me impressed. We eat in silence for a few minutes before he speaks. In the spirit of starting over, why don't you tell me about yourself? I slowly nod. Okay. I rack my brain for tidbits of things Jera might have told me in conversations. Not much comes to mind, so I decide to jump in the way back machine. I was born in Colorado Springs and grew up in a town called Larkspur, which is one of those blink-and-you-miss-it kind of towns. Do you miss it? Yes, I say before I can think. I do miss Larkspur. The town is charming and quiet and has the best views of the mountains and the red rock formations. As soon as I look at Dustin, I realize my mistake. Jera hated living in such a small town. It wasn't even a town. It's a municipality, population 203. Every chance she could get, she'd go to Denver, which is quite close. What do you miss about it? I was committed now. I couldn't take back my answer. I miss the bright stars in the sky. On a clear night, you can see millions of them, twinkling like diamond dust sprinkled across the heavens. I miss the picturesque setting, the quiet, the smell of the mountains and nature, the wildlife. A lot of things. Dustin slowly nods. That sounds so lovely. I don't live far from there now, so I go back often to paint, but it's not the same as living there. He pauses, his fork halfway to his mouth. You don't live far? Panic grips my stomach as I try to think of a way out of what I said. I mean, the flight isn't long. Lame. I should have been more careful, and now Dustin is going to think I'm all kinds of crazy. He can't think that Jera would fly all the way to a small town in Colorado to paint. I'm so busted. But instead of questioning my sanity, he just studies me. You paint? Yes. Oil? Watercolor? I'd love to see your work sometime. And that's all. He continues to eat, and I shove more food in my face to stop me from saying anything else dumb. I eat the last bite, and I scrape my plate to get the tail end of the Alfredo sauce. I don't want to waste any of it. This seems to please Dustin, because he sits back with a goofy smile on his face. That was delicious, I say, to explain why I'm scraping my plate. Thanks. So, your turn. Tell me something I don't know about you. I stand and gather up the plates and silverware to take to the sink. He follows me, along with Squint, whose collar jingles as he runs to catch up to us. I set the dishes in the sink, plug it, and turn on the water. What are you doing? The dishes? I open the cupboard under his sink to look for the soap. I pull up a bottle of dishwashing liquid. You don't have to do them. I have staff that comes in. Oh, of course. Heat rushes to my face. Dumb mistake. I'm supposed to be Jera, a rich actor who doesn't lift a finger. 
Now I have to make up something. I just thought I'd take care of them real quick, save them the trouble. He shuts off the sink. Don't you have staff? Of course. Then I realize I haven't seen any staff since I'd come. Did Jera give them time off? Wait, I think I remember her saying something like that when we were on the phone. She must have been worried I'd give her away. It's looking more and more like her worries are warranted. But you do your own dishes? Sometimes. I like the sudsy bubbles. They're fun. I'm babbling now and I sound like an idiot. Dustin laughs. So, you're saying I'm missing out on a lot of fun by not washing my own dishes? Tons. I try not to roll my eyes at how ridiculous that sounds. Well then, who am I to take away our fun? Maybe we should do the dishes? He takes the dishwashing liquid from me, and my skin tingles where our fingers touch. How much of this do we need? I eye him skeptically. You seriously have never done dishes before? He shrugs. I've always had staff to do them. Wow. I hold in my surprise. How much soap you use depends on how many bubbles you want. If the bubbles are the fun part, then lots. He smiles, and my heart does a little flippy thing inside my chest. I turn the water back on. Put in a generous amount, then. He flips the lid up and squeezes the soap into the sink like he's a mad scientist. Whoa, not that much, I giggle as the suds immediately start forming. Did I do it wrong already? His tone is teasing, and I'm sure he did it on purpose. I pull out the sprayer and spray all the dish soap, making the bubbles mount higher. It's okay, we'll just have to rinse them really well. In a rash moment, I dip my finger in the suds and swipe it across his nose. I have no idea what came over me, but I can't help but laugh at how it looks and his surprised expression. He swipes the suds off his nose and chuckles. Is this how you do dishes? Yes. He eyes my sprayer. That looks like fun. Can I try it? Why? I don't have to ask. I know why he wants the sprayer. Because it's not fair if you have all the fun. I stop pressing the button so the water returns to the faucet. I slowly hand it to him. He points it at me. How do I make it spray again? Don't you dare spray me. I try to say it with a straight face, but I can't. He's flirting with me, and I can't help feeling like a schoolgirl with a crush. I like it, even though I shouldn't. If any water gets on you, it will be totally unintentional, I swear, he says, while the spray nozzle is still pointed at me. I haven't played the flirting game in quite some time, and I'm all here for it, even if I shouldn't be. I push away the thought that Jera would kill me if she knew I was flirting with Dustin. It's just some harmless fun, right? Chapter 6 Dustin stands there, pointing the sprayer at me. I try not to laugh. The first thing you need to do is point it at the sink. I try to turn it towards the sink, but he squeezes the button and water streams out. I squeal and grab the nozzle, water spraying everywhere. Squint plays along, dancing at our heels and barking. I grab the sprayer from Dustin and point it at him, but he's already backed away. It was an accident, he says, laughing. Yeah, right. I spray him anyway, even though he's halfway across the kitchen. It still reaches him, which makes me laugh even harder. When I quit spraying, he bolts toward the sink and scoops up a large handful of bubbles. Before I can duck, he splats them on my head. Suds fly everywhere, sliding down my face and going down the back of my shirt. I turn, letting the sprayer go back to the sink, and I grab some suds as well. Only I use both hands and grab twice as much as Dustin did. Hey, that's not fair. Didn't anyone tell you life isn't fair? I toss the bubbles on him, but he's taller than me, and it ends up going in his face and down his shirt. He grabs my wrists and pushes me up against the sink. Squint barks and jumps on my legs, enjoying the game. My skin zaps with electricity where his hands touch me. Bubbles drip down Dustin's face. I laugh as he tries to blow them away. It doesn't work. Suds stick to his eyelashes and run down his cheeks. I'm laughing so hard I can't catch my breath. Or maybe it's the way he's pressing against me that makes me breathless. He nuzzles my shoulder to get the suds off his face. I hold in a gasp as his cheek grazes my neck. It seems too intimate, and yet 
I don't want to tell him to quit. The contact with his skin makes my knees go weak and my ovaries scream for joy. Has it been that long since a man has touched me? He pulls back but doesn't let go of my wrists. He stares at me and all the air in the room is sucked out. His dark hair is mussed up, but that only adds to his gorgeousness. I think I'm going to faint. He leans close to my ear. You're right, he says, his voice low. Doing the dishes is fun. Before I can melt into a puddle of hormones, he backs away from me and lets me go. Should we shut off the water now? I turn around and slam down the faucet handle. Yes, I say, as my heart beats a zillion times a second. We have enough water. He pulls open a drawer and hands me a washcloth, keeping one for himself. I think we'll need these. Yes, thank you. Squint wanders over to the water we sprayed on the floor and sniffs it. Dustin stands close beside me as I put my washcloth in the water. He does the same. His fingers graze over mine as he searches for a dish. My entire body bursts into tingles. I hand him a plate. Here? Thanks. We continue to wash the dishes that way, and our hands touch several more times. I'm hyper aware of my body and the way the accidental touches make me feel. My skin is a live wire, and every touch sets me off. We clean all the dishes, dry them, and put them away. He hangs the towels up and turns to me. You keep surprising me. I bite back a smile. Good surprises or bad ones? Definitely the good kind. Warmth fills me. It's been a long time since I've felt this giddy over a man. I'm glad. We stand near each other in silence for a moment. I remember the large balcony on his second floor, and I blurt out, Can I see your balcony? He seems surprised at my request. Why? Now I feel a little foolish. I don't know. It just seems cool. Does it have a good view? He studies me for a moment, and I can't understand why. It's such a simple request. Am I being weird without knowing it? Finally, he says, I'll show you. He motions. I follow him through his house, back to the grand staircase. I'm overjoyed that I get to go up that staircase. It looks amazing. I love the way it curves through the house. Squint follows us up the stairs. He takes me down the hallway to a door. When he opens it, I realize the balcony is off the master bedroom. Heat assaults my cheeks. I wasn't trying to be coy or seductive. I really hope he doesn't take it that way. No wonder he looked at me funny when I asked to see the balcony. It's in here, he says. We walk through his bedroom, and I notice how neat and tidy everything is. He even made his bed. I bet he was appalled at how Jera's bedroom looked earlier today when he had to rescue me. I'd tossed all my things around and made myself at home. How embarrassing. Two large glass doors open up to his balcony. I step out and walk to the railing. The balcony wraps around the side of his house. He has a couple of lounge chairs with a glass table off to the side. Squint lets out a bark and I pick him up. The sun is low in the sky and I hold in a gasp as I look at the city of Los Angeles stretched out before me. This is gorgeous. Dustin stands next to me, looking out at the horizon. You have the same view. Embarrassment heats my face once again. Jera does, out of her bedroom window. I try to think of something smart to say. Sure, but it's different out of a window. I love that you can come out here and feel the breeze on your skin. I guess you're right. There is something nice about being able to come outside. I come out here often in the mornings and enjoy the sunrise. Sunrise? You must be a morning person. I make a face. He chuckles. You're not, huh? Mornings are for sleeping in. Dustin just shakes his head. We watch as the sun gets lower, the sky turning shades of pink and orange. I hold squint as the magic of nature paints the canvas of the sky. Do you like to read? Dustin asks me out of the blue. Yes, I read mostly non-fiction, but every once in a while I toss in a spy novel. I answer as myself before I can think about it. Gah, Jera doesn't read. I should have said no. I love non-fiction. I'm reading one right now about the Civil War. I find history fascinating. I nod. I hated history in school. It was boring. But as I grew older, it got more interesting to me. We chat about history and which stories we find the most fascinating as the sun continues to set. I find myself drawn to Dustin. 
He's so much more than just a beautiful face. The air turns chilly and I take a step back. It's getting late. Maybe I should go. We walk back through his house and down the stairs. I stand in his entryway, looking up at him. It's awkward, but I don't know why. He runs a hand through his hair and chuckles. You know, when you first asked to see my balcony, I thought you were coming on to me. Heat rushes to my face. Oh no, not at all. I really didn't know the balcony was off your bedroom. I believe you. Squint wiggles, and I set him down. He runs off to sniff something. I remember the real reason I'm at Dustin's house. Do you think it's okay to try my phone now? He shakes his head. The article I read said to leave the phone in an airtight container with the silicone packets for at least 48 hours. Disappointment settles over me. Oh, I've messed everything up. Jera needs me to go to that thing tomorrow. I won't have my phone back by then. I won't be able to call her driver. I try not to panic, but I'm unsuccessful as my chest tightens and tears prick the back of my eyes. Is there something I can help with? I need to go to a party thing tomorrow, but all the details were on my phone. I exhale. Squint must sense my distress because he runs up to me and whines. What party? I rack my brain trying to remember what Jera had said. Something about sea turtles. That's all I can remember. I shrug. A turtle something? You mean the charity event? The one to save the sea turtles? I'm so happy I could kiss the man. Yes, that's it! He laughs. I'm going to that. What do you need to know? Can you take me? I ask before I can think of the consequences. He gives me a questioning look. You want me to take you, like, as a date? Chapter 7 The way Dustin asks me if it's a date startles me and brings me back to reality. I can't be dating Dustin, not while I'm pretending to be Jera. It's not fair to Jera or Dustin, not that I wouldn't date Dustin. At another time and place, I totally would. No, I quickly say, sliding my hands back and forth. Not as a date. Dustin takes a step back. Oh, then... Uh, I hadn't thought any of this through, and now I feel terrible. But I need to get to that event. And if Dustin is going, maybe I can just catch a ride with him. That had to be okay, right? Jera would forgive me if I explained everything that happened with my phone, and how I had no way to get to the event. I'm sorry, that sounded so rude. I just have a situation right now that is hard to explain. Can we go as friends? I twist my fingers together in hopes that he'll understand. Dustin slowly nods. I get it. I read online that you broke up with Luke. Was it a painful breakup? Yes, I say, grasping onto that as an excuse. I'm still very hurt. I can't get into another relationship right now. I hope you understand. He pauses to look at me with his brilliant blue eyes, and I fear he can see right through me. He studies me like I'm under a microscope. I give him a pained expression so he'll know just how hurt I am by my breakup, but I suck at acting, and I think I just look constipated. Still, he gives me a sympathetic nod. I understand. I've had my share of breakups. My last one did a number on me. Oh? Yeah. I found out she lied to me about a bunch of stuff. Guilt swarms around me like bees. Ouch. I've had several girlfriends who just used me for things. That hurt me more than I like to admit. I'm so sorry. I don't know what else to say. I scoop up Squint and put him in his carrier. Thank you for all you're doing to help me. You're a lifesaver. Dustin turns to the front door and opens it. I step out onto his front doormat. He reaches out and gently grabs my arm. Tingles wash over my skin. Jera, wait. I turn to him. Yes? He lets go of me and scrubs a hand over his face. Thanks for coming over tonight. His gaze travels over me. I enjoyed our time together. I smile, my insides fluttering again. I did too. Is there anything else I can do for you? I bite my lower lip, thinking of my art supplies. I left all my old ones at home, and I need to get the next class filmed and uploaded. I can't even call for an Uber without my phone, and I know Jera would kill me if I took her Ferrari anywhere. It's her baby. 
She wouldn't even let me touch it last time I was here. Plus, driving in California makes me crazy. His brow furrows as I hesitate. What is it? I need something from a store. He raises one eyebrow and my insides turn into a puddle of goo. What do you need? I need some art supplies. Would you be willing to drive me to the art store? He blinks for a second, like he can't quite figure me out, but then smiles. Just tell me what you need and I'll have my driver pick it up. Heat once again rises to my cheeks. Duh, rich and famous people don't go shopping. I should have known he'd have people for that. Jera probably has people for that too. I look down at my shoes, uncomfortable with sending someone else to pick out my paintbrushes. I'm quite particular when it comes to that. I kind of want to pick out my own supplies, I admit to him. Oh, Dustin shifts. Again, he studies me, and I'm sure he's going to blurt out that I'm not Jera, and he can tell because I'm totally not acting at all like her. But instead, he simply smiles again. That's fine, then. I'll take you. Does tomorrow morning work? Yes, thank you. I really appreciate it. I know I'm gushing, so I shut up. No problem. Come over when you want to go. I'm free all morning. I practically float back to Jera's house. I'm so relieved that everything is going to work out, and I had such an amazing time with Dustin. I'm sure he has no clue, but he's my knight in shining armour. I hear a noise downstairs and can't quite place it in the fog of my sleep. It sounds like heavy machinery, or an engine of some kind. I roll over and realise it's a vacuum. Jera must not have cancelled her cleaning staff. I moan and put a pillow over my head. Jera's a morning person. I'm sure she doesn't mind waking up at the crack of dawn. I wait another ten minutes before deciding I'm not going to catch any more sleep with that noise, and I get out of Jera's bed. Squint lifts his head and watches me go into Jera's bathroom. Thirty minutes later, I'm showered and feeling more like a human being. I open the window to let out some steam, and I smile when I see Dustin in his backyard. He's at his grill, and I stick my head out of the window. Hey, I call. Dustin grins at me. Didn't you learn your lesson? I promise not to get stuck this time. He laughs. You better not. I think I bruised my cockchicks yesterday. I bite my lips together to keep from giggling. He's flirting with me again. A smell wafts up from his grill and I salivate. What are you making? I'm smoking some brisket, just checking on it. It smells delicious. He raises one eyebrow. Do you want to eat lunch with me? Well, if you insist, I'll eat your food any day. Come over when you're ready. We'll go to the art store, then I'll make us lunch. The brisket should be done by then. Deal. I shut the window, my stomach already anticipating the heavenly meal. How did I get so lucky? Jera has an amazing neighbour, and all she does is fight with him about a fence. She's totally missing out. I rush to get myself ready. With all the glitz and sparkle in Jera's closet, it takes me a bit longer than normal to find something to wear. I'm just not a bedazzled kind of person, and she forbade me to wear any of my own clothes. I scoff, so I don't wear designer clothes. Big deal. They don't look dumpy or anything, but I finally find a simple pair of jeans and a cute shirt that fits nicely. Jera left me strict instructions on doing my makeup, but all that is on my dead phone, so I sit down at her makeup counter and stare at all the products. Three different foundations. Does she use them all at once? I make a face at the mirror. Hopefully Jera doesn't mind. I'm just doing things my way today. A little eyeliner and some blush. It's the natural look. I put on my sling carrier that I painted with a floral design and put squint in it. I love this carrier when I go shopping because it looks like a purse with a cute little dog peeking out of it. Squint and I head over to Dustin's house. The gate is open when I get there and Dustin waits in the driveway as I approach. He stands next to a sporty looking convertible that probably costs more than the state of Colorado. It's electric blue and goes well with his fancy house. Hey, he says, nice car. Dustin's gaze travels over my bag. That's such a unique carrier. Where did you get it? I blush as I pet squint. I painted it. I wanted something pretty to carry him in. Wow, I had no idea you can paint like that. He opens the car door for me. 
I slide into the seat, the buttery softness enveloping me. Is this what luxury is? No wonder Jera loves being rich. I could get used to this. Dustin pulls out a baseball cap and pair of sunglasses and slips them on. I'm so stupid. I didn't even bring anything to shield my face. After he slides into the driver's seat, I lean toward him. I forgot my hat and glasses. Can I borrow some from you? Sure. He runs into his house and comes back several moments later. He hands me a canvas bag with several things to choose from. I pull out a grey cap with Swifty on it and turn to him with my eyebrows raised. You're a Swifty? He grins. Don't tell anyone. I laugh and put it on my head. Don't worry, I like her music too. Your secret is safe with me. Dustin starts his car and I barely hear the purr of the motor. I love the way the wind whips my hair and how the sun warms my skin as we drive. Squint must like it too because he happily barks at the wind. We turn a corner and Dustin glances at me. What kind of music do you like? You mentioned Taylor Swift. Do you mostly listen to pop music? I like all kinds of music. I can jam out to pop music or just as easily rock out to old school rock and roll. I enjoy a good country song as well. What about Broadway? I smile. I like those too, especially the old Rogers and Hammerstein musicals. Nice. He slows for a light. Who in Hollywood have you been most excited to meet? I can't answer that question, so I turn a cheesy grin on him. You. He laughs and shakes his head. No, seriously. Who? He's pinning me down and I can't think of anything to say. And then a conversation I had with Jera once pops into my head. Actually, there is someone I'd love to meet, but sadly, it's impossible now. Oh, who? Cary Grant. My sister loved all the old movies he was in. She would have loved to meet him when he was alive. Ah, yes, he was a legend, that's for sure. I see the art store ahead, and I point it out. Dustin pulls into the parking lot. My anxiety ramps up as we get out of the car. I'm not a shopper or a crowd person, but luckily... The parking lot seems fairly empty. I tell myself it's going to be fine. As we walk into the store, Dustin leans close to me. Do you do this often? Do what? You know, go out in public. He whispers it like it's some deep, dark secret. I laugh before I can help myself. I grab a shopping cart as Squint peeks out at the other shoppers. Only when I have to. He nods like he knows what I mean, but it's funny because he doesn't know at all. I think we'll be fine, I say, my voice low. I don't know too many paparazzi that hang out at Blick Art Supplies. I grin at him as we turn down the watercolour aisle. A young girl squeals as we approach her, and Dustin hides his face, but the girl points to Squint. Where did you get him? He's so cute. He's a rescue. The girl coos a bit at Squint before going off to find her parents. Dustin slowly nods at me. I can see now why you carry your dog with you. Brilliant. That's totally not why, but I nod and smile anyway. I fill the shopping cart with my dream set of paints, brushes, and watercolour paper. It's going to be a hefty bill, but Jera said she'd buy me all new ones. I only feel slightly guilty about it. I am, after all, going to this gala for her, and doing some kind of photo shoot thing. I pray my phone works soon so I can get those details from her. Dustin peers into my cart. Why do you need so many brushes? I teach. I cut myself off, but it's too late. You teach like painting classes? He raises his eyebrows. I silently scold myself. Yes, I, Mackenzie Davenport, teach online watercolor classes, but I'm not supposed to be Mackenzie right now. I'm Jera. Jera! I yell at myself in my head. Um, I say out loud to give myself time to think, but no matter how hard I try to twist what I said, I can't do it. I obviously said the word teach. It's this little online thing I do. Don't tell anyone. I'm not revealing who I am. He shakes his head. I won't say anything. Okay, thanks. I push the cart toward the checkout. We pass by a teenager who openly stares at us. Is that Dustin Sawyer and Jera Davenport? She asks a woman that looks like her mother. Dustin flinches. I totally ignore the girl, like I usually do when I get mistaken for Jera. Of course not. What would they be doing here? 
The mum grabs her daughter and tugs her down another aisle. Dustin gives me a secret smile. I put my art supplies on the counter so the checkout girl can ring them up. I use Jera's credit card to pay for them, and Dustin grabs all the bags, carrying them for me to the car. My anxiety lifts as I slide into the passenger seat. See, that wasn't so bad, I say to both myself and Dustin. You're right, he says as he closes my door. We didn't get mobbed or anything. Only one person recognized us, and no one will believe her. I laugh. Poor girl. Dustin sits down and buckles his seatbelt. The brisket won't be done yet in the smoker. Mind if I take you home and look at some of your work? Jera has a few of my paintings on her walls, and I did bring a couple of my watercolour sketchbooks. It makes me warm inside to know Dustin cares enough to want to see my work. All right. Chapter 8 Dustin pulls up and I punch in Jera's code, opening the gate. He parks the car by the front door. We pull off our hats and sunglasses, put them back in his canvas bag, and Dustin picks up the packages. We walk to Jera's front door. Squint is happy to get out of his carrier, and he runs off to the yard to do his business. How long have you been painting? he asks, as I press in the code. I run a nervous hand over my hair. I should be answering his questions as Jera, but since I already made that mistake, I have to answer as Mackenzie. I was gifted some painting lessons when I was 13. I've been seriously painting ever since. He smiles as we walk into Jera's entryway. You've wanted to paint since you were 13? I've wanted to paint my whole life, but we struggled financially when I was a kid. Dad left, and Mom and my sister and I had to move into our Aunt Helen's house. We didn't have money for frivolous things like art lessons. I used the cheap watercolours you get as kids, but I didn't really flourish until I got lessons and learned how to use real watercolours. Who gifted you the lessons? Unexpected emotion surges in me. My sister. Jera was a lot of things, self-centred and shallow sometimes, but she could be really awesome as well. She'd spent the summer babysitting the Sullivan boys just to pay for my lessons and supplies, and that was something special because the Sullivan boys were a handful. I take the shopping bags from Dustin, and he follows me through the house and into the library where I'd set up my equipment. This is where you film your classes? He runs a hand over my leather watercolour sketchbook. Yes. I stand next to him and open the book so he can see my rough sketches and washes. He turns each page slowly as he studies my work. I grow nervous as he flips each page. When he's done, he turns to me. Wow, Jera, I had no idea you were so talented. My heart does a little samba dance in my chest. It could have something to do with his close proximity. I wave a hand. That's just sketches and messing around. Do you have any finished paintings? I nod, suddenly nervous to expose this part of myself. Yet, a part of me wants to. I want Dustin to see a part of the real me, not me pretending to be someone else. I'll show you. I take his hand and immediately regret it. Warmth spreads through me as an electric current passes between us. I casually drop his hand after we get into Jera's parlour. I face the painting I created for her, framed and mailed to her last Christmas. The painting was our view out Aunt Helen's upper patio door in Larkspur. The red rock formations against the backdrop of the Colorado Rockies, the pine trees, and the clear blue sky made the perfect landscape. I may have painted it, but God was the one who made it beautiful in the first place. Holy cow, Dustin says under his breath. You painted this? I elbow him. Don't sound so surprised. I don't think you realize how amazing this is. Heat warms my cheeks with the compliment. Thank you. Dustin looks down at me. My hobbies are lame compared to yours. What are your hobbies? Well, cooking, for one. I shake my head. That's totally not lame. I've tasted your cooking and your... Unable to find the right word, I impulsively kiss my fingers in the universal symbol of a chef's kiss. Dustin smiles at that. Really? That good, huh? I realise that could have been taken in a flirty way, and embarrassment floods through me. Your food is better than most restaurants I've tried. His eyebrows lift in surprise, and I realise I'm speaking for Jera, who regularly frequents five-star establishments. 
Oops. Really? He seems excited. Honestly, I say, unable to backtrack. You floored me yesterday. I decide to change the subject. What other hobbies do you have? He gets a funny look on his face. I do have one other hobby, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. I scoff. Why, is it illegal? He laughs. No. Then why wouldn't you tell me? It's embarrassing. He shifts, so he's standing directly in front of me. I can feel the heat coming off his skin. It's making my insides do funny things. How embarrassing can a hobby be? So, you collect stamps. Big deal. You write stories. Who cares? There is no embarrassing hobby. He raises one eyebrow in a challenge. I knit. I press my lips together to stop myself from laughing at him. He's totally serious, I can tell. That's not embarrassing, I say, trying not to picture this big, brawny man in front of me knitting some baby booties. Dustin shifts and stares at me, his gaze penetrating through me. You're trying so hard not to laugh right now. It's a struggle, but I manage to keep a straight face. I'm not. Liar! He leans down, so his face is only inches from mine. My pulse jumps. The urge to laugh dissipates as the mood shifts. My gaze dips to his lips and I swallow, desperately trying to remember why I can't have a relationship with this man, Jera. That's why I can't. I playfully push him away from me and force a laugh. You're totally playing me. You don't knit. He doesn't laugh with me. I do. Oh, I shrug. There's nothing wrong with that. He doesn't say anything, but his gaze intensifies, and I want to lighten the mood again. How did you start knitting? I ask, taking a step from him. My parents were gone a lot when I was a kid. One of my nannies taught me how to do it to keep me busy. How sad. I try not to frown. What have you made? Potholders, table runners, things like that. He turns back to my painting. But it's not really a remarkable hobby like this is. He takes a step closer to examine the painting. I'm amazed at how you can incorporate the way the paint flows onto the page into the scene. I suddenly realize my signature is on the bottom. I don't have one of those scribble signatures. It plainly reads Mackenzie Davenport. I grab Dustin's shoulders and turn him toward me. I have another one in the living room. Come, I'll show you. I take his hand and pull him out of the room. When we get into the living room, I stop him just inside the doorway and point. There. It's better from back here, I say lamely. This painting is of a waterfall. It took me years to learn to paint water effectively. I'm super proud of this painting, but I can't have Dustin getting too close and reading my signature. Dustin politely stays back. That's incredible, he says. As he studies the work from afar, my gaze travels over mantle of the fireplace and I freeze. Jera has a photo of us on display. There we are, twin sisters, smiling at the camera. My heart lodges itself into my throat. Chapter 9 I desperately try to think of what I'm going to do to get Dustin out of the living room. If he sees the photo of me and Jera, it's all over. He will know immediately that I'm not Jera, and Jera will murder me. I remember one more painting I have that he hasn't seen. Want me to show you one I painted when I was six years old? Dustin turns to me, a smile in his eyes. I'd love to. I usher him back into the library, where I have all my supplies. I pick up my old backpack sitting in the corner and unzip the front zipper. Inside is a folded up piece of paper. I hand it to him. He unfolds it and looks at the cat I painted. I drew it in red crayon and then painted it in blue. It was misshapen. The head was much too small for the body, and it makes me laugh every time I look at it. Wow, look at that, Dustin says, and I can tell he's trying to be nice. I laugh, giving him silent permission to laugh with me. It's my favorite painting I've done. Do you want to know why? He laughs. Sure, why? Because that little girl was not afraid to mess up. She wasn't afraid to paint a blue cat. She did what her heart wanted. And my mother hung this picture on the refrigerator for everyone to see. That six-year-old was proud of this picture, and it reminds me that I can be proud of what I do, even if it's not always perfect. Dustin stares at me in the dim light of the library. I love that.
I take the picture from him and fold it back up, suddenly embarrassed that I revealed so much of myself. I hadn't meant to. Hey, I think I smell that brisket, I say. Isn't it done by now? Dustin looks at his watch. Oh, you're right. I need to take it out of the smoker. It needs to rest before we eat it. Rest? Is it tired? I smirk at my lame joke. He laughs, although it wouldn't surprise me if he was just being polite again. We'll be able to eat in an hour or so. Want to come help me make a side dish? Oh, you are so cute. You think I can help in the kitchen? I pat his arm like he's adorable. Come on, I won't make you do anything too difficult. We can even do the dishes afterwards. His lips curve up in an incredibly sexy smile. Memories of Dustin's hands grazing mine under the soapy water pop into my brain, and an electric current runs through me, making me all tingly. Okay, I say, before I can stop myself. Maybe Jera will forgive me for spending so much time with Dustin once I tell her all that happened with the phone and how I was such a fish out of water. I really need Dustin's help. It's nothing else. At least that's what I tell myself. When we go outside, I pick up Squint and bring him along. Dustin scratches under Squint's chin before driving us to his house, which takes ten minutes because of all the time it takes to open and close our gates. We should just build a gate between our properties, I joke. Dustin looks at me like I've suggested we put mayonnaise on our ice cream. What? I mean, there's just one fence between our properties. We could... My voice trails off. The whole fence thing my sister has going with Dustin smacks me upside the head. I'm such an idiot. Never mind, I say quietly. Dustin swallows as he puts his car into park. Jera, he says quietly, do we really need to take this whole thing to court? I pet squint and stare at the floor mat. I'm in so much trouble. I'd forgotten all about the feud between Jera and Dustin. What am I supposed to say to him? I can't tell him anything, because no matter what I say, I'll be putting words into Jera's mouth. The seconds tick by as I try to think of something I can say that won't get me into trouble with Jera and won't sound lame to Dustin. I open my mouth to speak, but then close it again. You know what? He says. Forget I even brought it up. Dustin hops out of the car and pulls open my door. I look up at him. I'm sorry, I say as I get out of the car. Guilt constricts my throat. I feel bad for all the lying I'm doing. No, I was wrong to say something. I don't want to ruin today with talk about property lines and fences. He holds out his arm to me, like we're about to walk down the red carpet or something. I take his arm, grateful for his suggestion. All right, let's not talk about it. Squint jumps out of my arms when we enter Dustin's house. He follows us into the kitchen. Dustin goes out the patio door and takes the brisket out of the smoker. He brings it into the kitchen. My mouth waters as he places it on a wooden cutting board to cool. He opens his refrigerator. What side dish should we make? What were you going to make before you invited me over? Cheesy mashed potatoes, but they're really not a good diet food. I playfully shove his shoulder. Why do you keep asking if I'm on a diet? Are you trying to tell me something? No, I just... He stops and offers me a sheepish look. I've been around Hollywood types my whole life. Everyone is on a diet all the time. Well, I'm not. He smiles as he pulls out the butter, cream cheese, and a few other types of cheese from the fridge. All right, then. Cheesy mashed potatoes it is. But tomorrow is going to be a salad day. I grin at him. Are you inviting me over for that, too? Because I love a good salad. He chuckles. I never know what you're going to say. And that's why you like me. I bat my eyelids at him. I'm being way too flirty, but I suddenly don't care. I'm having fun and ignoring the consequences. He shuts the fridge and turns to me, putting both hands on the counter on either side of me, pinning me. His gaze sweeps over my face. I do like you, Jera, more than I ever thought I would. My heart beats fast and my breath catches. I can smell Dustin's cologne. It's a musky, heady smell, and it's mixed with the scent of him. I think I'm going to faint. Then I process what he just said. You didn't think you'd like me? I ask quietly. 
That's not what I meant, he says, standing back. That first day, when you came over to welcome me to the neighbourhood, I was quite attracted to you. But then I had that party and, well, you know. I don't know, but I assume from the bits I've heard that Jera wasn't too nice to him. I drop my gaze. I'm sorry all that happened. Me too. After that happened, I thought I knew the real you, and I have to admit I didn't like what I saw. My stomach sours. Jera has her issues. She can act like a spoiled brat sometimes, but she has a sweet side too. I'm not always proud of myself, I whisper, but I try. I get that. I'd hate to be judged solely on the worst thing I've ever done. I'm just seeing a different side to you right now, and I'm curious. His gaze meets mine and lingers there. I wait a second, but he doesn't finish, so I ask, About what? Which Jera is the real Jera? Chapter 10. I try to laugh off his comment. What, do you think there are two of me? I cringe. Stupid thing to say. I might as well just tell him I'm a twin. His close proximity is making my thoughts all muddled. His gaze softens. No, I think you were having a terrible day, and I made it ten times worse. I had no idea, Jera. I'm being honest. I know I shouldn't ask. I should just change the subject and let things go, but I am too curious, and the words fly out of my mouth. You had no idea about what? I had no idea you'd had work done. I never would have said that stuff to your friends had I known. You believe me, right? He rakes his hand through his hair. I don't know what was said, but I can piece together that he'd totally embarrassed Jera without meaning to, and it had something to do with plastic surgery. Heck, I didn't even know she'd had plastic surgery until recently. I guess she's had more work done than just her eyelids. Since she's going to such great lengths to hide this, she's probably self-conscious about it all. He looks so distraught I can't help myself. I grab his hand. I now know you wouldn't say anything on purpose to embarrass me. He runs his thumb over my knuckles and my knees go weak. And I'm sorry for everything else I've said since you served me those papers. I... I didn't mean those things. I was angry. The sincerity in his eyes stirs my emotions. I can tell you're speaking the truth. Dustin gazes at me for another moment before he takes a step back and drops my hand. I'm glad we got a chance to talk. I've been feeling bad for all that. Me too. He pulls out a drawer and grabs a potato peeler. The mood lightens. Would you rather peel the potatoes or grate the cheese? Give me the peeler. Last time I grated cheese, I got my knuckles. Dustin cringes. Ouch! I wouldn't want you to do anything to your beautiful hands. Well, I do make a living with my hands. I kind of need them. You... what? Dustin shoots me a confused look. Oh, right. I'm answering as Mackenzie again. I mean, an actor needs her hands, right? My gaze flicks over to Squint, curled up in the sunlight from the patio door. Dustin gives me a funny look. I guess so. I open the potato sack, my fingers shaking. I need to be more careful. How many should I peel? Thankfully, Dustin gets to talking about the recipe and ignores my error. We boil the potatoes, strain them, and add the cheese. Dustin pulls out the hand mixer. Ooh, I say, taking it from him. I want to do this part. Okay. When I was little, my mum would make chocolate cake and she'd let me lick the beaters. Dustin gives me a devilish grin. Yep, me too. That's why I'm such a great kisser. I blush, just saying, I always wanted to use the mixer, but mom never let me, and I don't cook, so I've never used one. I hold it out like a weapon. It looks fun. Dustin lets out a laugh. Not like that. Here, he says, coming up behind me. He plugs the mixer in, and pushes the beaters down into the warm potatoes and melting cheese. Hold it up, right, or we'll have a mess. His warm body presses up against my back, and my heart speeds up. I look at the buttons on the mixer. Which one do I push? He points to the dial. This will turn it on and control the speed. Just start with it on low. I use my thumb to flick on the power. The beaters come to life. I move them around the potatoes. 
I like how they turn the chunks of boiled potatoes into a smooth mixture. I stare, transfixed at the patterns it makes in the potatoes. You can probably turn it on higher now, he says. Okay. I turn the dial up another notch. Dustin puts his hand over mine and guides the mixer around the edges of the bowl. This way you'll get all the potatoes. My skin comes alive with his touch. Okay, I repeat, not paying much attention to the potatoes anymore. I'm pretty sure I got the mixing thing down, but Dustin doesn't take his hand off mine. It's making it hard for me to breathe. My insides are all fluttery, especially with how close Dustin's cheek is to mine. It looks good, he says in my ear. I take it to mean we can stop beating the potatoes now, so I lift the mixer out of the bowl. No, he shouts as potatoes fly everywhere. I quickly shove the mixer back into the bowl and turn it off, but the damage is already done. There's at least one glop of potatoes on my cheek. Squint barks and runs to us, thinking this is another fun game. Dustin laughs as he unplugs the mixer. You've done it now. I turn to see Dustin with tiny potato spots all over his face and hair. I can't help it, I bust out laughing. You look like you've got potato chicken pox. He can't keep a straight face. You look like you've been through an apocalypse and contracted something terrible. I reach up and wipe a clump off his chin with my finger. He grabs my hand and licks the potatoes off. I laugh even harder. Was that supposed to be sexy? Because you can't be sexy with dots of mashed potatoes all over you. He chuckles as he shakes his head. Not sexy, huh? Nope. Then how about this? He cradles my face with his hands and electricity spreads through me. My knees wobble as he slowly comes closer to me. I have this insane thought that he's about to kiss me, but at the last second, he changes trajectory. His lips come in contact with my cheek, and he licks the potato off my face. All kinds of sensations spread through me. I can't move as he challenges me with his gaze, his face still so close I can feel his breath on my lips. His blue eyes hold a question I'm not even willing to explore. Even though his actions were silly, the moment is anything but, and I have trouble taking in a breath. Time seems to slow as we stare at each other. Still not sexy? He finally asks. No. The word barely comes out. I don't believe you, he whispers. The moment stretches, and his gaze lands on my lips. He slowly moves toward me again, and I know this time he's going to kiss me. I close my eyes, silently giving him permission and waiting for his lips to touch mine. Squint barks and jumps on my leg, breaking my trance. My eyes fly open and I pull away. I come back to my senses as my heart pounds out a staccato rhythm. I can't kiss Dustin. What am I thinking? I force a laugh. Totally not sexy. You need to work on that, buddy. I bump his arm with my fist like we're old college roommates. He grins, but it doesn't seem genuine. Epic fail. Guess we'd better wash up. I glance around, now noticing all the splatters on the wall and counter. And I'd better clean your kitchen. There you go again, cleaning when the staff are perfectly capable. The spots will just wipe off if I clean it now, I say, as I walk toward the bathroom. If we wait, all those globs will dry and be terrible to get off. I close myself in the bathroom and grab a washcloth my fingers shaking. I'd flirted with him, and he'd almost kissed me. I took in a deep breath, trying to control my emotions. I can't let anything happen between Dustin and me, not while I'm Jera. I need Dustin's help right now, but I have to stop my flirting. I need to remember I'm playing a part. I'm Jera. I've just broken up with Luke, and I can't get into another relationship. Chapter 11. I clean myself up, then I wipe all the dots of potatoes off the floor while trying to keep Squint from licking them. I wipe the walls as Dustin cuts the brisket. The potatoes have just come out of the oven, and everything smells divine. I resolve to buy a cookbook when I get home so I can eat better meals. Dustin gets out a potholder, and I grab it from him. What? he asks. Did you make this? He chuckles. Yes. It's red, white, and blue with a star in the middle. It's adorable. How old were you? About ten, probably. I give it back to him. 
so cute. When we sit down to eat, Dustin looks over at me. Well, now you know not to remove the beaters from the bowl until the power is off. I think that's something you should have told me right away. He scoffs. So all this is my fault? I smile sweetly at him. Yes. He lets out a laugh. All right, I'll take the blame. My insides do funny things as I stare at his laugh lines. Why does he have to be the most handsome man on the planet? Why couldn't Jera's neighbour be some troll? I'm in so much trouble. I look down at my plate and concentrate on eating. Of course, the brisket melts in my mouth and the cheesy potatoes are to die for. This man can seriously cook. And now I'm fantasising about marrying him and eating like this all the time. A few minutes go by in silence before he speaks. What are you thinking about? Nothing, I say quickly, still trying to push the image of him as my husband out of my head. Imaginary Dustin looks fantastic in a tuxedo. He raises his eyebrows but doesn't press the matter. How do you like the meal? It's delicious. I shove a large scoop of potatoes into my mouth to prove it. He seems pleased at this. We eat in silence for another few minutes. I try not to look at him, because when I do, I seem to forget who I'm supposed to be. Dustin takes a sip of his water. Do you eat out a lot, since you don't cook? I know Jera does, so I nod. Yeah. Do you have a favourite restaurant? I have no idea what Jera prefers, so I shake my head. Not really. A noise comes from the other room like something fell on the floor. Dustin looks at Squint, who is still curled up by the patio door. What was that? I ask. I don't know. I'll go check. He wipes his face with his napkin and leaves the room. Moments later, he comes back in holding a framed photo. A picture fell from the wall. I guess the nail gave out. He sets the picture on the table. For a minute there, I thought you had a ghost. Maybe I do, he says, smiling at me. I turn to the photo on the table. Who is that? My grandmother. In a lot of ways, I was closer to her than my own mother, but she died when I was young. Oh, I'm sorry. I eat the last of my brisket and set my fork down on my plate. My mind wanders to the gala event tonight. I'll have to go out into public and be seen as Jera. I was supposed to schedule her hairstylist to come, but my phone doesn't work. My throat tightens with the thought, why did I say yes to this anyway? We finish and I take the plates to the sink. I wash the dishes in silence while Dustin dries them and puts them away. I sense a shift in the mood, but I'm now too nervous about the turtle benefit tonight to put a lot of thought into it. Dustin puts the last dish in the cupboard and turns to me. Look, I think I made a mistake tonight. I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable or upset you. I'm not upset. Lie. I'm frustrated with myself for flirting with him and allowing myself to forget why I'm here. He folds his arms and gives me a look like he doesn't believe me. I'm sorry for stepping over the line earlier. I'll try to remember what you said yesterday. What I said. That you want to keep things on a friendship level between us. Guilt surfaces and I put a hand on his arm. It's not you. It's me. Truth. I'm feeling all kinds of bad for the way I acted. I started the flirting. He was just acting on my lead. His expression softens. I understand. Will you still take me to the charity gala? Of course, I'll pick you up at six. I whistle and Squint comes running. Thank you. What in the world does a person wear to a Save the Sea Turtles charity party? I would text Jera to ask, but, alas, my phone is still stuck in a Ziploc baggie in the hopes that I don't lose my only picture of my father. I'm counting down the hours until I can check it. I have 24 to go. I pace Jera's closet, looking at all the sequined gowns and sparkly shoes. After riffling through all her clothes, I find a plain black dress and a simple pair of pumps. Perfect. I get dressed and stand in front of the full-length mirror. I twist from side to side, examining myself. What do you think, Squint? My dog looks up at me and barks. I laugh. That good, huh? I sit down at the makeup table. I'm kind of lost, but I try harder this time, as I'll be out in the public eye acting as my sister. Luckily, I'd found a couple of professional photos of Jera in a magazine, and I try to duplicate her look. 
It's not terrible when I'm finished and I'm pleased with myself. I leave my hair down, just give it a little curl on the ends, like I often see in photos of Jera. It looks pretty good, if I do say so myself. I stand and take one last look in the mirror. A bell chimes, which I know means Dustin is at the front gate. I grab Squint and rush down the stairs. I know I can't bring him along. This isn't the type of event where you can bring your dog. I just need him in my arms for a few more minutes before I say goodbye. I press the button that opens the front gate. A limousine pulls up in front of my house, and for a second I panic. I'm actually doing this. I'm going to be Jera at some fancy party. I pet Squint and tell myself it will all be okay. Jera didn't say I had to stay long, right? Just make an appearance. The limo driver opens the door and Dustin steps out. I give Squint a kiss before setting him on the tile flooring. I'll be back soon, I say, more to calm my own nerves than to calm his. He just sits on the floor and stares at me. Be good while I'm gone. I brush a dog hair off the front of my dress and straighten my spine. I can do this. I step outside. Dustin is wearing a tuxedo, and I about swallow my tongue. My imagination was so right. He looks like he stepped off a movie set. You look beautiful, he says, his gaze traveling over me. So do you. I mean, handsome. Perfect. I'm already making a fool of myself. A horrible thought jumps into my head. No, I'm not making a fool of myself. I'm making a fool of Jera. Dread fills my chest. That's ten times worse. If I totally mess up, it's Jera's name that will be dragged through the mud. Dustin smiles and helps me into the limo then joins me. You look nervous. I'm going to throw up. His eyes widen in alarm. Are you sick? No, I quickly assure him. I just get some anxiety when I'm in crowds of people. I didn't know that about you. Great. I'm talking like Mackenzie again. I smooth the front of my dress. I don't like people knowing. Dustin reaches over and pats my hand. I won't tell anyone. The gesture and his kind words send a wave of gratitude over me. I have no idea what I would do without Dustin by my side. Thank you. As we drive closer, my arms are empty and weird. I haven't travelled anywhere without Squint since I got him. It's making my chest feel all tight and funny. I squeeze my hands into fists and try not to think about the party. Dustin's gaze dips to my tight fists. Just how bad is your social anxiety? I take in a deep breath and let it out. I'll be fine. At least, that's what I'm trying to tell myself. Here. He grabs my hand and pries open my fist, sliding his fingers between mine. Squeeze my hand when you get anxious. Okay. The limo pulls to a stop and I know it's showtime. I can do this, I tell myself. The problem is, I know I'm lying. Chapter 12. I swallow and give myself one last pep talk before I step out of the limo. Paparazzi are lined up behind ropes and flashes of light blind me as I step aside so Dustin can climb out. He waves to the cameras and then grasps my hand, firm and steady. Paparazzi call out to us, but there's a whooshing sound in my ears, and I can't hear them clearly. Flashes of light blind me. I know I've got a terrible expression on my face, like I'm an animal about to be roadkill. Before I know what's happening, Dustin guides me up the steps and into the building. The lobby is dimly lit and quiet compared to the commotion outside. An artsy chandelier hangs down the centre with clusters of lit-up rectangles. It adds a nice touch to the building. A few people are waiting by the elevators, and I recognise Jalen Carter, the famous pop singer who used to sing as Shadow Walker. I listen to his music all the time, my stomach clenches. Dustin walks up to Jalen and shakes his hand. Good to see you again, Jalen. You know Jared Davenport, right? Jalen extends his hand to me. I don't think we've met. I shake his hand and smile. I love your music. I try not to act like a fangirl, but it's hard. I followed Jalen's story closely when the news broke that he was Shadow Walker. I'm a bit enamoured with him. Jalen grins at me. Thank you. I love your work as well. He motions to the woman next to him. This is my wife, Riley. 
I say hello and take in a deep breath. This is going to be all right. All I have to do is smile at people and shake hands. That's easy. The elevator dings and we enter. Dustin leans down to me. You doing all right? I nod. I'm good. For once, I'm not lying. I just shook hands with one of the biggest pop stars in the nation and I didn't even throw up on him. I'm peachy. But as soon as the elevator doors open up to a massive ballroom full of people, my anxiety smacks me in the face. I grab onto Dustin's hand like it's a life preserver and I'm about to drown. It's okay, he says in my ear, ushering me out of the elevator. Just stay by me. I cling to him and we walk through the ballroom. We pass a massive mural of painted sea turtles swimming under the water. The mural glimmers with something shiny and sparkly over the paint. I focus on it as we walk. It's a beautiful piece and I wonder who painted it. Was it made just for this event? The signature says Isabella Shepherd, and I almost trip. I know that artist. She's extremely famous in the art world. Dustin guides me to the table where they're serving hors d'oeuvre. A large ice sculpture in the shape of a sea turtle sits among the shrimp cocktails. Do you want something to eat? He asks. I shake my head. I couldn't eat right now if I was dying of hunger. No, thank you. No problem. He bypasses the tables of food and we travel to a corner of the ballroom where there's a break in the crowd. Several people say hello to us and I recognize some of them from television. Mostly, I'm just trying to breathe and not do or say anything embarrassing. Dustin turns to me. How are you doing? You look a little pale. My gaze skitters around the large room. Jera said this would be a small party. I'll have to tell her later what I consider small because this definitely isn't it. I'm okay, I think. Lie. I'm going to pass out. There's a buzzing noise in my head like it's filled with bees. Jera, focus on me. Dustin pumps my hand until I look at him. Look at me and nothing else. Pretend we're the only ones in this room. I stare at his face, trying to pull it into focus. I take in his hair, his eyes, and his lips. For some reason, staring at his lips makes me feel better. Good, he says, smiling. Now tell me what your favorite food is. Macaroni and cheese. I say it automatically, like I would rattle off my birth date or my social security number if I were talking to the bank. He laughs, and not just some polite laugh either. It's a belly laugh. Really? Embarrassment heats my cheeks, but I don't try to deny it. Yeah, I see. And what's your favorite color? I know what he's trying to do, and I like that he's being so sweet. It's actually working a little too. I'm still tense, but he's helping me breathe better. Cotton candy pink. Like the food, or is that the name of a tube of paint? I smile because he's getting to know me so well. Tube of paint, he nods. I like it. Do you have any paintings done with cotton candy pink? I often use it in sunsets. Ah, that would be beautiful. I was imagining a monochromatic one, all cotton candy pink. He smiles at me, and it reminds me how incredibly good-looking this man is. Everything about him screams movie star, from his strong jawline to his brilliant blue eyes. No wonder he's had an amazing career. I'm impressed that you know what monochromatic means. I took an art class once, back in college. Only time in my life I almost flunked a class. He grins at me, his perfect white teeth showing. No way. Yes way. How can that even be? I always thought everyone got good grades in art. Did you skip all the assignments? No, he says with a laugh in his voice. I'm just terrible at anything past a stick figure. But I didn't think teachers graded on skill level, not unless you're an art major and want to do it full time. I frown at the injustice of his college art teacher. Or maybe you sailed through those classes because you had natural talent. He takes my other hand in his. How are you doing? I realize the buzzing in my head has subsided and I'm not as nauseous. He kept me talking and took my mind off the crowd. Better? He gives me a smile and it warms me to my toes. Good. Do you want to try some food now? I glance at the people crowded around the hors d'oeuvre tables and my anxiety creeps up. 
the buzzing comes back. No, no problem. We can stay right here and talk. He moves to get in my line of sight. Stay focused on me. I stare at him and try to forget we're at a party. I force myself to breathe. Okay. Several people come over and chat with us. I focus on Dustin and I'm able to say a few hellos without falling apart. After several conversations, Dustin squeezes my hand. You're doing great. Thank you. The live band begins playing All of Me by John Legend and a few couples move to the dance floor. Dustin glances in that direction, then turns to me. Do you want to dance? Maybe concentrating on moving my feet in the right ways will help me focus and forget about the people. Sure. Dustin leads me to the corner of the dance floor, and I love how he instinctively knows I don't want to be in the middle. He puts his arm around my waist and pulls me to him, taking my hand. He starts to sway to the music, slow and rhythmic. All kinds of feelings surface in me. The fluid way he glides to the music is soothing, and I'm safe in his arms. My body reacts to being so close to him, enveloped in his scent. My heart races and my hormones scream at me. This man is all muscle. He leans down. Still doing okay? His voice is low and his breath tickles my cheek. He's somehow created a bubble just for us, and this dance seems intimate, even though we're in a room full of people. Yes, I'm okay. Tell me, why did you decide to go into acting? Luckily, I know this answer. Because of Audrey Hepburn. Really? His thumb grazes over my back and shivers go up my spine. I'm serious. My aunt was in love with old movies. I grew up watching Breakfast at Tiffany's and My Fair Lady. I adored Audrey and wanted to be just like her when I grew up. That's what first sparked my interest in Hollywood. Now I understand why you'd want to meet Cary Grant. I grew up on those movies, too. My parents loved films from that era. They don't make movies like that anymore. I agree. Those are some of the best films. Dustin smiles down at me. And what sparked your interest in painting? That's easy to answer. When I was five, my father took me to an art museum. It was just him and me, and I felt so special, so grown up. I fell in love with the beautiful landscapes. The mountains and trees seemed to leap right off the paper. My father seemed so impressed with the paintings, and I knew I wanted to create beauty like that. I wanted him to be impressed with me. He must be. Tears prick at my eyes, and I have to blink to stop them from falling down my face. I hadn't meant to bring him up. I hadn't even realized he was so tied in with my desire to paint. What's wrong? I just... I shake my head to try to clear away the pain. He's not a part of my life anymore. I'm so sorry. His hand presses firmly on my back, pulling me even closer. It's okay. Normally, I'm not emotional about it. After a few minutes of swaying to the music, Dustin leans close. So, you have no contact with him? No. And the only photo I have of him is on my phone. Dustin sucks in a breath. Oh, Jera. The way he says my sister's name sends a wave of sadness through me. The words, I'm not Jera, form on my lips, but I can't say them. I'm supposed to be Jera right now. This is my one job, and I can't mess it up for my sister. But what I wouldn't give to hear him say, Oh, Mackenzie. I sigh and put my head on his shoulder. It feels so nice to be close to him. I don't want this dance to end. Jera! I jerk around at the sound of my sister's name and see Luke Carter striding toward me, his nostrils flaring. Chapter 13 Luke grabs my arm and jerks me away from Dustin. Jera, what are you doing? My bubble pops, the safety of Dustin's arms ripped from me. I'm suddenly in the middle of a massive crowd of people, all staring at me. My throat tightens and I can't breathe. Luke stares at me, his face flushed. Are you cheating on me? My head starts to spin, and the room folds in on me. I shake my head, sure that Jera told me she was no longer seeing Luke. We broke up. Luke narrows his eyes at me. Is this why you wanted to break up with me? Because of him? No, I... My vision blurs, and I can't think. Why is Luke making this into such a big deal? 
He's not even dating my sister anymore. Dustin pulls me to his side. We're just friends, he says, his voice firm but calming. I cling to him, desperate to make the horrible buzzing stop. Luke grabs my wrist and tugs me away from Dustin. All my security is gone. The room presses in on me. The people, the noise, everything smothers me until I can't stand it anymore. Stop! I jerk my hand away and collapse to the floor, pressing my hands to my ears. What is this? Luke says, like I'm trying to pull something on him. Dustin is by my side in an instant, holding me, cocooning me. With his help, I stand again. What is going on? Luke grounds out, practically growling. Dustin holds out a hand in a calm-down gesture. Let's go somewhere to talk, he says, glancing around at the crowd of people all staring at us. He still has his arm around me, and that's the only thing holding me together. I nod, frantic to get out. Yes, let's go talk. All right. Luke grabs my hand and tugs me toward the elevators. At this point, I don't even care that he's manhandling me. I just want to get away from all the people. When we get to the elevators, I try pulling away, but he's got my fingers in a vice grip. Luke, let go. You're hurting me. Dustin grabs Luke's arm. Did you hear her? Let go. Finally, he does, but the anger on his face scares me. I can't believe you would do this to me. The elevator doors open, and I push past Luke to get away from everything. Dustin steps next to me, shielding me from Luke, who looks like he's about ready to rip me to shreds. After the doors close, Luke faces me. Is this about Deborah? Because I told you Deborah was a mistake. I'm not even into her. You're my everything. My heart is pounding, but now that I'm away from the crowd, the buzzing has stopped and I'm able to breathe again. And now that I can think, I can't believe what a jerk Luke Carter is turning out to be. I straighten my spine and glare at Luke. We broke up. I have nothing else to say to you. He rolls his eyes. You break up with me all the time. This time is no different. You love me. You'll be back. This guy is a piece of work, and if Jera needs me to finally kick him to the curb, I'm happy to do that for her. Listen. I take a step toward Luke, and he backs up. I poke him in the chest. We are through. Don't call me, don't text me. It's over between us. This relationship, I say, pointing to him and myself. It's all done. Finished, concluded, and terminated. But the elevator doors open, and I grab Dustin's hand. Goodbye, Luke. I rush out into the lobby with Dustin. I don't even care if Luke follows us. I'm done with this gala and I'm ready to leave. Wow. Dustin looks down at me. That was amazing. We near the doors and I stop, not ready to go out and be hounded by the media. I glance back at the elevators, but Luke isn't there anymore. Either he went back up to the gala or he left out the back. Do you think he got the picture? Dustin lets out a breath. I think so. Good. Are you ready to leave? I bite my lower lip and hope he doesn't want to stay longer. Dustin's thumb grazes over the back of my hand. Let's go. He calls for his car and a few moments later it pulls up. We walk past the cameras again and I try not to trip or otherwise embarrass myself as we climb into the limo. After I'm settled into my seat, I turn to Dustin. I'm sorry, you didn't even get anything to eat. I bet you're hungry. He shakes his head. I'm okay. How are you doing? His gaze intensifies, and I know what he is asking. I'm good. He picks up my hand. You're shaking. Oh, I didn't notice. My heart is starting to calm down and beat at a normal level, and I finally feel more like myself. His eyebrows pull down. Are you really okay? I had no idea crowds affected you so much. You've hidden it well. And seeing Luke again had to be difficult for you. I'm much better now. I exhale and sit back against the seat. We sit in silence for a moment before I turn to him. Thank you for what you did in there. What did I do? You kept me focused so I wouldn't think about the crowd. And you made sure Luke didn't eat me alive. I put my hand on his knee. You were quite forceful with him. I don't think he's going to bother you again. I hope not, I say under my breath. Jera doesn't need a guy like Luke. I pray she meets someone else and forgets all about him. 
Dustin places his hand on mine. Let's get out of these stuffy clothes and order delivery. My stomach is finally ready to eat. That sounds like a great idea. Chapter 14 I enter Jera's house and my anxiety slips away as I pick up Squint. He licks my face. Yes, I know. I'm so sorry I left you here all by yourself. I run up the stairs and change into a pair of jeans and a favourite hoodie of mine. I know Jera told me not to wear my own clothes, but I don't care. Jera won't know. I need the oversized soft fabric to give me comfort. I had a rough night. On my way through the living room, I remember the photo of me and Jera. I grab it and hide it in a drawer. I'll get it back out later. I carry Squint out to Dustin's car, and he drives us to his place. I place the order. It says it will be delivered in a few minutes. Good. I'm starving now that I'm not in a stressful situation anymore. We enter Dustin's house, and I set Squint down. Want to watch a movie or something while we eat? Dustin asks. Sure. Dustin takes me down a set of stairs to his theatre room. He flicks a switch and tiny floor lights illuminate, just like in the movie theatres. He's got three rows of reclining chairs and a massive leather couch in the front row. This is amazing. You don't have a theatre room? He raises one eyebrow. Oops, Jera does have one, but it's not as impressive. It's not this big and it doesn't have these cool floor lights. Ah, I see. I sit down on his couch and Squint hops onto my lap. Dustin motions toward the stairs. I'm going to go change. Make yourself comfortable. Okay. Dustin leaves and I pet Squint and let my brain wander while he's gone. I'm so glad my time at the gala is over and I don't have to go back. I'm not cut out for that kind of social interaction. A few minutes later, Dustin brings in the food he ordered and sets it on a tray table along with some bowls from the kitchen. He changed into a pair of jeans that look so good on him it should be illegal. Dang, he's so cute. I swallow back my emotions. I can't have a crush on him. I'm so glad you like Thai food. It's one of my favourites. Dustin pulls out a container from the sack and lifts the lid. The smell hits me and my mouth waters. I love chicken curry. The last of my anxiety melts away as I scratch behind Squint's ears. It is wonderful to have him back in my arms. Dustin dishes us both some rice and puts the chicken curry on top. You said you have a sister. Is that your only sibling? Yes. What about you? No siblings? He chuckles. I thought the whole world knew everything there is to know about my family. I shrug. I don't read the gossip columns. His mouth pops open. You don't? Not even when you're in them? That's when I read them. I shake my head. I don't. I hate the lies they print about Jera. They make her look trashy, going from man to man, using them for her own personal gain. I know her too well to believe those lies. Okay then, he says, as he sits down beside me and hands me my bowl. That's probably good. I should follow your lead. And I have no siblings. It's just me and my very famous parents. I nod, not really knowing who his parents are. Who are they again? You really don't know. He shoves a bite of curry into his mouth. No. My father is Shane William Douglas, and my mother is Alison Taylor. Ah, yes, I know who they are. Are they still together? I grab the takeout bag and dig out a pair of chopsticks. No, they split up when I was young. I'm sorry. I touch his arm. Don't be. They needed to be divorced. Sometimes it's better for people to go their own ways. Your father was in a movie recently, wasn't he? Yes. Wrong number. I haven't seen it yet. I was on location filming. I pick out a piece of chicken from my bowl with the chopsticks. Want to watch it? Sure. He picks up the remote and finds it on a streaming service. I pop another piece of chicken in my mouth. At what age did you start acting? Six. I did some commercials and some kid shows. Wow, that's young. He glances over at me. Too young. You wouldn't start your kid with acting at that age? I shift squint, so he's sitting more on my lap. No, kids should be kids. In many ways, my childhood was taken from me. If I ever have kids, I wouldn't want them to work until they were at least in their late teen years. 
He scrolls to find the film. I can see why you'd feel that way. He turns to me. Not that I'm not grateful for everything my parents did for me. I've had a long and profitable career. I just think there's more to life than work. I don't know that my parents have figured that out yet. I scratch under Squint's chin. I think a lot of people haven't figured that out yet. We start his father's movie. It's a cute rom-com where the main character calls a wrong number, and they end up having a relationship. As the movie progresses, I subconsciously get closer to Dustin until my head is resting on his shoulder. It's not awkward until he shifts, and I get the impression he wants me to move off him. Sorry, I say, and sit up. No, I didn't mean to make you move. My back just hurt. Come back. Are you sure? I'm self-conscious. He motions between us. We're friends, right? Friends are comfortable around each other. I promise I won't put the moves on you. Disappointment settles over me, but I try not to focus on that. I shouldn't be disappointed. I want to keep things as just friends between us. Friendship is what I need. I keep telling myself that as I settle back against him. Dustin pets squint, and at some point during the last half of the movie, his arm goes around me. Friends, I remind myself. He's not trying anything. He's just showing me that friends don't need to be so distant with each other. I snuggle into Dustin's side. I love the clean smell of his fabric softener and the light remains of the cologne he wore tonight. His fingers graze over my arm, lazily, like he doesn't even know he's doing it, but it sends my heart into overdrive. I try to pay attention to the movie, but it's difficult. All I can think about is Dustin and how he makes my pulse race. He's so caring. I feel important when he's near me. He listens to me. And he didn't try to downplay my anxiety or make fun of me. He helped me through it somehow. My emotions surge as I think about all he did for me. The movie ends, and Dustin flicks off the screen, but he doesn't move, so I don't pull away. Have you ever done that? he asks. Called someone by accident, then talked to them? No. But once I texted my plumber instead of my boyfriend and asked him what time he was coming over, and if he'd pick up some tampons on the way. Dustin's laughter comes from deep in his chest, and I can't help but laugh with him. Seriously? What did he say? I try to talk between giggles. He responded with a few question marks. I was so embarrassed I never texted him again and just called someone else the next time I needed a plumber. Dustin's fingers trace a lazy circle on my arm. My heart does crazy things in my chest. I like the contact. It's good. Natural. Like we belong together. That's hilarious. Can I ask you a personal question? Dustin's tone is light, but I sense a serious undertone. Sure, I say, before I think too hard about it. Was Luke abusive to you? I swallow, the question hitting me hard. I sure hope Luke never did anything abusive to Jera, but the way he treated me tonight was scary. It made me wonder as well. I resolve to have a conversation with Jera about this. She needs to know she has support, and she shouldn't allow anyone to treat her the way Luke was treating me tonight. Dustin's lazy tracing stops and he looks at me. Jera? he asks, softly. You know you can tell me anything, right? I know, I quickly say. Dustin is waiting for me to answer him, and I have to tell him something. I can honestly say he has never acted that way toward me before tonight. Not a lie. But I'm going to get more details from Jera as soon as I can, because the thought of a jerk like Luke pushing around my sister makes me so angry. I'm glad, Dustin says. I was proud of the way you stood up to him. Thanks. Dustin reaches over and pets Squint. We've lived next to each other for a year, and I've never seen your dog outside. When did you get your dog? Chapter 15 I open my mouth to answer, but then realize Jera doesn't have a dog, and if I tell him the truth, it will be weird that he hasn't seen Squint until now. A while ago, I say, vaguely. You seem to use Squint as a way to cope, he says softly. I swallow, not realizing I was so transparent. I know I use Squint as a way to get through my anxiety, but I didn't realize how much I need him until I didn't have him tonight. I sort of fell apart at the gala. Would Squint have totally stopped my anxiety? Probably not, but he would have helped. 
Dustin traces more shapes on my arm as he waits for my answer. I do, I finally say. How long have you struggled with anxiety when you're in crowds? I press my lips together. This is not a question for Jira, and I can't answer it as her. This is strictly a Mackenzie question, and I shouldn't answer it truthfully. I should just lie and say it's a recent thing and I'm getting therapy for it, and it might go away soon. I should, but I don't. Since I was young, I hear myself say, how did you get past that to have a successful career? I search for a good lie that can get me out of this conversation. I can usually hide it much better. Things are a bit more stressful right now. Have you tried any medication? I tense. I've never seen anyone for my anxiety. I've always been able to handle it by staying home and making excuses as to why I can't be somewhere. And having squint has helped. No, I admit. You know, there's no shame in seeking help for something like that. I nod. I know this. I've just never thought of my anxiety as debilitating before. But tonight was horrible. I never want to go through that again. Luckily, I'm not Jera, and I don't have to regularly go to things like that. All that's left for me is a photo shoot, and I can't imagine a massive crowd of people at one of those. As I try to think of a response, I realize just how much I let my anxiety control my life. I hadn't seen it before, and it scares me. Honestly, it scares me too much to think about right now. I pack it away in a neat little box in the back of my brain. I know a really good therapist. I could get you his number. Yeah, right. I'm sure his therapist lives in LA and costs a billion dollars a visit. It's okay. I'm fine. Are you sure? I realize that I didn't look fine tonight. I had a complete meltdown. But Jera will be back in less than a week and to him it will look like my anxiety is all gone. I was just having a rough night. Usually I can handle things much better. If you change your mind, I can give you his number. He's helped me through quite a bit, and he can prescribe medication if that's needed. I look at him. What did you need help with? I blurt out before it hits me. That's a very personal question, and I have no business asking. Sorry, you don't have to answer. That was rude of me. No, I don't mind. He shifts so I can see him better. His gaze is so open, trusting. I struggled with depression for years. My medication has helped quite a bit, but learning some coping skills from my therapist has been a lifesaver. I can't believe you struggled like that. I would have never known. Nor I of you. I've seen you at functions. Granted, usually from afar, but still. You've done a great job hiding this. Guilt rises in me for bringing my problems down on my sister. It isn't usually this bad. I'm sure I'll be fine soon. I was impressed with you tonight. I bark out a laugh. I was a mess. No, you held it together really well. It wasn't until that jerk. He stops short and cringes. Sorry. Don't be. He is a jerk. I get mad all over again thinking about how he treated me how he might have been treating Jera this whole time. Dustin's jaw clenches. I really wanted to punch the guy. Me too. If he bothers you again, you can call me. I'll come. His sincerity washes over me, and I sit for a moment, stunned. He really would come if I needed him. I've had boyfriends before, but I haven't had anyone like Dustin, and he's not even my boyfriend. He's willing to come help me in any situation, the power of his words make me a little emotional. But then I remember. I can't. My phone isn't working. I flash him a cheesy grin. When you come for salad tomorrow, we can check on it. If it won't power up, I can take you to the phone store. Jera didn't say I could use her credit card for a new phone, but I'm in a bad situation. I pretty much have no other choice. Thank you. I glance at the clock and see it's after one o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry I stayed so late. I shift, and Squint jumps off my lap. Even though I don't want to, I stand up. It's time for me to leave. I was enjoying the time with you. Dustin stands and turns to me. Jera, I mean it when I say I'll come if you need me. If Luke shows up and you're frightened, scream, I'll hear you. I will. I gaze into his brilliant blue eyes. There's a softness there that takes me aback. Dustin acts like he wants to say something, but no words surface. 
He just stares at me with a look I can't quite decipher. I guess I'd better go now. I'll walk you home. I laugh. You don't have to do that. I live next door. I want to make sure you get home safe. His words imply so much more. I hadn't thought about the possibility of Luke hanging around outside my sister's house. I decide having Dustin take me home isn't a terrible idea. All right. Chapter 16 Dustin walks with me up to Jera's doorstep. I set Squint down and he runs off to sniff the rocks by the side of the house. I glance around, but I see no sign of Luke. Still, I have no idea if Jera gave him her gate and door codes. He could be inside the house waiting for me. Do you mind checking out the house for me? I ask tentatively. Dustin stares at me. You think Luke might be inside? Did you give him your security codes? I don't know. It comes out before I realize how stupid that sounds. Dustin makes a face. You don't know? What does that mean? I scramble to think of something rational. He could have looked when I typed in my code. I don't know if he can get inside or not. He nods. Ah, I get it. I don't mind looking around for you. I punch in the code and let Dustin in. Wait here, he says. He disappears into the house. I watch Squint do his business and then pick him up again, holding him tight to me. Dustin comes back after a few minutes. He's not here. Relief floods over me. Thank you for checking. You really should change your codes. I nod, even though I don't know how to change the codes. Maybe Jera will help me do that. I'll look up how to do that in the morning. Dustin doesn't like my answer. Why don't we do that now? It's one in the morning. He pulls out his phone. These locks aren't hard to change. Let me just Google it. He's right. It only takes a few minutes to figure out how to program the lock for a new code. I type in my old ATM pin number, resolving to change it back to Jera's code in a couple of days, so she never knows. Dustin steps back. Okay, I feel better now. At least he can't get inside. Yes, it's unlikely he would bust the door down. Dustin flinches. Are you sure you don't want me to stay the night? I could sleep on the couch. Even though Jera has an alarm system, it would be better with Dustin around. Yeah, I'd actually like that. And you don't have to sleep on the couch. There's a spare bedroom. Dustin comes inside with me. I just want you to be safe. My face warms. Do you need anything? I think I can find a toothbrush for you. That would be great. I get Dustin set up in Jera's spare bedroom. By the time I make it to bed, I'm exhausted, but I'm very glad Dustin is spending the night just in case. I feel safe with him here. The next morning, I find Dustin in the kitchen cooking breakfast. Hey, he says when I enter. How do you like your eggs? Scrambled, my heart melts. You didn't have to make me breakfast. It's no problem. He cracks an egg on a bowl. I know you have to record a class today, but you weren't up yet, so I decided to make you something to eat. That's really sweet. He whips the eggs in the bowl with a whisk. You know, I wanted to tell you I had a wonderful time with you last night. I stare at him with wide eyes. How can that be? I ruined your night at the gala. He shakes his head. No, you didn't. I got to dance with the most beautiful woman there, and afterwards, I enjoyed talking with you. I think it's the most real you've ever been with me. I blush at his compliment, and then I realize what he said, how he liked that I was real with him. My insides churn as I break eye contact. I'm not being real. I'm pretending to be someone I'm not. I force myself to smile at him. I enjoyed our time as well. We eat breakfast together. Then Dustin goes home to shower, and I go into the library room. I spend the rest of the morning filming my class on light and shadow. I love the new paints Jera bought me, and I take some time to play with them. The watercolour paper is a higher quality than I normally buy. It's taking the paint so well, I lose track of time, and I'm late for lunch with Dustin. I scoop up Squint and rush next door. As I ring the bell at the gate, Dustin comes on the screen. I wasn't sure you were coming. Sorry, got distracted by my new paints. I pet little Squint and he barks. Dustin laughs. 
Come in, he buzzes me through. As he lets me into the foyer, his phone rings. He looks at the screen and frowns. I have to take this, sorry. No problem. I walk into his kitchen to give him some privacy. Squint follows me and sits down by the patio door. I open the fridge and pull out the salad that Dustin had obviously made for our lunch. It's a fancy salad with shaved almonds and feta cheese. It looks delicious and I get out two salad bowls for us. Dustin walks into the kitchen, a strange look on his face. That was my attorney. I glance at him. Oh? She said your attorney is asking me to pay for a land survey. He stares at me. My throat goes dry. I forgot about the fence war again. I could just kick myself. Oh, right, I say, placing the salad forks on the table. I don't look at him. The moment turns awkward. I don't understand, he finally says. Why didn't you just ask me? Why send a message through your attorney? My brain stutters as I try to come up with something to say. I need some reason we can't come to some kind of arrangement. It's becoming weird the more I spend time with him and get to know him that we're not just hashing this out. I can't think of anything smart to say. You know how lawyers are. I thought we weren't going to talk about the fence. He exhales and runs his hand through his hair. I know I said that. It's just... I feel a little blindsided, Jera. It's like I'm dealing with two different people. I clamp my lips together as all the blood drains from my face. I'm sure I'm as white as a snowman. The table settings become very interesting to me. I don't know what to say. Dustin comes up to me. Look, I don't mind paying for another survey, but I think we've already established that the fence is on your property. I'm not arguing that. It's just going to take a lot of money to tear the whole fence down and rebuild. And for what? One inch? It totally sounds like Jera is being unreasonable, but I don't know why and I can't make decisions for her. I can't even explain anything to Dustin because I have no clue what Jera's thinking. I'm sorry, we shouldn't talk about this. Dustin sets his phone down on the table. He studies me and I avoid his gaze. Finally, he says, Are you upset with me? Did I do something to offend you? I take a step toward him, putting my hand on his. No, please, don't take it that way. He shakes his head and stares at me with those brilliant blue eyes. I just don't understand. I know, I'm sorry. He pulls back from me. All right, as long as you're not mad or anything. I'm not. I grab the salad and dish it out into our bowls. Let's change the subject. Okay. Dustin sits down and picks up his fork. I stare at the table, trying to think of something to say. Do you like being an actor? He raises his eyebrows. Do I what? You know, do you like what you do for a living? If you had a chance, would you do something else? No one has ever asked me that before. He stabs at his salad. I wait for him to answer the question. When he doesn't, I prod him. Well? I don't know. I mean, it was sort of just expected of me to take this path. He shrugs. I guess I like it. Everyone says I'm good at it. I've never thought about doing anything else. His gaze connects with mine. What about you? Do you like acting? Jera was born to be an actress. She was made for the limelight, the cameras, and all the glitz. I slowly nod, knowing I have to answer as her. Yes, I love it. Dustin cocks his head to the side. There's something you're not saying, though. I can see it. Yeah, well, that's because I suck at lying. But I can't tell him that. I shift a bit in my chair. Best to be vague. I mean, the acting part is great. There are other aspects that aren't so great. He gives me an understanding look. I get that. I eat my salad, amazed that Dustin can make even salad taste fantastic. I just need to hold out for a little while longer, until my phone works. Then, I can talk to Jera and everything will be fine. We finish our lunches and clean up. Then Dustin turns to me. All right, let's go power up your phone and see if it works. I cross my fingers and my toes and hold my breath as he slips it from the Ziploc baggie. Chapter 17 Dustin hands me my phone and I hold in the power button. Nothing happens. Disappointment crashes into me. 
I try again, holding it in for longer. The screen comes to life and the logo appears. It's working, I scream. Dustin grins. Great! I can't believe it! My emotions soar as relief floods over me. I didn't lose my father's photo. I can call Jera and get the details of the photo shoot. I'm saved. I'm so excited I grab Dustin and give him a kiss. It's a quick peck, and I don't even think about it before I do it. But as soon as my lips touch his, my body responds with an electric current. I let go, startled at what I've done. Dustin's blue eyes darken. He pulls me to him, his gaze probing. Don't do that unless you mean it, he says, his voice low and growly. My face flushes, but I don't pull away. I do mean it, and my heart pounds as I realize that. His fingers press into my back, holding me tight. His gaze travels over my face, dipping to my lips. If you don't want me to kiss you, tell me now. For a split second, I consider telling him not to. My rational mind knows I can't have a relationship with him. He lives in Hollywood and runs around with famous people. I live in Denver and I hardly ever leave my apartment. His world and my world are too different. But as he stares at me, my soul yearns for him in a way I can't explain, and I suddenly want this physical connection more than anything. I need him like I need to breathe. I set my phone on the counter and slowly thread my fingers into his silky hair. Go ahead, I say, my voice raspy. The second his lips brush mine, my whole body comes alive. His lips are warm and tender and his kiss is slow, like our dance last night. Tingles shoot all over my skin and I have to control myself so I don't gasp. My heart races. I know I shouldn't be kissing Dustin, but I don't care. I've never met anyone like him and my feelings have been building over the last few days. I can't help it. He's too irresistible. His lips trail to my jawline and a fire ignites under my skin. I can't take in enough air. The room spins, but I don't want it to stop. His lips come back to mine, and I melt like chocolate on a warm summer day. I wrap my arms around him and pull him even closer. I need him right now. He's quickly becoming a part of me, which frankly does scare me, but right now I don't want to think about it. I just want to enjoy the sensations that his lips are creating. My phone chimes, but I ignore it. I don't want to stop this kiss. I cling to Dustin craving his lips. He tastes like strawberries, and I wonder if he put on lip balm. My phone chimes again, and again, and about a million more times in close succession. Dustin pulls back and disappointment descends on me. Looks like someone wants to chat. I don't care, I say, but the mood is already ruined. Dustin chuckles but steps back from me. You'd better read your texts. I already know who they're from, and I know what they're going to say but I pick up my phone anyway. I need to make a phone call, I say, after reading a few of Jera's texts. She's freaking out and I need to have a conversation with her. If you need privacy, you can go in my den. Dustin motions with his hand. Yes, thank you. I follow him through his house until he leads me into a room with a desk and a window to his backyard. He closes the door, leaving me alone in the room. I punch Jera's contact to call her. She picks up on the first ring. Mackenzie, what the heck? What happened? You haven't answered any of my texts or calls. I drop my phone in the pool. What? Jera squeals. How? I start to tell her, but the words stick in my throat and I can't. It's a long story, I finally say. I don't want to admit I got stuck halfway out of her bathroom window or that her neighbour had to rescue me. Why did you go to the gala with Dustin Sawyer? I gasp. How did you know about that? Mackenzie, it's all over the celebrity gossip. Do you know what people say about two celebrities who show up together at a gala? They're making all kinds of assumptions. They say we're dating. No, I insist, panic rising in my chest. I needed help getting to the gala. He said I could go with him, but it was just as friends. Friends? You can't be friends with Dustin. Mackenzie, we're in the middle of a lawsuit. You can't talk to him. Plus, he's a big, fat jerk. I had to, Jera. I'm sorry. All my information was on my phone, and it was completely dead. Dustin said he was going to that gala for the sea turtles. I was stuck. 
I needed his help. Jera lets out an exasperated sigh. All right, but now that your phone is working again, you can't talk to him anymore, okay? I look around his den trying to decide if I'm going to confess that I was just making out with him. The seconds tick by, and it's starting to become awkward because I'm not answering her. Um, I say to Stoll, what is it? I'm kind of at his house right now. Oh no, he's not trying to charm you, is he? Is he pretending to be all nice and stuff? He is nice, I say, defending him. It's just an act. You don't understand. He's trying to get me to drop the lawsuit. Has he asked you things about the fence? My throat goes dry. He did, several times. I told him I can't talk about it. Good. You need to get away from him. Don't fall for his nice guy act. He's an actor. It's what he does best. You know what he called me the other day? A megalomaniac. Jera grunted. He also told me he was going to countersue me. He's threatened all kinds of things, Mackenzie. I frown. That didn't sound so nice, but I'd spent the last two days with him. I've gotten to know him. He's not a jerk. He apologized, I say, hoping to convince her. Of course he did. He wants something from me, and if you're being nice to him, he thinks he can get it. Think about it. Would it make sense that he's being so nice to someone who's suing him? I stare at my fingernails. Could she possibly be right? Was all this between Dustin and me just a ploy to get out of a lawsuit? He has mentioned the fence a few times now, and he's been extra nice. Was it all an act? I remember how he was when he first came over. He was talking so much about the fence and wanting to settle it outside of court. Then when I wouldn't talk, that's when he started being so nice and saying he'd help me with my phone. A hole opens up inside of me, enveloping me. Could Jera actually be right? It was a little unbelievable that Dustin Sawyer would suddenly be into me. Jera's the outgoing one who has all the friends. I'm the one who is awkward around men. Thinking about it now, away from his mesmerizing good looks, it does sound ridiculous. Promise me you'll stay away from him, Jera says, pleading. The hole spreads until I have one giant hole inside me. All right, I say, I'll stay away. That's good. My thoughts turn to her ex. Luke was at the gala last night. He was? Did he talk to you? He manhandled me and yelled at me in front of everyone. The memory makes me angry all over again. What? Oh no, Mackenzie. I'm so sorry. What a jerk. Yeah, I told him you guys are over. Good. Because we are. I stare at the rug on the floor. Has he ever... hurt you? What? No. I mean, he's a passionate person, but he's not abusive. She scoffs like I'm crazy. Are you sure? He was scary last night. If he saw you with Dustin, I can only imagine. He probably thinks I lied to him about the lawsuit and everything. She gasps. He probably thinks I've been cheating on him. You're not going back to him, are you? No, not again. I'm done with him. Good. I'm glad Jera's done with Luke. I'm so relieved he didn't come around last night. My shoulders slump as I think about all Jera told me about Dustin. He even stayed the night last night. I thought it was to protect me from Luke. I guess it was just to butter me up so I'd drop the lawsuit. Jera exhales. I have to go now, but call me later. I need to give you more instructions. The photo shoot is in three days, and you need to get ready. Get ready? Yes, absolutely no cheese or pasta. There's more, but I'm late for my spa treatment. I'll chat later. I say goodbye and hang up, feeling lost and suddenly so alone. Chapter 18 I exit the den and wind my way through Dustin's house, my body numb. I don't know what to think anymore. My brain hurts and my heart hurts, and I just want to shut down. Was everything a ploy to get out of the lawsuit? I make my way back to the kitchen. Dustin is on the floor playing with Squint. I stop short. Oh, why does he have to be so adorable playing with my dog on the floor? I take another step and my mouth drops when I see he's playing tug-of-war with a rubber dog bone. Did you buy a dog toy? Dustin grins at me. Yeah, I couldn't help it. This guy's just too cute. Where did you even get it? Amazon. Next day shipping. He tugs on the bone and Squint growls and pretends to be a big, scary dog, which is always hilarious coming from a chihuahua. 
Dustin yanks away the toy and holds it up as Squint jumps for it. Dustin laughs. Your dog is a hoot. I clench my jaw as I try not to let this adorable sight affect me. Dustin could very well be a liar. I need to remember that. He could be using me. The thought tastes like acid. Sorry, something's come up. I have to go, I say, my heart in my throat. He jumps up and dusts off his jeans. Oh? Sorry, I say again, clicking my tongue to get Squint to run to me. I pick him up and take a step toward the door. Wait. Dustin grabs his phone. Now that your phone is working, can I send you my number? He stares at me, his hair a bit mussed from him being on the floor playing with my dog, and something inside me softens. Everything I know about him goes against what Jera told me. How can I believe Jera? I hesitate. His blue eyes pierce through me. He looks so sincere. A part of me can't believe he's underhanded. He would have slipped up at some point over the last few days, right? I would have seen him make a mistake. I'm having a difficult time connecting the dots. How can I reconcile the man before me with the man Jera says he is? I waffle back and forth until he gives me a strange look. What's wrong? Nothing, I say. Dustin holds out his phone like he wants to transfer his number to my cell, but I back away. My phone is too old to do that. Oh, right. He swipes across his screen. What's your number? I'll just put it in. It would be too awkward if I said no. Then I'd have to explain myself. I'm so confused, so I just rattle off my number and scramble out of the door with my dog. I need time alone to think. I'm in Jera's living room, curled up on her amazingly comfortable couch, sipping an after-dinner herbal tea, squint beside me. I cup my hands around the mug, enjoying the warmth, even though my chest is still hollow. I reach into my pocket and pull out a small doggy treat. Squint quickly eats it. My phone alerts me I have a text. I lift it to see what Jera wants. Only, it's not from Jera. How are you doing? Is everything okay? You rushed out and I didn't have a chance to ask what you're doing for dinner. Did you eat already? I stare at Dustin's text, Jera's accusations running through my head. I tried to sort things out tonight, away from Dustin, but I still don't know what to think. I stir my tea as I ponder how I want to answer him. Get out of my life sounds way too harsh. Not answering won't work either. Finally, I set down my tea and type an answer. I already ate. There. That's the truth. And it gets me out of seeing him because I'm sure he's about to invite me over to eat some amazing meal. My mouth waters. I can only imagine what he's cooked up. Jera made me eat kale and legumes for dinner. Barf. Dustin sends me a sad face. That sad face burrows deep in my soul. I set my phone back down and stare at my painting on the wall as I sip more of my tea. Chamomile. I like the slightly bitter taste. I need to get my mind off Dustin, or I'll go crazy. My phone gives me another alert. I should turn off my ringer and go do something else, but I can't help it. I pick it up again and read the text. Do you want to watch another movie with me? My heart leaps at the suggestion. Yes, I want to. I want to go over there right now and see his laugh lines and hear his chuckle when he thinks I've said something funny. I want to feel his arms around me and his lips on mine. But he could be a lying scumbag, and I promised Jera I wouldn't. Sorry, I'm not feeling well. I think I'd better stay in tonight. He responds right away. Is there anything I can do? I bite my lower lip as guilt creeps into my chest. But is he being nice because he's a good guy, or because he wants something? No, I think it's just a little bug, I type back. Hopefully I'll feel better soon. I hope so, too. Are you sick to your stomach? Or does chicken noodle soup sound good? Chicken noodle soup sounds amazing, but Jera doesn't want me eating noodles. I stare at the phone. Jera's sure bossy, and she's not here. How will she even know if I eat noodles? My stomach lets out a growl. I guess the kale and legume salad I got from DoorDash didn't do much to fill me up. Stupid diet. I make a rash decision. Actually, chicken noodle soup sounds good. He texts right back. I'll make you some and bring it over. My heart warms at his words. Even if he is a lying sack of trash, I'll take his chicken noodle soup and enjoy every drop. Chapter 19 
An hour later, the gate chimes, and I press the button to let Dustin in. When he approaches the door, I open it. Here's the soup. He hands me a warm plastic container with a lid. There must be at least three servings of soup in it. There's croissant rolls in the car. Just a sec. My heart melts. When he comes back with the rolls, I wave him inside, all my resolve crumbling. Come in. Are you sure? I don't want to intrude. I know you're not feeling well. My heart warms at the concern in his eyes. I think the company will do me good. Then let me dish up your soup. He hands me the plate of rolls, still warm, and takes the container of soup into the kitchen. I devour a roll. It's light, buttery, and flaky, and tastes like it came from a little shop in Paris. I sit on the couch and pull the afghan over me. Squint jumps on my lap and yawns. Do you want to eat it in here? Dustin asks as he enters the living room. Yes, thank you. I take the bowl from him. It's steamy and smells like heaven. What about you? I already ate. I expected to just drop the soup off. I didn't think you'd be up for company. Please, sit. I feel bad for lying and saying I was sick. I dip the spoon in and take a sip. My nose was right. It's amazing. Squint sniffs the bowl. Did you make this from scratch? Sort of. I cheated on the chicken. I raise one eyebrow as I take another sip. Exactly how does one cheat on a chicken? He chuckles, and I enjoy how the sound reverberates in his chest. I bought a rotisserie chicken. It would have taken a lot longer for me to cook the chicken, and with a rotisserie you get all the flavour from the juice. I'm seriously touched that he made me chicken noodle soup from scratch. You went out and bought one, just for me. Dustin gives me a sheepish grin. Well, my personal assistant went out and bought one just for you. Close enough. I scoop up some noodles. They practically melt in my mouth. Are these homemade noodles? He shrugs. They're not that hard to make. He went through a lot of trouble for me. I try to remind myself that it could be because of the lawsuit, but I'm having a hard time believing it anymore. If there was a way to test him, maybe I could figure out if he's acting or not. Maybe if I probe him further, get him to open up to me, maybe I can tell if he's lying. As I eat his amazing soup and croissant rolls, I try to think of things to ask him. I nudge his knee. So you said you were auditioning for a role, something about a CPR mannequin? Dustin nods. Yeah, there's this show I'm auditioning for tomorrow. It's a new show called Hit the Beach. I'm auditioning for the part of a lifeguard, so I figured I should know how to give CPR. That made sense. Do you have anything else coming up? Just some commercials I'm shooting next month. I've been taking some time off after my last movie. I nod and bite into another croissant. After I swallow, I ask, what do you usually do during your time off? I actually love the alone time. I'm an introvert, so being around a lot of people saps my energy. I stare at him. Really? Yeah, why? I shake my head. I'm the exact same way. How would he have known that? This couldn't be a fabricated answer. Jera's not an introvert. If he did research ahead of time to try to get Jera to like him, he wouldn't have said that. He would have said he's an extrovert and loves glitz and glamour. He smiles. I've found we have a lot in common. What are your life goals? I hope he doesn't think the question is odd. I really want to know. He takes a moment to assess the question before answering. If you would have asked me ten years ago, I would have rattled off a list of goals about my career, but I no longer think that way. Oh? I scoop out some chicken. Why not? Dustin shifts in the seat and looks at me with his mesmerizing blue eyes, because younger me was obsessed with building my career. But I've done that. I'm a household name. I've gotten the lead roles. Won awards. Now I'm starting to think that having a lucrative career isn't all there is to life. I curl a strand of my hair behind my ear. So, what are your goals now? My goals have shifted toward being complete, doing what really makes me happy, having a family. I've never had one, not really. My parents did the best they could, but they were busy with their careers. He looks down at the coffee table. They still are. I suddenly understand him on a deeper level. I get it, I say quietly. I know what it's like to be alone. 
He puts a hand on my leg, and I can feel the warmth of him even through the afghan. I wouldn't have believed you a month ago. You looked like you were the life of the party, but now that I've gotten to know you better, I can see that. I don't really have any friends, not anyone I'm close to, I admit. How close are you with your sister? I finish the last of my soup and set the bowl down on the table. I shift, curling up against Dustin. He puts his arm around me, and I give him some of my blanket. Squint shifts and curls up again by my feet. We used to be really close, I say. We don't talk as much anymore. We live very different lives. Tell me about her. What's her name? I hesitate because this could get into awkward territory really quickly. But something makes me want to press forward. Mackenzie. She's my younger sister. We used to do everything together. Then, we grew up, I guess. And grew apart. He presses his cheek against the top of my head. That has to be difficult. I think about all the times when Jera and I would play checkers together, or when we'd hike in the hills near our home. We didn't have a lot of money for things like video games, so we made up our own things to do. I do miss those times. I should reach out more, I say, mostly to myself. I bet she would like that. I close my eyes, full and content. Thank you for the soup. It was delicious. You're welcome. How are you feeling? I know he's asking about my fake illness, but I can't help but think of how unsure I was after hearing Jera insist that Dustin was acting nice to get something from me. But now, as I snuggle into Dustin, I'm pretty sure Jera is mistaken. Dustin can't be fooling me. He's too genuine. Much better, I say as I wrap my arms around him. He kisses the top of my head. Good. Chapter 20 My phone makes a noise, and in the haze of sleep I move my hand to answer it. But instead of reaching my phone, my hand meets solid chest muscle. What the... I open one eye and realise Dustin and I fell asleep on the couch, and now we're intertwined like a pretzel. My heart beats loudly in my ears as I assess the situation and how much trouble I'm in. We fell asleep on the couch and now it's morning. Jera will kill me. But really, nothing happened. Jera doesn't need to know, right? I attempt to move without touching him, but I'm pretty much lying on top of him, so it's impossible. Gah. Embarrassment heats my face as I slowly ease myself off him, trying not to disturb him. Unfortunately, that doesn't work and he opens his eyes. What are you doing? I'm trying to get off you without waking you up. He leans his head back on the throw pillow and closes his eyes. How's that going? Not too well. I manage to climb off Dustin as my phone chimes again. I toss the afghan on him and grab my phone. He snuggles into the couch, covering himself with the blanket. Tell whoever it is it's too early to text, then come back to me. My heart melts. Dustin wants to snuggle with me. This makes me extremely happy. I walk into the library and shut the door so my texting doesn't bother Dustin. I click to see what Jera sent. Mackenzie, I'm so sorry, but something important has come up, and I need to ask you for another major favour. Her second text is more frantic. Are you awake? Text me as soon as possible. I text back. I'm awake now. What is it? I wait for her to explain, my mind going about a million different places. Not another party. Please, anything but that, she calls. I swipe to answer and try to keep my voice casual and low in case Dustin can hear me. Hey, what's up? Mackenzie, how are you? Oh no, this is bad. I can tell by her voice. I walk to the bookshelf. I'm fine. What do you need? I'm so sorry, but I need you to do one more thing for me. It's not a big deal. Really, just a formality. My stomach clenches. What is it? All you have to do is go to a studio. I'll text you the address. I stare at the shelf of books in front of me. They look expensive. That's all? Yep. That's it. Simple, right? Her voice is too perky. I don't trust her. I run my finger along her shelf. What do I have to do there? You just walk in and read a couple of lines. Read a couple of lines? Jera, that sounds like an audition, I whisper shout. No way am I doing an audition for her. I can't act. I've never even been in a school play. 
I'm a shoe in for this part. In fact, I practically have it in the bag. They just want to see me do a reading. My legs wobble like rubber. I can't do an audition for you. You're crazy. Jera sniffs. Please? I can't go like this. The bruising has gotten worse, not better. If I go, they're never going to cast me. I look like I've been involved in a mugging. Can't you put makeup on? Not over this. It's too dark. Mackenzie, I swear they won't make you do much. It's just one quick scene. You can practice before you go. You don't have to be there until two in the afternoon. I gasp. Today? She can't be serious. Yes, but you have all morning to get ready. Do I have to memorize the lines? I clench my fists. This can't be happening to me. Yes, but it's not much. What is it for? I take in a calming breath. Why do I want to know? It's a show called Hit the Beach. My mouth drops. That's the one Dustin is auditioning for. The thought of Dustin brings me instant calm. If he's going, I could just go with him. Maybe it wouldn't be that bad. How many lines exactly? Not many. I'll send them over as soon as we're done on the phone. Mackenzie, you're a lifesaver, truly. I'm not a lifesaver. I'm a sucker, and I can't believe I'm going to say yes. All right, I'll do it. But you owe me big time. Yes, I'll do whatever you want. That bigger apartment is yours. Tempting. Maybe after all this work she's putting me through, I won't feel bad taking it. We'll see. You're my favorite sister. I'm your only sister. You're smart, too. I stick out my tongue at her, even though she can't see me. I think you owe me a sister's only vacation. Just the two of us. We can go somewhere remote. Jera is silent for a moment. You'd go with me on a trip? Sure, as long as there are no big crowds there. You know I don't like crowds. You don't like travel, either. I look down at the rug. I do it to spend time with you. Jera exhales. Wow, Mackenzie, I had no idea. She sounds so surprised I'm taken aback. Of course, I love you, and I miss spending time with you. You do? I'm shocked she has to ask. Have I been that distant with her? Maybe the reason we're not close anymore is as much my fault as it is hers. Absolutely. Remember all of those checker tournaments we'd have? She laughs. And how you cheated terribly so you'd always win. I scoff. I did not. I was just better at checkers. She took in a deep breath. I miss those times. Me too. I stare at the row of encyclopedias Jera has on the shelf. Why do you have encyclopedias? She snorts. Why are you snooping around in my library? I stop myself before I say because Dustin's in the other room sleeping and I don't want to disturb him. I'm going to guess Jera wouldn't be happy about that. All right, I won't snoop. Maybe I'll spend some time checking flights. I can hear the smile in her voice. We should do that trip after I'm healed. I nod. I'd like that. I finish up with Jera and sneak out to the couch, but Dustin's no longer asleep. He's sitting up checking his phone. He looks at me when I enter. What's up? I twist my hands together. You'll never guess what I'm doing this afternoon. Chapter 21 Dustin leans forward. His hair is sticking up and it makes him look adorable. What? Nerves assault me for what I'm about to say, but I press forward. I guess I'm auditioning for that Hit the Beach show. He grins at me and runs a hand over his hair. It doesn't do any good. It still sticks up. That's great. I'd love to work with you on that show. An image of Jera on a beach every day with Dustin pops into my head and jealousy rises in my chest. I hadn't considered this before, and it bothers me. What exactly will the show entail? Will there be a romance between them? Will they kiss? Dustin's smile fades as he stares at me. What's wrong? I swallow, pushing the image of Dustin kissing my sister out of my head. I can't do anything about that. It's out of my control. Nothing. The Afghan falls to the floor as he stands and crosses the room. He slips his arms around me and gazes into my eyes. I feel a pull to him I cannot deny. My pulse reacts to his touch. I know something is bothering you. I can see it. Don't shut me out, Jera. He gently curls a strand of my hair behind my ear. 
I look at the floor. I want to tell him what I'm thinking, but I can't. Not unless I tell him everything. I freeze. What if I do tell him everything? If Dustin keeps it to himself, then what harm would it be? Jera would go ballistic if she ever found out. But if Dustin would be on board with going along with the farce, Jera wouldn't ever know. I lift my gaze to look at Dustin. Would he be mad if I told him? I bite my lip. I want to tell him, but I don't know how he'll react, and I don't want to destroy what we have, whatever that is. I can't decide on what to say, but he's staring at me, and I need to tell him something. I guess I'm a bit nervous. It's been a while since I auditioned for anything. He takes my hands. Don't be nervous. I've seen your work. You're good. Let's run lines. It'll help you loosen up. His touch only makes me feel guilty as I realize how scummy I am for not being honest with him. It hadn't occurred to me before that I could tell him who I am without ruining Jera's plan. And now that we've gotten to know each other, I'm not exactly sure how to tell him. I swallow and lower my gaze. Thank you. Later that morning, Dustin and I are in his kitchen as he prepares lunch. It's a truffle risotto and it smells amazing. Squint is curled up on a dog bed that mysteriously appeared in the corner of the room. I'm sure it's more Amazon two-day shipping. I pace the floor, reading my lines to myself. I'm self-conscious about saying them out loud, so I study them and try to memorize them. Are you ready? Dustin asks as he turns from the pan. He's got his phone on the counter with my scene pulled up. Not yet. I stare at my lines some more. It's okay. Just read through them. No pressure. I'll read Beckett's part. I swallow down my nerves. This isn't a big deal. Jera assured me this was just a formality. I can do this. I clear my throat. I'm leaving Coast Haven tomorrow. You can't stop me. I try to put some resolve behind my words. Daphne, Dustin says, his voice full of emotion. I marvel at how he did that. There's a wealth of backstory packed in that one name. I can hear how much he loves her, and how it's ripping him apart to have her leave. It's so powerful I tear up. I try to get into my part more, thinking about what Daphne might be feeling. Don't, Beckett, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to New York. Dustin looks up from his risotto. His gaze connects with mine. His eyes hold hurt. Are you sure you're not running away? From me? From us? I have no idea how Dustin puts so much heart and soul in his words, but I'm tearing up again. I turn from him because that's what the script says to do. I need time away. All right, Dustin says. All the energy gone from his voice. He sounds defeated. If you need to go... He lets his voice trail off. My heart breaks for him and for Daphne, who once loved him. I'm sorry, I whisper. Dustin leaves his pan and comes up behind me. He slowly puts his arms around me, enveloping me with warmth. I'm sorry, too. I turn to him and put my hands on his face. He looks like he's going to cry. His expression moves me, and I feel his pain. I need to figure out who I am. Do you? He says, probing and tentative. I close my eyes. Yes, I say as I step away. I ache to be back in his arms. I'll miss you, he says, and his words shake my soul. I've forgotten my next line, so I sneak a peek at my phone. It's my monologue. I try to get into the headspace of my character. I would be lying if I say I won't miss you, Beckett. I look at his expression, and my heart breaks. But I can't do this anymore. Not right now. Sarah's death broke me. It broke us. We're not the same, and it kills me. I have to do some thinking. I need to find who I am without her. Dustin lowers his head. I won't stop you. But don't forget... Sarah was my daughter, too. Pain slices through in his words and a tear falls down my cheek. I know. I glance at my phone. That's the end of the scene. Dustin pulls me to him again and breaks character. I knew you could do it, he says, kissing my forehead. You have nothing to be nervous about. That was perfect. I take in a deep breath, getting myself under control. Will I be reading with you? He shakes his head and turns back to his risotto. Probably not. I'm guessing they'll have us read separately. Disappointment crashes into me. 
Dustin was the only reason I was able to do that scene well. Is there any way they'd let us read together? I can ask. Maybe they would. I'm reading for Beckett anyway, so doing the scene together makes sense. Dustin removes the pan from the heat. I give myself a pep talk. If they let Dustin read with me, I'll be fine. I won't mess this up for Jera. Chapter 22 I grip the seat as Dustin pulls into the studio lot. I left Squint at Dustin's house, and I'm regretting that decision. My hands don't know what to do with themselves. Dustin must have noticed, because he reaches over and pries my fingers off his leather seat and slips his hand into mine. You'll do a great job, he says. I clutch his hand so tight I'm afraid he's going to complain, but he doesn't. He just smiles at me and parks his car. I try to convince myself this is going to be okay. As we walk into the building, I take in a deep breath. Dustin will keep me calm. I follow Dustin through a couple of hallways until we get ushered into a waiting room with several people. Chairs line the room and Dustin motions for me to sit. We take some seats and wait. A large clock on the wall ticks the seconds. A woman with a clipboard enters. She has short black hair and looks to be in her early twenties. The woman scans the room and turns to me. Jera, thank you for coming in today. You can come with me. We stand. I glance at Dustin. He steps toward her. Can I read with Jera? The woman shakes her head. I'm sorry, no. Your audition will start in a moment. It's set up in a different room. I can't just come in with her. The woman frowns. No, the Beckett audition is down the hallway. She opens a door and waves me inside. My heart thumps loud in my ears as I walk away from Dustin. He mouths, You've got this, as they shut the door. A camera is set up on one side of the room. Over here, the woman says, forcing me in front of the camera. A man stands off to the side, a script in his hand. I stand where indicated, and the woman motions to the cameraman. A small red light comes on. OK, we're ready when you are. I swallow and stare at the little red light on the camera. I can't remember my lines. I don't know what to say. As the seconds tick by, the man with the script stares at me like he's waiting for me. I rack my brain to think. Something about leaving. The lines jump into my memory and I blurt them out. I'm leaving Coast Haven. You can't stop me. Daphne, the man reads, his voice flat. I panic as I try to pull any kind of emotion out of that. There is none. He's not Dustin, and I'm not a real actor. I hold my breath and try to remember my lines again. Don't beck it, I say, but my voice is monotone. I know I'm messing this up, but I can't figure out how to do it right. The only thing I can do is say the lines. Luckily, I know the rest, and I can repeat them in front of the camera. It feels like I'm rushing them, but I try my best not to. After I say all my lines, I wait to see what will happen. The woman checks her clipboard and then glances at the cameraman before ushering me back into the waiting area. Thanks for coming in. Someone will call you, she says, before taking another person back into the room. I walk out into the hallway, my body numb. I don't know where Dustin went, and I'm scared I just totally bombed this for Jera. A few people come and go before I finally see Dustin come out. Jera, he says as he comes to me, how did it go? I shake my head. Not very good. The reality of it crashes into me, and I blink back tears. What do you mean? What happened? Concern laces his words. I couldn't pull in that emotion. I messed it all up. Dustin puts his arm around me. It's okay. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as you think. He's wrong, but I don't argue with him. I nod and lean into him. Come on, let's go do something to get your mind off it. All right. He leads me down the hallway, through the maze we came in, and out to where he parked his car. We get into his car, and he turns to me. Want to go for a scenic drive with me? Sure. I don't care where we go. As long as I don't have to worry about people, I'll go anywhere with him. I have the perfect place. He pulls a pair of sunglasses out of his glove box and slides them on. My nerves settle down as we drive, the warm sun on my skin. The city landscape fades away as we get further out replaced by the coastline. The water is beautiful and my artistic heart sings.
This would be beautiful to paint, I say, trying to memorize the colors in the water and on the rocky shore. Take a photo. You can paint from a photo, right? Yes, but my phone can't take any more pictures. The memory card is full. Dustin looks at me for a moment. You told me you can't get another phone. Why can't you? I look out at the landscape, the white foam cresting the waves, as I ponder what to say. I can't get a new phone because I'm broke. But if I tell Dustin that, I'll have to explain I'm not Jera. Is now a good time to tell him? I gather up my courage and stare down at my lap. I can't because I don't have the money. Dustin is silent for a stretch of time, and I wonder if he's going to be upset at me for pretending to be Jera. But when I look at him, he has sympathy in his gaze. I know a lot of people in Hollywood who are like that. It happens more than you'd think. Don't be embarrassed. So, you overspent thinking you'd get a role that you didn't, or counting on residuals that dried up. It's common, Jera. Don't worry. No, I... Actually, Dustin says, interrupting me, that explains a lot. I understand now why you wouldn't take my offer on the fence. You needed more money. I'll talk to my attorney tomorrow and... No, I insist, grabbing his arm. I don't want him to think my not budging on the fence has anything to do with money. That's not it. Then what? How can I tell him? I search for a way to say it that he'll understand. My heart climbs into my throat as I seek for the right words. My palms grow sweaty. I'm going to make it clear now. I'm going to confess. Jera has a lot of money. I myself don't. Chapter 23 I sit motionless, waiting for Dustin to gape at me, or yell because I've been posing as Jera this whole time. But instead, he nods. I get it. I have a lot of money tied into my name as well. Money I can't access. It's okay. I can help you with finances if you'd like. Frustration swells in me. He's not getting it. Do I need to spell it out for him? But he keeps speaking, so I can't. I seem to attract women with money issues, but the funny thing is, I don't care about the money. I hesitate, unsure what to say to that. You don't? No, it's the lies. For some reason, I've dated a lot of women who lie and try to use me. I told you about the last one. She lied so much, I don't even think I really knew who she was. I stare out at the ocean as his car hugs the shore, my heart hammering in my chest. That's awful, I say feeling horrible. Trust is everything in a relationship, don't you think? He glances at me as he drives. Shame and guilt descend on me, and I shift in my seat, but I can't find a comfortable position. I agree, I say, because he's waiting for me to say something. I'm scum, and I know I can't finish what I started. I can't tell him I'm not Jera. The conversation between us turns stiff, and I stare off into the distance. I don't know what I need to do. A moment ago, I was ready to tell him the truth. Now, I can't even speak. If I tell him, will he be furious with me? The thought occurs to me that we can't really be together anyway. My life is in Denver. He lives the Hollywood life. Glamour, glitz, and all that. I couldn't live that life. I'm only here for a few more days. This depresses me more than it should. Dustin starts the car up the side of a mountain, and the views are breathtaking. He tosses his cell at me. You can take some pictures with my phone if you want. I'm a horrible person for lying to him, but I do want the photos, so I hold up his phone and take some. As we near the top of the mountain, Dustin pulls into a lookout spot. Do you want to get out? Of course. I jump out of the car and walk to the railing where the views are spectacular. I take a zillion photos as Dustin stands beside me. The light breeze carries a chill from the water and I shiver. Dustin steps behind me and puts his arms around me. You cold? Hmm, I say, liking the contact. I know I can't have a real relationship with him, but for now, I'll take what I have. I snuggle into him and try to forget all the guilt from what I'm doing. We stand on the edge of beauty for what feels like forever, but I'm sure is only a few moments. I rest my hands on his arms tight around my middle. He leans down until his cheek nestles against my own. Are you doing okay? He asks softly. I'm better, I say, 
a warm connection between us. Dustin makes everything better. I know I mentioned this before, but I do think you'd benefit from seeing someone about your anxiety. There's no shame in it, Jera. The way his voice carries concern for me touches me in a way I find hard to describe. I turn to look at him. He pulls me close, and I feel my heart beat against my ribcage. I reach up and slip his sunglasses off. His bright blue eyes see into my soul. The urge to open up to him surges in me. I know it sounds stupid, but I'm kind of afraid to go see someone about it. I've never told anyone this, and I'm suddenly all weird and exposed. He nods at me. I felt the same way. Do you know how embarrassing it was for me to admit that I struggled with depression? Especially when the world watches my every move and deems me successful in everything. I had money, a lucrative career, everything I could want, and still I suffered from depression. I hadn't thought about it before, but Dustin is right. There's a stigma against rich and accomplished people with mental illness. There shouldn't be, but there is. He lowers his gaze. I was in bad shape when I finally went for help. I should have gone in much sooner. I'm sorry you had to go through that. He presses his lips to my forehead, then leans down to look at me. His gaze holds sadness. I just don't want you to go through the same pain I did. My throat swells shut. I know he's coming from a place of concern, and it touches me. My anxiety has affected me more than I want to admit. I've been dealing with it as best as I can, but Dustin is right. I'm making major life choices based on my anxiety, and that isn't good. If going to see someone would help, I should do it. All right, I say, my voice cracking. I didn't realize I would get so emotional admitting I need help. I'll go talk to someone. Dustin pulls me to his chest in a hug. You'll benefit from it. I know you will. I reach up and brush a lock of his hair off his forehead. I'm so touched that this man would care enough about me to bring up a difficult subject like this. I struggle with my emotions. Thank you for caring, I say, my heart pounding. His gaze softens. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've started caring quite a bit about you. He brushes his knuckles across my cheek. I don't quite know what to say to him, but I love his touch, so I lean into it. You are amazing, he says, his voice so low I can barely hear him. I'm so touched by him. I want this moment to last. I press my lips to his. He responds, capturing my lips and pulling me closer. His kiss feels like sunshine on a cool morning, and I bask in its warmth. The world around us melts away, and I'm left with Dustin, the two of us alone. I deepen the kiss, enveloped in a sense of comfort and security. I trust this man. I don't know what is going to happen in the future. All I know is I need Dustin right now, and I'm going to do everything I can to hold on to him. Chapter 24 the next day, I wake up to a text from Dustin. Do you have anything pressing to do today? I sit up in bed, and Squint lifts his head to look at me. I should film another watercolour video, but if I do it tomorrow, I can probably get away with procrastinating today. The photo shoot is the day after tomorrow, and then Jera will come home. I can't believe this week has gone by so quickly. I don't have anything. What's up? He texts me right back. You up for a day trip? Sure. Where do you want to go? I thought we could take a helicopter to Catalina Island. I know a beach that's pretty secluded. We could go snorkeling or swim or just spend time together. Sound good? I look at Squint, who yawns at me. Can I bring my dog? Yes. I already checked. Warmth spreads through me. He is so thoughtful. I text back. I'd love to go. Great, pack a bag. I'll pick you up in an hour. I rush to get ready. As I'm picking out my outfit, my phone rings. The screen says it's Jera. Nerves shoot through me, and I hope she doesn't want me to do another audition. I swipe my finger across the screen. Hello? Hey, Jera says, her voice chipper. I wanted to let you know I didn't get the part. But don't worry, it's okay. I heard Dustin Sawyer got the lead, and I'd rather not work with him. Relief cascades over me. I'd rather Jera not work with Dustin either. Oh, I really appreciate you going over there and reading those lines for me. 
I feel a little bad for messing things up. Sorry you didn't get the part. Really, it's okay. I have scripts come to me all the time. I'm sure something else will come along. Something better, even. I riffle through Jera's closet looking for what to wear. I hope so. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know. And to thank you again for dropping everything for me. You're the best. Seriously. I've already started looking at vacation packages for us. How does Cancun sound? I've never been to Mexico. It sounds beautiful. I'll need a passport. No problem. I'll pay for it to be expedited. I warm at the thought of spending time with Jera. That sounds good. I get off the phone with Jera and finish showering. I find a blue one-piece swimsuit that I like and put it on under a pair of jean shorts and a white cover-up. I pack for the beach and get my travel carrier for Squint. I use the kind that makes him look like he's sitting in my purse so he can see out and I can pet him. At the last second, I toss a sketchbook and my travel paints in my bag. I'm ready and waiting when Dustin pulls up. After I get in the car, I look at him. What made you think of a trip today? I got the part. He glances at me as he pulls out into traffic. I'll be busy soon with publicity shoots and everything the show entails. I just thought a day away sounded good before all of that starts. I pet Squint, who's staring at the moving scenery. Congratulations. Really, I'm happy for you. Dustin clasps my hand. I heard they cast someone else for your part. I'm sorry. I'm honestly surprised. The way you read it with me was great. Yeah, I bombed the audition. But that's okay. Something else will come along, I say, repeating what Jera told me. I'm just relieved that Jera's not mad at me for sucking at acting. You're right. You're talented. I'm sure you'll find more work. Thirty minutes later, a man buckles me into the back of a helicopter. He gives me squint, letting me hold him on my lap. Dustin is in the seat beside me. Have you ever ridden in a helicopter before? I shake my head. No. He reaches past me and pulls a pair of headphones with a microphone off a hook and hands them to me. Put these on. It will be too loud to hear so you can talk through these. Okay. I do as he says, and he puts on a pair as well. The pilot climbs into the helicopter and closes the door. The co-pilot turns around to make sure we still have our seatbelts on and are ready. The pilot starts the engine, and I understand why we have the headphones. I've seen helicopters on television lift straight in the air, but sitting inside, when one takes off, is a very different experience. It feels like you shouldn't be able to move in that kind of direction. My stomach drops to my toes as we fly up in the air. The view is amazing. Soon, we're coasting over the water. Dustin hands me his phone. Do you want to take pictures? Yes, thank you. Squint behaves really well as we fly to Catalina Island. I get several fantastic shots using Dustin's phone. The sky is such a deep blue with just the right amount of clouds. It's going to be perfect to paint. I hand his phone back to him as we land on a concrete square. A driver is waiting for us as we disembark the helicopter. He takes our bags for us and puts them in the trunk. I carry Squint in his little carrier and slide into the back seat. Dustin climbs in beside me. Did you set all this up this morning? I ask. Yes. My heart swells. I don't know how Jera has been so lucky to have such a sweet neighbor, but he really is incredible. I lean over and give him a quick kiss on his cheek. He raises his eyebrows. What's that for? For being you. He smiles and leans toward me. Then I'll have to be me more often. He brushes his lips across mine. I love how each kiss he gives me seems like the first. Tingles cascade over me as he explores my lips. Unfortunately, we arrive at our beach all too quickly. Dustin helps me out of the car, and we collect our bags from the driver. Dustin had said we were just going to a beach, but this is a resort with a full restaurant and bar, music playing, and beautiful cabanas with lounge chairs. Squint is happy to get out of his carrier, and he runs on the sand. Dustin was right about secluded. I glance around and only see a few people. This is lovely, I say, as we find an open cabana and put our things down. The view is heavenly with palm trees swaying gently in the breeze, 
the water a bright aquamarine colour. I rummage through my bag until I find my sketchbook. Do you mind if I take a second to get this down? He looks over at my small watercolour set. Not at all. I'd love to see you work. I settle in a lounge chair and pull out my pencil. I sketch the beach and pencil in the trees, drawing Squint out by the water, even though he's settled down by my feet. Then I quickly get some colouring down, so I remember the vibrant colours of the sea. Dustin leans over and looks at my sketch. That's amazing. How can you finish a painting that fast? I laugh. It's not a painting. I'm just sketching the scene so I can paint it later. He lets out a whistle. You're so talented. Have you ever thought about painting for a living? That's what I do. The words came out before I could censor them. Panic grips me as I realise what I've said. Chapter 25 What you do? Dustin asks, quirking one eyebrow. I mean, I say, rushing to fix my error. I make a little money from the classes I do online. I'd love to do more, but my real job is acting, so that takes up most of my time. Of course, acting is what brings in the most, but it is fun to make a little bit of my living from my art. I'm rambling, so I close my mouth and try not to turn red from embarrassment. Squint must sense my discomfort because he jumps up on my lap. Dustin shifts in his chair. Have you ever sold a painting? I nod. A few. Not a lie. I've had a few online sales, mostly to people who have taken my classes. The rest of my paintings I either give away as presents, or I stuff them away in my closet at home. Have you ever showed them in an art gallery? Dustin reaches over and pets Squint on the head. Oh no. The thought terrifies me. Probably because I'd be expected to go to some opening night thing and mingle with people. I can't imagine doing that. He seems surprised by my reaction. Why not? I think about lying to him, but I've done so much of that lately I don't want to lie again. I look down at Squint on my lap. I don't like the idea of having to schmooze people at some opening night event. You wouldn't have to do that. I bet I can get you into a gallery with no obligation to schmooze. He places a hand on my leg. I stare at him, trying not to get my hopes up, but not succeeding. To see my work in a gallery would be a dream come true. Really? Absolutely. Jera, your work is amazing. I don't think you realize how talented you are. I could get you into any gallery you want. Everyone would want to see a Jera Davenport painting. My elation crashes and burns on the sand. Sure. Everyone would want to buy a painting if they thought the famous movie star Gerard Davenport painted it. But me? No one would care. I try not to show how disappointed I am. Cool, I say. That would be awesome. Do you have more paintings at home? I open my mouth to say yes, but luckily I stop myself before it comes out. My paintings are all at my apartment in Denver. He's talking about Gerard's home. No, only the ones I showed you. That's too bad. If you had more, I'm sure I could get you your own show. I pretend to be disappointed. Oh, Don, so sorry it didn't work out. It's okay. When you have a few more done, we can try. I'd love to see your talent on display. It's touching that he has so much faith in me, even if it's misplaced. I'm sure he's right. Jera could get a space in a gallery. Me? Not so much. But he's still being super sweet. I nod in agreement as I slip my sketch paper into my bag. We sit for a moment before Dustin speaks. Do you want to walk along the beach? Sure. I slide my feet out of my flip-flops and carry Squint out onto the sand, which is powdery soft. Dustin and I walk along the water's edge. Squint wiggles, and I set him down so he can run and play in the sand. The water is cool, but not cold, and it feels good on my feet. We walk in silence for a while before I look up at Dustin. I suddenly want to know him better. I want to be closer to him. What are you thinking about? He smiles playfully at me. I can't tell you. I elbow him. Why not? I got you a little something. It's a small surprise. You did? He nods. Yes. A tiny thrill goes through me. The famous movie star Dustin Sawyer bought me a present. I can't even fathom what it could be, but it makes me a little giddy inside to think about. 
I poke him in the side. What is it? He laughs. If I told you, it wouldn't be a surprise anymore. I can't stop smiling. This guy sure knows how to make me happy. Jera's words come back to me, that he's doing all of this just to get the lawsuit dropped. A tiny thread of doubt worms its way through me. He could be playing me. This whole thing could be an act to get what he wants with the fence. I shove the thought away. I don't want to think about that. Dustin and I don't have a future once Jera gets back, so it doesn't matter anyway. When will you give me my present? When we get back home. He looks far too delighted about teasing me with this. I try to think of what it could be. Art supplies? No. He slips his hand into mine. The gesture warms me to my toes. How can touching skin feel so good and so right? I marvel at the way it makes my heartbeat speed up, like I'm a teenage cheerleader and he's the handsome quarterback. You bought another dog toy. His laughter fills the air. Yes, but that's not what the surprise is. I giggle. You're going to spoil him more than I do. Impossible. You spoil that little dog so much. All I've done is buy him a dog bed. A large wave comes and hits our legs. And a little doggy bone so you can play with him, I remind him. You made him a hand-painted carrier. That was more for me than him. It was too plain. I wanted to dress it up. He raises one eyebrow. You carry dog treats in your pockets. My mouth drops. How did you know that? His grin turns devilish. I just know. In fact, I would wager that you have some in your pockets right now. I do, but I don't want to admit it to him. So what? So if you do, you're the one spoiling Squint the most. That's ridiculous. He slows his steps. Let's just see how many treats you have in your pockets. He tries to reach for me, but I step away. I don't think we need to see. He comes toward me, but I sprint away. This leads to a chase on the beach, which Squint thinks is incredibly fun. He runs at my heels and barks. I can't remember the last time I laughed this hard. Dustin catches up to me and wraps his arms around me from behind, pulling me off my feet. Gotcha, he says in my ear as I wiggle to get loose, although I admit I'm not trying very hard. Dustin sets me on my feet and pats my jeans pockets. Ah ha, I was right. Dog treats. All right, all right. I turn to face him. You got me. What's my punishment? He pretends to think about it as his hands slide around my hips and pull me close. I think it needs to be something memorable. My heart pounds as I try to catch my breath, but being this close to Dustin is making it difficult. I can't think of anything memorable. He raises his eyebrows, and I can't help but laugh at the look on his face. Nothing, huh? He says, his voice low. He's so close his breath whispers across my lips. Nope, nothing comes to mind. A playful glint comes into his eyes. Sounds like a challenge to me. I can't stand his teasing anymore, and I raise onto my toes and press my lips to his. He takes control of the kiss, igniting a fire in my veins. If his other kisses were slow dances, this is a tango. It's fiery hot and electricity burns through me. I know I can't keep kissing Dustin. This won't last. But for now, I don't have the willpower to stop. I want to live in a fairy tale, even if it will all evaporate when I have to leave and go back home. Chapter 26 The morning turns warm. Do you want to swim? I ask. Sure. We return to our cabana to get ready. Dustin pulls his shirt off and turns to me. Will you put sunscreen on my back? I try to say okay, but I can't speak. I've never seen Dustin without his shirt, and his muscles are distracting me. How can one man be so handsome and also have a body like that? His muscles have muscles. I clear my throat. Yes, hand me the muscle. I mean, bottle. Dustin tosses it at me, then stands with his back toward me. I apply the lotion, rubbing it over his smooth skin. The contact makes my heart pound. His phone rings as I'm applying his sunscreen, and he reaches over and picks up the call. Hello? I can't hear the other person, but his muscles stiffen, and I can tell he's not very happy. No, now's not a good time, Mum. 
I finish rubbing in the lotion and close the cap on the tube. I toss it in my bag. Dustin turns to me and mouths, I'll just be a second. Into the phone, he says, Actually, I'm on vacation. Can I call you back? He ends the call and sets his phone down on his lounge chair. He exhales, and I can tell something is bothering him. Bad call, I ask. It's just my mum. She wants to come visit. And you don't want her to? He gives me a look, and I'm not sure how to interpret it. She's a bit... opinionated about things. Ah, I get it. She wants to tell you how to live your life. He nods. Yeah, something like that. I'm sorry. I place a hand on his arm. That must be difficult. Everything is fine, as long as I'm doing what she wants. He gives me a small smile. But when I don't, things can get strained. You'll have to find a way to tell her to mind her own business. I give him a smile like I've just solved world peace. He smiles back. Yeah, easier said than done. I don't ask about what his mother is pressuring him to do. I figure it's not my business, and if he wants to tell me, he will. Let's go get in the water. Okay. Dustin and I get in the warm, June water. We play in the waves and enjoy the sun. I let myself go, ignoring the nagging feeling that this can't last, that none of this is real, or that he could be acting this whole time. I need this right now. I need him. I don't usually get very selfish, but this is something I'm selfishly clinging to, and I'm going to keep clinging until Jera forces me out of this role and back to my own life. We grab our equipment and snorkel along the rocky shore and get some great views of sea stars, urchins and anemones. I find myself enchanted with how the light plays off the reefs and sea life. This is my first time snorkeling and I wish I could capture all the bright colourful fish on film so I could paint them later. We get hungry and decide to grab something to eat. I slip my sandals and cover up on and we walk to the outdoor restaurant Squint following along. I pull a doggy treat out of my pocket and toss it. Squint runs and eats it. Dustin smirks at me, which makes me laugh. The cement terrace is filled with glass tables, iron chairs, and a thatched roof covers the area. Dustin pulls out a chair for me facing the ocean. I sit and take in the view as Squint jumps on my lap. Now I know why you keep treats in your pockets. I look up at him. Why? So you'll be his favourite? I giggle when I realise he's jealous of my dog. Yep. Dustin sits next to me. His phone chimes, and he picks it up to read the incoming text. He lets out a breath and sets his phone back down. Looks like things are starting already. I have a costume fitting tomorrow. I nod as I pet Squint. At least the show will be filmed in LA. But things are about to get quite crazy. I know you know what it's like. Yeah. I actually don't know what it's like, but I can imagine. It's okay that he'll be busy, though. This is a good thing. At least, that's what I tell myself. And the huge hole that's forming in my chest, because at some point I'm going to have to leave and this will all be over. The server comes to our table to hand us menus and get our drink orders. After he leaves, Dustin turns to me. I have a question, but I don't want you to feel obligated to answer if you don't want to. That sounds ominous. You can ask. If I don't want to answer, I'll tell you. He fiddles with the wrapped silverware. Have you ever tried to contact your father? I see why he's nervous to ask. I shake my head. No? Has he ever tried to contact you? I swallow and consider my options. I should answer as Jera. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. Yes, I say quietly, looking down at Squint. What happened? My father left us when my sister and I were just... I stop, realising if I say we were both six years old, he's going to know I have a twin. When we were little, he stopped all contact with us. It was horrible. We had no money, no food. The only place my mum could get a job was at a fried chicken place. We ate so much fried chicken, I still can't eat it to this day. Dustin nods and places his hand on mine. Then mum lost her job and we had to move in with my aunt. He didn't help with anything. He totally cut us out of his life. So you can imagine my shock when he messages me out of the blue after my first movie hit the screens. Dustin cringes. Oh no! Yep. He sends me a sob story about how he's been out of work and how he thinks we should reconnect. 
I try not to cry, but this is the part that hurts the most. Of course, he didn't contact my sister, Mackenzie, at all. She wasn't famous. He didn't care enough to send her a message. Dustin exhales and runs a hand through his hair. That's terrible! It really was. Jera's never been shy about how much she hates our father. My mother is the same, but I've always held on to a secret hope that my father would come back into my life, that he'd finally be able to tell me why he had to leave, and it would be so compelling of a reason that I would know he'd tried everything to get back to us. It was just impossible. When my father contacted Jera after she'd become famous and couldn't be bothered to send me anything, I knew. Finally. I knew he was no good for me. I blink back tears as I pet squint. I'm fine. I don't need him in my life. Yet, you keep his photo. Dustin's voice is low and soothing. I can tell you still care. I stare out at the ocean. He's right. I do care. I try not to, but I do care about my father. I thought we had a special bond. I still, to this day, have no idea why he took me to that art museum. It was the only time he and I did anything special together. Maybe that was fate. It was the reason I paint, after all. Fate knew I needed that in my life. I care, I finally admit. But I shouldn't. Dustin leans close to me, wrapping my hands in his. Look, what your father did was wrong. There's no question about that. But don't ever berate yourself for having a tender heart. This is part of who you are. His words send a calm comfort through me. He's right. I am the person I am. And even though I've been through hard times, those times have shaped me in a way nothing else could have. The server brings us our drinks and takes our orders. I grab onto my water glass, the cool surface bringing me back to the here and now. I'm fine without my father. I truly am. I take a sip of my water and look over at Dustin. He's so at home here, at a beach resort. This is the life of a superstar. I don't want to abruptly change the subject or anything, Dustin says quietly, but I feel like we should talk about where this is going. I freeze. This? I say tentatively. You and me, he says. My heart jumps into my throat. I don't want to talk about us. Not when I know this isn't real. We can't be together. This is a fantasy that I'm living in right now, and soon the bubble will burst, and I'll go back to my life in Denver. And when I do... Things between us will have to end. When I don't say anything, Dustin continues. I think we should talk about... Wait, I say, placing a finger on his lips and cutting him off. We should enjoy today. I'm ready to be done with deep conversations. Let's just have fun today, all right? We're at the beach. This is great, right? A look crosses his face, and his gaze turns guarded. If that's what you want, I nod. I think that's best. Chapter 27. After lunch, Dustin and I spend some time lounging in the cabana. I pull out my paints. Squint curls up on Dustin's lap. It's adorable to see him with my dog. He pets Squint while I paint. I sketch the fish we saw as we were snorkeling. It's really fun to paint the bright colors of the sea creatures and how the water changes the light. I get so absorbed in what I'm doing, I don't realize how much time has passed until I look at my watch. What time are we heading back again? Dustin lifts his head. He looks like he fell asleep. I booked the return flight for four o'clock. Okay, it's almost four. We'd better start packing. We gather our things. Squint follows us as we make our way out of the resort and to the car Dustin has waiting for us. I scoop Squint up into his carrier and we climb into the car. Dustin entwines his fingers through mine. Are you upset? Did I mess things up between us? My heart melts. No, I say softly. You didn't. I'm sorry I pushed. You said you needed time, and I'm not giving you any. I really am sorry. I stare out the window as the car drives down the street. It's okay. You're not being unreasonable. I'm the one being unreasonable, but I can't explain to him why. I can't have a relationship with him because I'm only pretending to be Jera. I only have a couple of days left. My heart grows heavy. A part of me hopes he really is playing me to get the lawsuit dropped. 
It would make ending things between us a whole lot easier. Yet, the pain that would cause me might not be worth it. We climb back into the helicopter, and after the 20-minute ride, we're back at Dustin's car. As we drive to Jera's house, I notice how much Dustin is smiling, like he's got a secret. I remember what he said about a gift, and I nudge him. Are you going to give me my present now? In a minute. Is it in the glove box? I reach over and open the compartment, but there's only a manual and a pair of sunglasses in it. Dustin chuckles. Hang on, I'll give it to you when we get to my house. My stomach rumbles, and Dustin shoots me a look. Hungry? I laugh. I guess so. Me too. What are you hungry for? I'm fine with anything. I've been craving a burger all day. Should we be spontaneous? I have no idea what he's talking about, but the devilish look on his face makes me want to know. Sure. He pulls into the drive through of an in-and-out burger. I look around to try to figure out what he's doing that is out of the norm. When I realize he isn't doing anything else, I make a face. The drive through is spontaneous. You don't think so? I scoff. Nope. You do this all the time? He raises his eyebrows. Sure. Then I realize he's talking to Jera, famous movie star. Jera probably doesn't go through the drive through I can't take it back now, though, so I pretend. I flip my hair. It gives people something to talk about. He laughs. You're so funny. We order at the menu. As we wait in line to get to the window, he turns to me. This will be my last splurge. I'll have to get in shape for hit the beach. Then you should have ordered extra fries. You're such an enabler. I nod. Yes, I am. We pull up to the window and the girl leans out. That will be 1075. She gapes at us. Holy cow, you're Dustin Sawyer, and you're Jera Davenport. Dustin smiles at her and hands her his credit card. Yes, we are. The girl fans her face. Oh my gosh, you guys are like my favorite actors. I can't believe you're here. Another girl joins her at the window. Did you say Dustin Sawyer? When she looks at us, she screams, I can't believe it. Suddenly, there are ten in-and-out employees smashed to the window, gawking and taking pictures of us. The girl who took Dustin's credit card pushes her way through the crowd to the window. Here you go, she says, handing him back his card. Thanks, Dustin says. The girl clasps her hands together. Will you guys sign a napkin for me? Sure, he says. She pushes past her co-workers to grab a napkin with a pen. She hands them to Dustin. I watch him sign his name on the napkin using the centre console. It doesn't occur to me to freak out until he hands it to me and everyone stares at me, waiting for me to sign Jira's name. My blood freezes. I don't know how to sign her name. I've never studied Jira's signature. I'm so dead. Everyone watches me as I fiddle with the napkin, trying to get it just right on the console. My mouth goes dry as I rack my brain. If I can remember what her signature kind of looks like, I can maybe get close, but I don't remember anything. My mind is blank. Sweat breaks out on my forehead. I know I have to do something. I take the pen and scribble a large J and then a squiggle that doesn't really resemble Jera's name, but I guess I can blame it on the napkin if people ask why it doesn't look normal. Here, I say, handing it back to Dustin. Thank you so much, the girl says, grinning at us. Luckily, she doesn't look too closely at it. Your dog is adorable, she says to me. Thank you. As if on cue, Squint barks. People take our pictures as we wait for our food to come out. It's awkward, and I don't know what to do with my hands. I pet Squint and wait for the awkwardness to end. The girl finally hands us a paper bag with our meal in it. Have a great night! Thank you for the autographs. I give her a wave as Dustin pulls out into traffic. The smell from the burgers makes me salivate. Luckily, it doesn't take too long to get to Dustin's house. We take the food inside and sit down at his table to eat. Squint runs to the corner of the kitchen where an automatic doggy water dish now sits. I smile at Dustin. Is that my present? No, he says as he takes out our food. I'll give you your gift after we eat. You just want to torture me some more. A glint enters his eye. 
Maybe. I pop a French fry in my mouth. Mmm, this is good. For fast food burgers, you can't beat in and out. He takes a bite of his burger. I guess after this, it's just kale and legumes, huh? Yeah, I have to get in shape. This show is set on the beach. The image of Dustin in the water, his chest muscles glistening, pops into my head. I think you're already in shape, I say under my breath. Dustin chuckles. Glad you think so. After we eat, Dustin comes up behind me and puts his arms around me. Are you ready for your gift? Chapter 28 I nod, excited to see what he got for me. Absolutely. I can't wait. He leads me over to the patio door, slides it open, then we step outside. It's dusk, but not too dark. His patio is lit by twinkle lights strung on an awning, which gives everything a magical glow. A little further out, he has a cute little gazebo with a couple of chairs and a table. I turn and gaze at him and wait for him to give me a present, but he just stands there, smiling. His gaze keeps flicking to something behind me, and I look to see what he's staring at. I gasp as I realise the fence between our properties is gone. There are spots where I can see holes that still need to be filled, but that's all that remain. I blink back tears as it hits me what this means. I turn to him. You tore down your fence. They'll come back and fix the holes tomorrow. They promise they can restore your property to the fullest. I'm getting a new one installed later in the week. I'll make sure it's installed solidly on my property. Emotions rise in me and I can't stop the tears from falling. Dustin gave in to what Jera wanted. He did it for me. He wasn't acting nice to me to get what he wanted. Jera was wrong. He does like me for me. He pulls me to his chest. Hey, why are you crying? I thought you'd be happy. I can't help the sobs from coming. I cling to him and try to get my emotions under control. It doesn't work and I turn into a blubbering mess. I am, I say, but it comes out choked and high-pitched. He holds me close, softly stroking my hair. I don't understand why it means this much to you, but I'm glad you're happy. My throat tightens as I think about it. Him tearing down his fence and rebuilding is overwhelming to me. Jera has to be happy now. She's gotten what she wanted. And maybe now she'll see that Dustin isn't the jerk she thinks he is. I realise I'm not just crying because he gave in to Jera's demands. I'm also crying because it means I have to break things off without the excuse that he's been playing me to get what he wants with the fence. I'll destroy everything we have and I'll be a rotten, horrible person. I'm so sorry, Dustin, I say, when I can get my voice under control. I'm sorry for the lawsuit and for everything. And I'm sorry for so much more that I can't say right now. I'm sorry for the future we won't have. It's all over now. Let's put it all behind us. I nod, pulling back from him. I'm sure I look terrible, but he lifts my chin and smiles at me anyway. Are you okay? Yes. It's a lie. I'm not okay. I'm about to totally destroy him and shatter my own heart. Good. He kisses the tip of my nose. I have one more surprise to give you. Great. He's got more for me. As if I don't feel bad enough. I try to give him a smile. What's that? My new fence will have a gate. It will be able to lock on both sides, so if you ever don't want me using the gate, just put a lock on it. He brushes a strand of my hair back. But I hope you won't need to lock it. I stare up at him, my heart swelling. I don't know how it happened, but somewhere in all this pretending, I've fallen in love with him. The realisation startles me and takes me aback, but I can't deny it. I love Dustin, and he's the most amazing human I've met. He's staring at me, waiting for me to respond. I gather up my emotions so I don't start crying again. That will make it easier for me to come eat your food. He chuckles. I'll make you food whenever you want. He leans down and gently presses his lips to mine. I wrap my arms around his neck and give him a proper kiss. After a few minutes, he smiles and pulls back. I'm glad you like your present. I do. I can't hold back a smile. He's shown me the truth, his true and honest feelings toward me. He doesn't know why the fence was such a big deal, but he's moving the entire thing anyway. The whole project had to cost him several thousand dollars.
Jera, I'm glad you're happy. I want you to be. I just hope someday you'll be able to open up to me. Guilt rises in my throat. He's right. I haven't opened up to him. I've told him some things, actually more than I've shared with most people, but I haven't told him the most important thing, that I'm not Jera. He pulls me to him, and I lay my head against his chest. I know you were hurt by Luke. It kills me to think about what he might have done to you. It takes time to start to heal from that. My palms grow sweaty, and I feel even worse. I'm such a scumbag. How could I have let things go this far with Dustin without telling him who I really am? I've told him so many lies, led him to believe so many things that were wrong. Even Luke is a lie. I want you to know I'll wait for you. What we have, it's something special. It's worth waiting for. He kisses the top of my head. I close my eyes, regret filling my soul. I should tell him, right now. I should explain everything, and then at least he'll know why I lied. But if I do, he will get very upset with me. It will end things between us, I just know it will. What I've done can't be smoothed over by mere apologies. Jera wants me to stay until I get the photo shoot done. I need to tell him, but if I wait, I can hold on to this dream for just a little while longer. I can pretend this love is real for a few more hours. This is what I need. I need Dustin to hold on to me like he is right now. I need the warmth he gives me. I'll tell him the truth tomorrow night. Chapter 29 Dustin pulls back from me. It's early still. Do you want to do something? Sure, what do you want to do? I'd love to watch you paint. You could show me some tips. Excitement thrums through me. I'm dying to get back to my paints and start working on some of the full paintings I sketched this afternoon. I'd love to teach you. Dustin and I get Squint and we cross through the backyard to Jera's house. Do you mind feeding Squint while I get my paints ready? Sure. Everything is in the kitchen. He gets one scoop. Dustin goes to feed my dog and I pull out my supplies in Jera's library. There's only one chair at the desk, so I drag in another chair from the living room. I set it next to the desk where Dustin can see everything I'm doing. He comes back into the room. I fed Squint, but I notice the bowl is the kind that collapses for travel. Same for his water. Is that all you have? A set of travel bowls. I look up from Jera's desk, the guilt once again assaulting me. I don't want to lie to Dustin again, but now isn't the right time to tell him the truth. Maybe I can get around it by not really lying to him. He doesn't really care about the bowl, as long as he gets fed. Dustin laughs. I can tell that's true. Okay, sit here. I'll show you how I start my paintings. I take a pencil and lightly sketch the beach scene, explaining as I go why I'm putting certain things in different places. So it's much more involved than just sketching what you see. You have to think about composition as you do it. Exactly. I show Dustin how to mix the paints on the palette and how to apply large washes to the paper before going into the details. I have fun showing him how to work with the paper to create light and dark contrast in the paint. Dustin seems fascinated and he watches me as I explain everything. You really know what you're doing. This had to have come from more than just one or two art classes in college. I bite my lower lip. He's right. I attended an art school while Jera attended some fancy film school in LA. I stare at the watercolour paper. I have to tell him the truth. I attended the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. That totally makes sense. I bet you thought you were going to be an artist before your acting career took off. Yeah, I say quietly. Dustin doesn't notice the shift between us. This looks fantastic. Can I try? I pull out a sheet of watercolour paper. Of course. It's best to start just by getting used to the paint, paint some shapes, paying attention to how the paint goes onto the paper. You can use some of the techniques I've been showing you. Dustin works alongside me, trying out different brushes and paints. I watch him as he explores the thing I love most. It touches my heart that he wants to learn something that means so much to me. Where does your mom live? Dustin asks as he swirls his brush into the water container. She's in Washington State. Do you see her often? He glances at me, probably trying to gauge how close I am with my mother. Yes, she comes to visit quite a bit. 
You mentioned how hard it was for your family when your father left. How is your mother doing now? She's doing well. After, I almost said Jera, but luckily I stopped myself and cleared my throat. After I landed my first movie, I helped my mum get out of debt. She's remarried now and living her best life. Dustin dips his brush into the burnt umber. Do you like your stepfather? Yes, he's a really nice guy. My sister and I are so happy for my mother. He smiles as he applies the paint to his paper. That's great. My stepfather is really into classic cars. They travel all over for that. They're in Tennessee right now, getting ready for some big classic car show. Dustin raises his eyebrows. So, he owns a classic car? I nod. Several. His baby is a 1955 Thunderbird. That's usually the one they take. Dustin swivels in his chair. Really? I'd love to see it. I pull out my phone and pull up social media. He's always posting photos of it. I'll find one. It doesn't take me long, and I hand my phone over to Dustin. He lets out a low whistle. That's gorgeous. I bet he would love it if you made a painting of his car. What a fantastic idea. You're right. Thank you. Now I know what I'm giving him for Christmas. I love the blue color. You should see it in person, I say. Do they ever drive it here when they come visit you? Yes. At least they do when they visit me in Denver. I should probably change the subject. How are your shapes coming along? He shows me his paper. This is harder than it looks. You're doing good. I see you're learning how to create different colors and shades. Great job. He smiles. You're being kind. I'm being honest. The hardest part is learning to work with the paint instead of against it, if that makes sense. Yes, I totally understand. We paint together, losing track of time until I look up at the clock. Oh, it's almost midnight. We should stop. You're right. My costume fitting is in the morning. We stand and walk to the sliding glass door that leads to Jera's backyard. Dustin slips his arm around me as we step outside. Can I come over after my appointment tomorrow? Sure. I need to film my class, but I'll text you when I'm done. Dustin pulls me to his side. I'm glad we got to talk today. I feel like we took a step forward in our relationship. His words both thrill me and devastate me. We did take a step forward, but each step forward will simply mean more heartache when I finally tell him who I am. I shove that thought out of my mind. I can't think about tomorrow night. It's going to be too difficult as it is. I'll deal with it later. I turn to him. Thanks for such a lovely day. He puts his hands on my shoulders. His touch warms me to my toes. You mentioned you have a photo shoot this week. What day is it? Thursday. So, after you film your class tomorrow, you're free? I nod. Yep. Will you be free by lunchtime? I'd have to get up early. I hate getting up early, but tomorrow is our last day together, so I smile. I can be. Great. I think I can whip up another surprise for you. I can't wait. He gives me a kiss before leaving. I watch him walk across our backyards and disappear into his house. I have one more day to spend in this fantasy before I have to tell Dustin the truth and break both of us. Chapter 30 I restart my camera for the tenth time. I keep fumbling and messing up. I'm not sure if it's my nerves or if I'm just not in the right headspace to teach a class, but I feel like I'm trying to force something. I take a calming breath and start in on my lecture once more. This time it flows better, and I'm able to get through most of it without messing up. The small things I can edit out later. I talk about light fastness and permanency, how some paints are opaque while others are transparent, and how to work with both kinds. It's an update from an earlier class I'd already recorded and uploaded to the teaching portal, but originally did with lower quality paints. Now that Jera had bought me a whole new set, I wanted to show the students how these paints work. I finish with my class a half hour after my goal time, which frankly isn't that bad in my book. I can edit the video after I get home. I'll need something to sink myself into anyway. I already know I'll be a total mess. I text Dustin that I'm done with my class and I rush to get ready to spend the rest of the day with him. He texts back right away. I'm thinking of a lunch picnic. Sound good? Sounds perfect. 
I gather up my things, and I feed Squint before we head over to Dustin's house. The workers are still finishing up in the backyard as I walk between our houses, but it's looking great. Jera will be so pleased. You can't even tell there was ever a fence on her property. I walk to Dustin's back patio and climb the steps. I can see him inside his kitchen preparing for our outing, and I take a moment to appreciate the view. No one has ever made jeans and a t-shirt look so good. He turns and smiles when he sees me. Hey, he says after opening the door. Squint runs in and drinks from his fancy dog fountain. Hi, I step inside. Can I help you with anything? Sure, I'm just packing up everything. I look at the spread. He's got salads, sliced apples, peeled cuties, and an assortment of veggies with a hummus dip that looks amazing. He's packing things into a wicker picnic basket. I grab a Ziploc baggie and start putting the carrot sticks inside. This all looks delicious. And healthy. No cheesy mashed potatoes today. Dustin pats his abdomen, even though there's no fat on his body anywhere. That's okay. Jera. I stop short, realizing what I just said. Dustin looks at me funny, and time seems to slow. My pulse races. I have no words. I was going to tell him that Jera wants me to be on a strict diet until the photo shoot tomorrow, but of course I can't tell him that. He's still looking at me funny, so I have to finish somehow. Jera shouldn't be eating all those calories anyway, I say, patting my own stomach and pretending I talk about myself in third person all the time. Is that a Seinfeld reference? Jimmy likes Elaine. He laughs and shakes his head. That's such a great episode. I giggle, even though I don't know what he's talking about. It sounds forced and I make myself stop. Where are we going to picnic? He points to his backyard with his chin. I thought we'd just go outside to the gazebo. I hold in a squeal as my inner child gets all excited about eating in the romantic gazebo outside. One of my aunt's favorite movies was The Sound of Music, so I start picturing Liesel and Rolf in the rain. Too bad he became a Nazi. That sort of ruined the romance of it all. Anyway, I tamp down my excitement and calmly nod at him. That will be fun. We finish packing the food and Dustin opens the refrigerator. Do you like sparkling water? Yes. He hands me a can of liquid death and takes one for himself. I think we're ready. I grab the picnic basket and we go out of the sliding door. Squint happily follows us. The workers are finished with Jera's yard and are leaving as we walk to the gazebo. Dustin slides a chair out for me. Here you go. Look at you, being such a gentleman. I set the basket beside me on the wooden slats of the flooring. Dustin bows. I try. I open the basket and pull out a tablecloth that was tied to the lid. As I shake out the tablecloth, Dustin pulls out the plates. Squint curls up beside us. How did your class go this morning? I scoff. I had to restart the thing a dozen times, but once I got going, it was fine. What made you have to restart? I open the apple slices and grab a few for my plate as I try to find the words I want. I was having issues getting into the right mindset, I think I was too distracted. Dustin grins at me. Am I the distraction? I know he's flirting with me, so I give him a small smile. Probably. He laughs and opens his can of sparkling water. I'm glad it's me. If it were some other dude, I'd have a bruised ego right now. Just a bruised ego? No. He takes a sip of his drink. I think I'd have a major jealousy problem. Heat rises to my face, and I'm sure I'm blushing. I grab a carrot stick and dig into the hummus. I shove it in my mouth. Mmm, I say. My phone vibrates, signaling a text has come through. I pull it out of my pocket and look at the message. Hey sis, just wanted to let you know I scheduled a full body wax for you tomorrow morning. You'll need it before the photo shoot. I breathe in quickly and a piece of carrot goes into my lungs. I cough so hard I start hacking up a lung as Dustin pats my back like my mum used to do when I choked on something. You okay? He asks. I nod, still trying to cough enough to get out whatever leftover junk is in my lungs. Wrong pipe, I manage to say. I hate when that happens. Dustin glances down at my phone. Did you get bad news? When I finally get myself under control, I nod. Something like that. I send a text back to my sister. 
Full body wax? Why do I feel like you're not telling me something? What do I have to wear during this photo shoot? I wait for her text. Dustin opens the lid on his salad. Everything okay? I hope so, I say, still staring at the phone. Jera's not texting back, and my heart sinks to my toes. Finally, my phone vibrates again and her message appears. You'll be doing an ad for a razor. It doesn't escape my notice that she didn't answer my question. I shoot a text back. Wearing what? A swimsuit? It takes a moment for her next text to come through. When it does, all the spit in my mouth dries up. A towel. Chapter 31. I choke again, this time on my own spit. Dustin gives me a worried look. What's wrong? I cough for a moment before answering. I just found out what I have to wear during my photo shoot. He raises his eyebrows. What? A towel? I huff and roll my eyes. Why does it have to be a towel? I'm reliving my earlier embarrassment. I make a face and look at Jera's upstairs window, the one I almost fell out of. Dustin tries to hide a smile, but he doesn't succeed very well. You look great in a towel. He stabs at his salad. I look embarrassed in a towel. How am I going to do a whole photo shoot in one? He chews his bite of salad before pointing his fork at me. Wait, didn't they tell you what you'd be wearing when you signed the contract with them? Shoot. Jera probably knew. I'm sure she agreed to it before she had the terrible bruising from her surgery. It only makes sense that she knew. I, on the other hand, was blindsided. I don't want to lie to Dustin anymore, though. I look down at my carrot sticks. I agreed to do it verbally and just found out the details. Ah, your manager set it up without showing you the contract. That sucks. But at least they usually have you in a bathing suit under stuff like that, so don't be too flustered. It will be fine. Jera would know that kind of thing. I try not to turn three shades of red as I sit back in my chair. Yes, I'm sure it will be fine. I'm just surprised is all. Dustin reaches in his pocket and pulls out a dog treat. Squint jumps up and barks at him until he tosses it at him. After he's done with his treat, Dustin pats his lap and Squint jumps up on him. You booger! You're bribing my dog to like you better than me! He chuckles as he pets Squint. Yes, I am. I know what you're up to. I see how this is going to go. I pull a treat out of my pocket and wave it at Squint. He ignores my efforts leaning into Dustin's hand as he scratches behind his ears. I scoff. Fine. I put the treat back in my pocket. Dustin laughs. Wow, Squint, you just dissed your mom. I'll get him back later when he's begging me for a treat. I pop a sugar snap pea in my mouth. Don't take it out on him. I'm just irresistible. Dustin grins at me with one of his sexier-than-Thor looks. That's true, I mutter under my breath. Dustin just laughs at me. We eat our lunch and I help Dustin clean up our picnic. As I fill the sink with water to quickly wash our plates and forks, Dustin comes up behind me and wraps his arms around me. Oh, doing the dishes, I see, he says close to my ear. Can I help? Of course. He pours some dish soap in the water and suds bubble up. He dips his hands in the suds, then slides his hands down my arms, his fingers running over my skin, creating waves of pleasure through me. His fingers thread through mine and he kisses my neck. I close my eyes and just let the sensations wash over me. After a minute of Dustin kissing my neck and teasing my earlobe with his lips, I forget all about washing the dishes and I turn toward him. He presses his lips to mine, the kiss warm and soft. I get lost in the feeling of Dustin and me together. I don't know how I fell in love with him. I wasn't trying to, but it happened anyway. My hands slide up his chest, to his neck. They leave trails of soapy water, but he doesn't seem to care. He presses closer to me. I love the contact, the connection, the vibration of our souls together. It's beautiful. Jera, he whispers between kisses. What? We'd better finish the dishes, or it will be too late to give you my surprise. I stop my kisses, and I must admit disappointment creeps into my chest. I won't get many more moments with Dustin. I was enjoying the warmth of him, but I know we can't spend all day making out. I turn around and grab a plate. 
He stands next to me and helps me wash and dry the dishes. We pack them back into the picnic basket and put it away. Okay, I'm ready for my surprise, I say as I hang up the dish towel. We'll have to travel a bit for that. Unfortunately, Squint can't come. Are you okay with that? I nod. As long as Dustin is there, I'll be okay. Yeah. Want to grab a hat and sunglasses from my bag? He walks to the closet and hands me the bag. We're going somewhere public? Yes. All righty then. I pick out some sunglasses and a cream-colored hat. I'm ready. Dustin puts on a gray baseball cap and a pair of sunglasses, and we leave the house and climb into his convertible. My curiosity grows as he drives, but he wants to surprise me, so I don't say anything until we turn a corner and I see a sign that says, The Getty Center. I grow excited as I've always wanted to go there and see the artwork. You're taking me to an art museum? He nods. Yes. Have you been here before? No. He smiles. Good surprise? Absolutely, I say, as I stare at the building. It's a work of art in and of itself, with curved lines and interesting form. I'm so thrilled Dustin thought of this. We can stay as long as you'd like. I mean, until it closes. I laugh. This is so awesome. We make our way into the building. It's a Wednesday afternoon and the place isn't crowded, which I really appreciate. Still, I grasp onto Dustin's hand as we pass by a gathering of people who are milling about. Dustin holds my hand firmly, giving me something to focus on. I cling to him as the anxiety from being around people rises in me. He pays for our admission and he guides me away from the crowd. We find an empty room and my anxiety immediately eases as we enter the serene environment, surrounded by blue and green artwork depicting sea life. The lighting is a bit dim. I take my sunglasses and put them on my hat. The first painting is large, taking up the entire wall. I laugh when I see its sea turtles swimming under the water. I point at the painting. Sea turtles. He smiles. That's funny. I guess the sea turtle is our spirit animal or it's a symbol of our love. I freeze when I realize what I've said. I didn't mean to say the L word. That's huge, colossal. It's a massive thing to toss out there into the void. Now I don't know what to say. The word hangs in the air between us as the tension grows awkward. I think it is, Dustin says quietly. He kisses the top of my head and slides his arm around me. Warmth threads through me. He didn't say the word, but he meant it. He dispelled my fear and let me know I hadn't said the wrong thing. Not only that. He softly confirmed that he's feeling the same way I am. My heart swells. As we walk by all the sea creatures, I'm emotionally closer to him than ever. He radiates warmth and comfort. I'm safe when he's with me. It's been so long since I had that. I just want to spend forever basking in his glow. I don't want to think about what I have to do tonight. I don't want to tell him I'm not Jera and ruin all we have. Chapter 32 I walk beside Dustin as we navigate our way through the museum. I slide my sunglasses back on as we near others. Dustin shields me from people, checking on rooms and walking me through crowds quickly so we can get to an empty area. I love how aware he is of our surroundings and how he talks to me softly when we can't avoid a crowd. We find a room with watercolor paintings and I'm in heaven as we study them. These are amazing, I say. Dustin asks me a few questions about technique and how to get a desired result and I explain things to him. He seems absorbed in what I'm saying, even though he doesn't paint. I love that about him. He genuinely wants to know about what I'm interested in. What made you think to bring me here? I ask as we walk past another wall of paintings. He shrugs. You had a memory of your father taking you to a museum, but it seemed like that got tainted with what happened between you. I just thought I'd give you another good memory to hold on to. Tears spring to my eyes. What a kind thing for him to do. Thank you, I managed to say. He hugs me to his side. He doesn't make a big deal of my tears. He silently supports me. There's no way he could know how much that means to me. As we advance, looking at the art... I can't control my tears. I try, but they keep coming. 
The hole in my chest is going to swallow me up. I feel so terrible for lying to Dustin all this time. He's such a good man, and I'm a horrible person. We pause before a painting of a waterfall, and it reminds me of being in Jera's living room with Dustin while I make him stand far back so he can't see my signature. I let the tears silently fall down my cheeks. With these large sunglasses on, I hope no one can tell. I should have told him as soon as I started having feelings for him. It's too late to back things up and do them over. I've messed everything up, and I can't fix it. He runs his thumb over my side. Are you okay? He asks softly. I'm not okay, but I want so desperately to be. I have to be okay, because this is it. This is all we get. I'm okay, I say. We continue walking, and I get a hold of myself. Today, I'm with the man I love. I need to focus on that and not worry about what I have to do later. We move through a room with all black and white paintings. They are stark and garish, and I'm sure the artist intended them to be this way. I stare at one filled with squares. Dustin looks down at me and squeezes my hand. I don't need words to know what he means. He saw my tears and now sees they're gone. He's just showing me he cares. Can I ask you something? He asks. Sure. Were they happy tears or sad tears? I swallow as I try to figure out how to answer. The fact that Dustin cared so much to bring me to the museum made me happy, but knowing that what we have won't last is crushing me. The happy part is being overshadowed by the stark reality. Sad, I finally say. Want to talk about it? Not yet. It will be time soon, but not right now. Not in public, and not here. I don't want another tainted memory. That's okay. We can talk about it when you're ready. He's blindly putting his trust in me, which makes me feel even worse. I swallow back my guilt and shame. I only have a few hours left with him. Tomorrow I finish what Jera needs, and I've already got my flight home booked with Jera's private jet. This dream will end, but if I tell him right now, it will all end this second. We walk through the rest of the museum, taking in the paintings, sculptures and photographs. I lose myself in the art, purposely forgetting what needs to happen later. I allow myself this one last happy moment. We spend the rest of the afternoon enjoying the art, the fantastic architecture, and the breathtaking views. We don't have time to get to the gardens, but I vow to come back one day and see them too. When the museum closes, we climb back into Dustin's car. He turns to me. Did you like your surprise? I did, thank you. It meant a lot to me. This is an understatement. It meant more than if he'd lassoed the moon for me. I lean over and impulsively press my lips to his. I close my eyes and let myself live in his kiss one last time. As his lips perform a slow dance with mine, a single tear escapes and slides down my cheek. I pull back and quickly wipe it away before he can see. He gives me a warm smile. I'm glad. I know things will be crazy with me filming Hit the Beach, but I thought maybe we could make this a regular thing. There are a lot of great art museums here. I nod even though I know this won't happen. Yeah, sounds good. We drive back to Dustin's house in silence. I stare out at the streets as he drives. I think about how I'm going to tell him I'm not Jera, and I can't come up with a great way to do it. I can't just blurt it out. I'll need to ease into it somehow. But I'm not sure how to start that conversation. It can wait until after dinner. We go through Dustin's gate and pull up the long driveway. Dustin slams on the brakes and I jerk forward. What's wrong? I ask. Sorry. He points to a bright yellow sports car in the driveway. My mother is here. It just startled me. Panic grows in my chest as Dustin slowly pulls forward. His mother is here. Now? I won't get to spend the evening alone with Dustin. I need more time. I can't tell him who I am with someone else around. I want to be alone with him so I can plead with him to understand why I lied. I don't know how she got in, he says as he parks the car. He turns toward me. Look, my mom is kind of different. I told her not to come, but looks like she ignored me. She's used to getting what she wants, and right now she wants to meet you. Me? Why does she want to meet me? I'm shocked and annoyed, 
and I don't know what to do about it. I'm not sure exactly what Dustin is getting at by saying she's different, but I nod anyway. Okay. We climb out of the car, walk up to the door, and step inside. No one is in sight, but Squint comes running up to me. I pick up Squint and tentatively walk with him through the entryway to the living room area. Dustin, is that you? His mother calls from the kitchen. Yes, mother. He pauses before sliding off his sunglasses. How did you get in? Alison Taylor enters the room, and I swear she's gliding on small clouds of fluff instead of walking. She's wearing a massive sun hat and a flowy outfit that looks like it was weaved by an ancient people on some remote island and costs a million dollars. She takes off a large pair of sunglasses and folds them, holding them in her well-manicured hand. I know your father's birthday, honey. Dustin seems taken aback by that. She approaches him and air kisses his cheeks. I just had to come meet your new fling. Dustin's face flushes. Mom, please. She looks at me. Ah, here she is, the latest tramp. Chapter 33 I balk, stepping back, my throat tight. I don't know what I expected from Dustin's mother, but it wasn't that. I protectively shield Squint from her. Mother, Dustin says quite firmly. I haven't ever heard Dustin raise his voice. It startles me. Alison straightens her spine, her eyes shooting daggers at Dustin. You, of all people, should know better. Did you think I wouldn't find out? It's all over the celebrity news. You're running around making a fool of yourself. If you're going to treat Jera this way, you're invited to leave. He puts his arm around me and scowls at her. I'm sorry. Where are my manners? She puts a hand to her chest. It's obvious she's not sorry at all. Please forgive me, she says, the sarcasm dripping heavy off her words. The last several tramps took him for over a million dollars. I know I shouldn't jump to conclusions, but what's going on here is quite clear from the photos of you two. How much has she asked you for? Or rather, how much have you spent on her? My brain is still stuck on something she said two sentences ago. Photos? I squeak out. Oh no, this is bad. I'm putting Jera in a terrible situation. Pictures of you at a gala and the two of you on Catalina Island making out on the beach. If you meant to have a secret affair, you weren't careful enough, dear. She glares at me. Jera has to be livid. I haven't heard from her, though. I pull out my phone and the screen is black. The battery ran out at some point today. Great. Jera's going to flip out. I've messed up so bad, and Jera's the one who will suffer for it. I pull Squint close to my chest. Who I date is none of your business, Dustin says calmly. If we can't have a civilised conversation, you know where the door is. It's my business because it's not just your money. I won't let my hard work be wasted. Everyone knows about the exploits of Jera Davenport. His mother waves her hand in front of me, like I'm living proof of this. Dustin shakes his head. For your information, Jera hasn't asked me for any money, and I haven't offered any. I glance at Dustin because that's not true. Didn't he offer Jera money for the fence being on her property? And didn't he just spend a ton of money on moving it? Dustin seems to read my mind because he gives me a tiny shake of his head. Alison raises an eyebrow. I know all about the lawsuit. If that's what your little nonverbal communication is about, I'm not stupid. Looks like the two of you decided to settle things out of court. She says it like she's implying all kinds of inappropriate things and heat rushes to my face. Our relationship isn't like that. I think we need to talk about this later, Dustin says, while taking his mother's shoulders and guiding her to the door. I'll call you later, Mum. She turns before going into the entryway. Fine, I'll leave. You know my thoughts on the matter. Get out before things get even more expensive. She shoves her sunglasses on and storms out of the door. I stand there, staring at the door, my hands trembling. Squint wiggles to get down, and I set him on the floor. I've never had anyone speak to me that way, and it's shaken me. Dustin envelops me into his arms. Are you okay? I'm so sorry. My mother can be horrible sometimes. I didn't know she was going to attack you. I'm okay, I say as I cling to him. Are you sure? I think we should sit down. 
I shake my head. I need to plug in my phone and have a conversation with Jera. She has to be upset if she's seen the photos of us. I have to explain things to her, and the best place to do that is over at Jera's house. I can't, I say, my emotions in my throat. I have to go home for a bit. Because of my mother? He pulls back so he can look in my eyes. No, it's something else. I just need to call someone and deal with something. I'm having trouble looking him in the eyes. I hate not telling him everything that's going on. I hate the lying. I never should have told Jera I would do this. Okay, that's fine. He places his hands on my shoulders. As long as you're all right. I am. I try to smile and show him I'm fine, but I'm sure I don't look fine at all. I feel like I'm having a nervous breakdown. Dustin steps back from me. Do you want me to make us some dinner? I don't know how long it will take to talk Jera down from the ledge I'm sure she's on, but I nod anyway. Yes, I'll be back as soon as I can. Sounds good. He kisses my forehead. Please forget what my mother said. I'll talk to her. I don't want you to feel like what she said has any influence on me. I don't. I call for Squint and snatch him into my arms. As I leave, I look back at Dustin. Wait for me. I won't be long. Chapter 34 I pick my way across the yard, my mind churning. I'm sure Jera's seen the photos of me and Dustin. And based on what she said the other day, she has to be really upset I didn't listen to her. Squint needs to use the bathroom, so I let him run off in the yard as I enter Jera's house. I know something isn't right the second I enter and see three large suitcases sitting at the base of her staircase. My heart jumps into my throat as I take another step. Jera's here. Jera comes running down the stairs. Her hair is up in a scrunchie, a pair of sunglasses on the top of her head, and she's right. Her eyes look like she was on the wrong end of a mugging. The bruising goes all around her eyes and is a deep purple. Mackenzie, I've been calling you. Were you out with Dustin? Her voice is high-pitched. Yes, I'm sorry, Jera, I didn't mean to. You've seen the headlines. Her gaze bounces around the house like she's a trapped wild animal. I saw them online and I came right over. I can't believe this is happening. No, I haven't seen them, but I heard there are pictures of me and Dustin out there. I'm sorry, Jera. I had no idea someone would photograph us like that. I wring my hands. I messed up in a big way. She pulls her phone out of her pocket and shoves it at me. Look! Look what they are saying about me. The online article sported a bold title, Caught in the Act, Gerard Davenport's Steamy Island Getaway with Dustin Sawyer. Further down, the article displayed another bold statement. Is she seducing him to win her lawsuit? Intimate photos of me and Dustin kissing on the beach are splashed all over the article. I stop scrolling, my stomach lurching. Oh no! Oh yes, Mackenzie, I told you to stay away from him. He's using you to get me to drop the lawsuit and the paparazzi got it all wrong. They think it's me. She points at her chest, which is blitzed out in a pink and silver sparkly shirt. I shake my head at her. No, Dustin isn't using me. He tore down the fence. He's moving it, just like you want. I motion to the back of the house. Jera stops and stares at me. He tore it down? Yes, go look. She races past me, and I hear her footsteps and then a scraping sound as her sandals slide to a stop at the patio door. I walk through her house to join her, and I point at the spot where the fence used to be. See? I can't believe it. He really tore that eyesore down. She turns to me, her eyes narrowed. What's his plan? Why did he do that? My chest tightens. He did it for me, I say quietly. What do you mean? She grabs my shoulders. I think, I think I'm in love with him, I blurt out. Tears spring to my eyes. What? Jera shrieks. You can't. She stops talking when she sees my face. Oh, honey. Jera pulls me into a hug and I sob into her shoulder. I didn't mean to, I promise. What happened? I open my mouth to tell her, but everything is so messed up I don't know where to start. Where did I go wrong? I'm not sure how everything happened. Then I remember the window incident and words start pouring out of my mouth. I thought I saw something happening over at his house and I almost fell out of your window and I dropped my phone 
Then he came over to help because I was stuck, and then things got super crazy. At first I was desperate and needed his help, but then somewhere along the way, it became more than that. Jera pulls back and squints at me. You almost fell out my window? It's a long story. She gives me that older sister look. I have time. I huff and wave my hand. I thought I saw Dustin dragging a dead body. Turns out it was a CPR mannequin. Her mouth pops open, but no words come out. Suddenly, she bursts out laughing. Oh no! Oh yes, I was so sure he was dragging a body around in his backyard that I stretched too far to see and got stuck in your tiny bathroom window. Her eyes grow large. You didn't? And the worst part? I was only wearing a towel. Mackenzie! The look on Jera's face makes me laugh. I know. It was very embarrassing. Dustin saw me struggling to get back inside the window, and I couldn't... It was a nightmare. But he came over and pulled me back inside, even though he thought I was you and you were suing him. She stiffens. Yes, I'm sure he was just being noble. Honey, I hate to break it to you, but he's playing you. I don't know what angle he's trying, but Dustin Sawyer is not the man you think he is. I can't understand why Jera is so adamant about this. Why do you say that? What motive does he have to fool me? He tore down the whole fence. It's not that. Jera glances out of the patio door to the backyard. She blows out a frustrated breath. He hasn't liked me from the start. He acted like he did, but then he set me up. He invited me over to a party and, on purpose, humiliated me in front of everyone there. I don't know why, but he's had it out for me since he met me. I shake my head. No, he didn't humiliate you on purpose. I swear, this whole thing between you two has been a huge misunderstanding. You weren't there. You didn't see what he did. I look out the patio window and see Squint happily running in the grass, chasing a moth. What exactly happened? I saw him moving in. That weekend I ran into him at a celebrity hangout and I talked to him. I thought he was cute. He said he was having a Halloween party and invited me to come. I thought we had a connection, you know? We chatted and I thought this could go somewhere. When I showed up at the party, he'd forgotten to tell me it wasn't a costume party. She used air quotes around the word forgotten. Who holds a party on Halloween and doesn't make it a costume party? I was so embarrassed, but I told myself it was a mistake. He didn't mean it. I try to hold in my smile. What costume did you wear? I dressed as Barbie. I mean, it wasn't that bad. Would have been worse had I chose that sexy kitten costume, but I was still embarrassed. But then, at the party, he started talking about celebrities who get plastic surgery. He said it was shallow and vain, and then he pointed at me and said, and I quote, Jera hasn't had any, and she looks fine. Jera pressed her lips together and stared at me, like that proved Dustin was a horrible person. So? So? I just had my lips done and I wasn't happy with how they turned out. Everyone knew Mackenzie. Everyone. The whole room busted up laughing. I didn't know, I said quietly. Well, you don't read the celebrity gossip. It was all over the news. He didn't know. I'm sure of it. Jera blinked back tears. And then he tossed wine down my Barbie dress and I'd had enough humiliation. I left. When he put up that fence, I had them come survey the land and it was on my property. I knew he'd done that on purpose, too. That's when I slapped him with a lawsuit. I take Jera's hand. Can you imagine that the whole thing might possibly be one mistake after another? That Dustin didn't mean to do those things? She frowns and brushes her hair over her shoulder. It's hard to believe. He didn't say it wasn't a costume party, but he didn't say it was either, did he? Jera cocks her head to the side. Well, no. How could he have guessed you'd assume? And he told me he doesn't read the celebrity gossip unless he's in it. And the wine was a pure accident. Jera contemplates this for a moment. Are you sure? I've gotten to know him this last week. He is really kind-hearted. He's moving the fence, even though I wouldn't talk to him about it. He knew it being on your property made you angry, so he's spending all that money to get it moved. He's giving you what you want, only... He thinks he's giving me what I want. Her expression changes as realisation dawns on her. You mean, he still thinks you're me? 
All the emptiness and pain that I'd pushed away comes rushing back to me. Yes, I've been lying to him this whole time. At first I was just playing my part, but then things got complicated. I started falling for him, but I didn't tell him the truth, and now it's too late. Her eyes turned sympathetic. Are you really in love with him? I nod, totally miserable. Yes. She pats my shoulders. It's not too late. I have to make a phone call. Let me help you fix this. Really? Yes, just give me a second. She leaves the room, and I stare out the patio door, watching Squint. He runs through the grass, still chasing moths as they flutter up into the air. He plays for a while, and I think about what Jera might be able to do to fix my problem. What is she thinking? I don't know what good she can do. I've lied to Dustin. Nothing she can do will fix that. Squint walks along the cement surrounding one of Jera's pools. He pants, and I can tell he's thirsty when he sniffs the pool water. I slide open the door. Come here, boy, I yell. I have water for you. Squint runs to me, and I fill up his water dish. I set it on the floor. When I turn back around, Dustin is standing in the doorway. I couldn't get a hold of you. Are you done with your phone call? Panic seizes me as Jera walks around the corner. Chapter 35 Time slows as my heart stops dead in my chest. Jera squeals and shoves her sunglasses down over her bruised eyes. Dustin's gaze bounces back and forth between the two of us. I'm frozen in place. The only sound is Squint happily lapping from his bowl. Jera? Dustin asks, the weight of a thousand question marks pressing down on the word. What? Jera and I both answer. Dustin's eyes fix on me. What's going on here? My heart races a million miles a second, and I can't think straight. Jera holds out a hand. This isn't what it looks like. It looks like you have a twin, Dustin says matter-of-factly. Well, then it is what it looks like, Jera says. But Mackenzie didn't mean to lie to you. She was doing me a favor. Mackenzie? His features slowly register what's going on, and my heart drops to my toes when he clenches his jaw. His gaze pierces through me. You're Mackenzie. A zing of pain shoots across my chest and my mouth goes dry. I can't hide it any longer. I have to admit it. He stares at me, his gaze fierce, and I nod as tears well up in my eyes. You switch places. He narrows his eyes at me. You lied to me. Jera scoffs. It wasn't a big deal. Get over it. She didn't do half of what you did to me, which, by the way, she holds up a hand. I've decided to forgive you for. I've called my attorney and dropped the lawsuit. Dustin doesn't take his eyes off me. That's great since I've given in to all your demands. Was that what this was about? The stupid fence? I shake my head. No, I say quickly. Then what, Jera? I mean, Mackenzie. Why did you lie to me? He shifts his stance. Jera folds her arms across her chest. I can't believe you're making this all about you. How egotistical. Dustin steps back like he was slapped. I glare at Jera. She's not helping me like she said she would. She's making everything worse. Dustin takes in the two of us for another moment before shaking his head. I don't know how I ever mistook you for your sister. He turns to leave and panic envelops me. Wait! I yell. Don't go! He frowns at me but hesitates at the door. What? You got what you wanted? What more can you possibly need from me? Tears fill my eyes as my chest grows heavy. It's hard to breathe. I can't think of the right thing to say. I don't know what can make this all better. I never meant to lie to him, and yet all I've done this entire time is deceive him. The pain of it shows on his face, and it makes me cry even harder. I'm sorry, I whisper. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry too, Mackenzie. He uses my name like a weapon. I'm sorry for everything. He leaves, and I crumple to the floor, my heart shattering. Jera rushes to my side. Mackenzie, honey, forget about him. He's such a jerk. I cover my face with my hands and sob. No, I choke out. He's not. You don't know how awful I was, how much I lied to him. It's all my fault. Squint comes up to me and licks my hands. He must sense my distress. I pet him, 
and try not to have a total mental breakdown. You always take the blame, Jera pokes me in the shoulder. He's being unreasonable. I put my face back into my hands. I don't care. I love Dustin so much, Jera, and he hates me. Oh, sweetie, it will be okay. She puts an arm around me. I don't know how. He thinks we're horrible. Come on, let's go in the living room and sit. You need to calm down. Jera convinces me to have a cup of tea while we sit on her comfy couch. I curl my legs under me and Squint jumps on my lap. I sip the tea and try to calm down, but the hole in my chest won't let me feel better. I know you think you're in love, Jera says, sitting next to me. But really, you'll see clearly when you get home and can spend some time away from him. He's handsome, I'll give you that. Anyone would be charmed by him. It was more than that, I say, my heart in my throat. I'm so tired of crying, but the tears run down my cheeks anyway. Jera shakes her head and changes tactics. If he really loves you, he'll forgive you. I stare at her chandelier and contemplate what she said. Dustin and I had something going, but maybe he didn't feel the same toward me. What if he doesn't love me? I ask, my voice small. Then find someone who does. She pats my knee. If he doesn't love you, he's not the right one for you. Her logic makes sense, but there's something she's missing, and I can't quite put it into words. What Dustin and I had was magic. He was everything I needed, right when I needed it. I know I lied to him too many times to count, but I wonder if he'll ever know the truth, that I did really fall in love with him. He completed me. Pain shoots through me, and I let another tear fall. Dustin was so kind to me. He grounded me. He was my knight in shining armor. He literally saved me. I swirl my tea and stare at the tea bag. I don't know how I'm going to go home. Even now, I miss him so much it aches. Chapter 36 Six months later I clear my throat as my therapist waits for me to answer her question. It's been three weeks since my last session, and so much has happened. I'm doing good. How's the medicine? Do you think the new dose is helping more with your anxiety? I nod. Yes. How have things been going with your artwork? Did you sell any when you had your show? I take in a deep breath as excitement rushes through me. I sold them all. You did? That's amazing. Tell me about it. I was nervous for the opening night party, but the gallery owner promised she'd keep it low-key. She really came through. It was fine. And the gallery was amazing to work with. They told me I could do another show any time. I sit back in my chair, pleased with myself for getting up the nerve to even try it. Dustin did that for me. He gave me the confidence to push beyond my fears. How was your vacation with your sister? She brushes her hair behind her ear and looks up from her clipboard. I smile. It was good. We got to talk. I mean, really talk. We haven't done that in a long time. That's good. She pushes her glasses up her nose. Have you told her what you told me? About your father? Yes, I say quietly. We did talk about my father. In talking with my therapist, I found out I had a lot of repressed anger toward him. I worked through a lot of it with her, but one of the assignments she gave me was to talk to my sister about it. It did help, and I found out that Jera was actually seeing a therapist about it as well. I hadn't known that. Was it good to talk it out with her? I nod and wave my phone. I even shared his photo with her. She cried when she saw I had it. She thought all of the old photos were destroyed. We know what he did was wrong, and neither one of us are ready to have him back in our lives, but I think we're both to the point where we accept what happened and can move on. Good. Did you talk about Dustin? A stab of pain slices through me at his name. I look down at my hands. Yes. How did that go? It's still hard to talk about Dustin, even though six months have passed. I told her more of what happened during that time we were together. I think she was surprised at how close we got in one week. It certainly surprised me. What does your sister think about him? I think she's finally ready to admit all the issues between them were misunderstandings. She no longer hates him. In fact, she told me she thinks I should try again with him. I force a laugh, but my therapist doesn't join in. 
She nods and writes something down. Have you thought about trying to get in touch with him again? After the story broke on all the gossip websites about me trading places with Jera and how Dustin had been used once again by another gold digger, I hid myself away in Denver as best I could. Of course, the websites got it all wrong, but I refused to give any interviews. I didn't want any more publicity. I just wanted it all to blow over and go away. Dustin sold his house and moved. Then, a couple of months later, I tried texting him, but he'd changed his number. That was the last time I tried. No, I say quietly. She gives me one of her looks. Don't you think you should try to talk to him and tell him how you feel? I'd spent the last six months trying to get over Dustin. It hadn't worked. If anything, I feel a stronger pull to him than I did before. I've told my therapist how I feel. I swallow, trying to get my emotions under control. I don't know what else I can do. I think it's clear he doesn't want to talk to me. She sets her clipboard in her lap. We all make rash decisions in the heat of anger. We've talked about mind reading. It's a destructive thought pattern. Through talking with my therapist, I found that I often mind read, or rather, I put thoughts of my own onto other people. I can't possibly know what others are thinking, but I assume anyway. I slump back in my seat. You're right. You won't know his thoughts until you talk to him. It's been six months. He might regret his decision to cut you off. I nod, even though I'm not sure what else I can do. It's not like just anyone can get Dustin Sawyer's phone number. He did everything he could to get away from me. Still, I have to admit my therapist is right. I know. I just don't know what to do. I can't call him. She looks at me over her glasses. You have a very famous sister. I'm sure Jera knows how you can contact him. I chew my bottom lip. She's right. I haven't asked my sister. Maybe. Do you think you're trying to punish yourself for what happened? I hadn't thought about it before, but she might be right. I felt so terrible about lying to Dustin. I've let it eat away at me. Remorse is a drink I partake of daily. I cry myself to sleep almost every night. I hate all the lies I told him. I regret it every waking second. I look at the brown and green carpet. Maybe, I finally admit. You can't change the past. But you might be able to reconnect and salvage a relationship that was once very special to you. I want you to think about that this week. She looks at her watch. Our time is up. I stand, my emotions making my throat swell shut. Okay, I say. I'll think about it. My therapist stands and puts a hand on my arm. Mackenzie, things are usually not as bad as we make them out to be in our head. Remember that? I nod. I'll try. I drive home, the streets slick from an afternoon snowfall. The homes in my neighborhood are decorated with colorful lights for Christmas. I pull into my parking lot, my therapist's words echoing. Things are not usually as bad as we make them out to be in our head. Yeah, right, I say out loud. I climb out of my car and walk into my apartment building. Jera wanted to upgrade my apartment after all the awful publicity went down, but I felt bad and wouldn't let her. I walk into the tiny living room and shrug out of my coat. I hang it on the back of my door as Squint barks and jumps on my legs. I reach down and pet his head. You hungry? He continues to bark, and I laugh. I guess so. I go into the kitchen and pour a scoop of his food into his bowl. He scarfs it down. I reach into my pocket to give him a doggy treat, and am reminded of the time I spent on the beach with Dustin. The memory crushes me, and I sink to the floor, the weight of my betrayal making it hard to breathe. Tears fall as I remember that day, running on the beach, and Dustin's warm laughter. I miss him, like I miss the other half of my soul that was ripped from me the day I left California. I want to see his smile and hear the low chuckle in his chest. I want to feel his strong arms around me. The question my therapist asked comes to mind. Do you think you're trying to punish yourself for what happened? If that's what I'm doing, it's working. I feel terrible. I'm wallowing in my own personal hell, and I don't want to be in it anymore. I wipe my face and stand up. With shaking fingers, I swipe across my phone and call my sister. She answers after one ring. 
Hello? I need your help. Chapter 37 I grip my clutch purse and take in a deep breath before I step out of the limousine. Flashes of light go off and I force a smile for the cameras. This is Jera's idea for how I can get to talk to Dustin. We're switching places once again, only this time it's for a big Hollywood after-party for some awards show. I don't know all the details. All I know is that Dustin is slated to be here, and Jera got an invitation so I could slip in and take her place. I walk the red carpet, glad I took my anxiety medication. It doesn't take care of everything, but it makes the social situation at least bearable. The rest of my coping mechanisms have come from my therapist. I imagine I'm alone in a garden, a light breeze blowing, just me and the garden hedges. I walk inside the building. There are more cameras inside and I pose like Jera showed me, letting them get a few shots before moving on. Finally, after winding my way through all the people I get to the elevators. The party is at an upscale rooftop lounge and I give myself a pep talk before I step out of the elevators. A long table stretches along one side of the roof and an array of food is displayed. Light piano music plays and I look around to see where it's coming from. A piano sits in the corner, a man in a tuxedo playing it. The crowds of people are kind of making me want to crawl out of my skin, but I take in a deep breath and let it out slowly, like my therapist taught me. It helps. I scan the roof to see if I can spot Dustin. I don't see him, and I worry he skipped the after party. What will I do if he doesn't show? I've gone to all this work to talk to him. I can't go home without at least trying. The elevator dings behind me, and I move, so the next group of people can have room. I walk past a few tables with groups of people mingling. They're the tall kind of tables you stand around. My eye catches sight of someone standing near the edge of the roof, overlooking the city lights, and I know it's him, even though all I can see is his back. He's alone, and my heart leaps. This is it. This is my chance. I cross the rooftop, sidestepping around people. They're hedges, I tell myself. I'm in a garden. I manoeuvre to where Dustin stands, a glass of champagne in his hand. My heart pounds as I stare at his back. I don't know what to say to get his attention. I take in his posture and the way his hair is blowing in the slight breeze. He looks good. My chest aches as I stand there, my eyes drinking him in. What I wouldn't do to feel his arms around me once again. Dustin turns around and freezes when he sees me. His eyes slide over me before an invisible wall comes between us, and his expression turns hard. Jera, he says in greeting. He's about to walk around me when I grab his arm. No, I shake my head. I'm not Jira. My heart jumps into my throat and I can't breathe. Dustin blinks and steps back from me, the shock evident on his face. Mackenzie, he says softly. I nod, then swallow, trying to clear the lump in my throat. It doesn't work. Yes. He glances around the roof. Why are you here? I need to talk to you. I need to apologize for what I did. Tears threaten to come, but I blink them back. I don't want to cry. I've cried far too much since I left California. I need to be strong now. I have things I need to say. Dustin stares at me, and I can't quite interpret the look he gives me. You came here to apologize? Yes, and to tell you the truth, I never got to tell you my side of the story. Dustin slowly nods as piano music drifts our way. All right, go ahead. A group of people walk behind me and I stiffen, my anxiety ramping up. I close my eyes and picture my garden again while breathing slowly. They move on toward the food and I open my eyes again. I'm fine, I tell myself. It works and I'm able to breathe again. When Jera first asked me to switch places with her, I said no, I don't do well in airplanes, and she wanted me to go to a party in her place. Well, you saw how I did at the party. He raises his eyebrows. Speaking of which? He motions to the party going on around us. Yeah, therapy. I went. I mean, I'm still going, and I'm now taking medication. Dustin smiles, but it doesn't reach his eyes. I'm glad. Anyway, I said no to her, but she kept asking me, pleading with me, 
and trying to buy me off. Finally, her offer was too good to refuse, so I said yes. Dustin grimaces. What did she pay you to seduce me? I shake my head. No, it wasn't like that. She only wanted me to go to the party and do the photo shoot, so no one would know she had plastic surgery done on her eyes. He looks at me like he doesn't understand. Plastic surgery? Don't you remember the bruises around her eyes? They botched her eyelids. Anyway, she gets me to go take her place. You still didn't tell me what she paid you, Dustin says over the piano music. I want to get the whole story out, so it flusters me that he's asking questions. New paints, the ones I bought with you. Dustin surveys me like he doesn't understand. You did all that for paint? I really wanted an upgrade. He chuckles and shakes his head. Only you would do that. I need to press on, or I won't be able to finish. At any rate, the next thing I know, I'm hanging out a window, and my phone plummets into the pool. Jera told me she'd text me how to contact her driver, so he'd take me to the gala, but my phone is toast. I'm dead meat. I panic, but then you're there, and you say you're going to that gala, and... Well, I had no choice. I don't realise I'm squeezing my hands together until they hurt. I let go and shake the pain out. Dustin doesn't say anything, so I continue. I'm so sorry I didn't tell you the truth, but I wasn't supposed to interact with you. I was never supposed to even meet you. I was only there to be the body double, swim in her pool and make it look like she was at home when really she was getting her eyes done. I had the one party and one photo shoot. That was all. What happened with the photo shoot? Jera cancelled it after everything blew up. I couldn't do it, and her bruises were still horrible. I just left and went home. I was an emotional mess. I couldn't stop crying. A breeze picks up and I rub my arms. The little black cocktail dress Jera made me wear isn't made for warmth. Dustin shrugs out of his tux jacket and places it around my shoulders. You look cold. I desperately try not to cry as I'm enveloped in the smell of Dustin's cologne and the scent that only comes from him. I've spent the last six months trying to remember what he smelled like, trying to find it in the stores. I never succeeded. I pull his jacket tight around my shoulders. Thanks. So, he says, running a hand over the back of his neck. None of this was about the fence? I shake my head. No, I didn't know anything about your land war with Jera. In fact, she finally admitted to me that she only sued you because she got so upset about that party you threw. Something about a Barbie costume and her plastic surgery. Oh, and the wine. She thought you were targeting her, trying to humiliate her. Dustin shakes his head. No, that's not what happened. I know, and I do think she finally realises that now. The conversation lulls as the piano music swells, and I look at Jera's black shoes. I don't want to say what comes next. This is the last thing I have to say, and then it will all end. I'll have to leave. Was anything you said to me true? Dustin asks quietly. My head snaps up. Oh yes. I sucked at being Jera. Most of what I told you was really about me. Jera was the one who hated our small town growing up. She couldn't wait to get out of there and move on to stardom. She's the one who loves all the fancy parties and the glitzy life. I live a quiet life of solitude. My true love has always been art and watercolour. I only lied when you asked direct questions about Jera, or when the truth would have given me away. Another crowd of people moves in behind me. I close my eyes and wait, but they don't leave. I try my breathing exercise, and it helps, but they continue to talk loudly behind me, and it's unnerving. Dustin takes my arm and guides me closer to the edge of the rooftop, away from the crowd. I can breathe easier and I give him a small smile. He leans onto the cement wall and gazes at the city lights. It's a beautiful evening. Yes. I bite my lower lip, knowing I have to finish what I came to say, even if I don't want to. Last time I didn't speak up, and I've regretted it for all these months. Still, my throat is too tight to continue, plus the music seems to be louder now. I've thought about what happened between us quite a bit. He doesn't look at me. Me too, I admit. There were things that never really made sense to me. Like what? Dustin turns to me, ignoring my question. 
Do you want to go somewhere? He clears his throat. Somewhere quieter? Yes, I say, before I can think about it. I do. Chapter 38 Dustin and I leave the party in his limousine. I'm a nervous wreck knowing what I have to say to him. I tug his jacket around my shoulders, breathing in the smell of him. It might be the last time I get to. He's been kind to me, but distant, and that distance feels like a million miles. I'm sure Jera told you I moved, Dustin says as he looks out the window. Yes, you changed your phone number too. He turns to me. You tried to call? I texted. Some teen named Candy said it was the wrong number. The pain from that day comes back into my chest. That was the day I knew it was all over. What did you text? I shift in my seat. I'd spent an entire evening crafting a text message to him. I typed it out, then deleted it, then typed it out again, about a hundred times. When I finally hit send, I was a mess. I don't remember, I say quietly. He lets his gaze drop. Did you finally get a new phone? I pull the same old phone out of my clutch and hand it to him. It still works, he chuckles. I bought you a new one, you know? I gasp. Really? Yes, I was going to give it to you after that dinner, but then everything happened and... His voice trails off. What happened to it? I threw it in the garbage disposal. He cringed. That was not my best moment. Broke both the phone and the disposal. If I had any doubts about how Dustin felt about me after our awful parting, I didn't now. He hated me. He slides my phone back to me on the seat between us. I take it and put it back in my clutch purse. It's now a symbol of our distance. I think I'll save up for a new one. The audition? You did well when we read lines. What was that about? You read it with such emotion. I got choked up. I wasn't really acting. I was pulled into the moment because of you. I honestly haven't had one single acting class. Wow. He doesn't look at me. You were good. You have natural talent. I bet you could get some jobs if you wanted. Yeah, the Hollywood life isn't for me. Dustin nods, still avoiding my gaze. The silence returns between us. I hold in my tears. I don't know what I can do to fix the past. All I can do is try to explain, which I've already done. The car pulls up to Dustin's house. He turns to me. Is this okay? I didn't expect him to bring me to his house. It's much more intimate than I was thinking, but it makes hope spring to my soul. Yes. This home looks more traditional than his last house, with white paint and huge columns extending up to the second floor. A large fountain sits beside the driveway. His driver opens the door for us and we climb out. Dustin unlocks his front door for me. This is beautiful, I say as I enter. His entryway stretches up two floors with tall, skinny windows at the top. I walk through to his massive living room area. He has another grand staircase that curves up to the second floor. He must like that style. A modern chandelier hangs down, lighting the room. I stop short when I see a watercolour painting hung on his wall. It's the one I painted of the fish we saw at Catalina Island. You bought one of my paintings? My voice sounds so small in the large room. I take another step in, and on the opposite wall hangs my painting of the beach with squint running along the sand. I bought them all. My heart lodges itself in my throat. Dustin doesn't hate me. He can't hate me if he bought my paintings to look at every day. I turn to him, fueled by this revelation. I fell in love with you, I blurt out. I mean, that week we were together. I didn't mean to. I tried not to, but I did. I shake my head because I'm not getting it quite right. I mean, I still do. I'm in love with you. I love you too, Mackenzie. My brain is so filled with everything I want to say, I don't process what he said. I can't get you out of my head. I regret what happened between us. I mean, not the good things. I regret not telling you the truth about me, and about everything. As soon as I started having feelings for you, I should have told you. I was so wrong, and I've cried myself to sleep every night since then. Dustin puts his hands on my shoulders. I'm still wearing his jacket. It's okay. 
I love you too, Mackenzie, he repeats. I stare at him, his words finally sinking in. You do? He nods. I haven't stopped thinking about you either. I moved because I couldn't stand to see that gate with a lock on it. It broke me every time I looked at it. Even though I thought you took advantage of me, a part of me didn't fully believe it. Really? Tears fill my eyes and spill down my cheeks. I couldn't reconcile the person I knew with the things I thought you'd done. I kept telling myself you used me, but I couldn't understand it. I thought I was losing my mind. I thought I was so gullible that I couldn't remember things right. But tonight, things finally fell into place. I know you weren't trying to get anything from me. You, coming here, and going to that party to talk to me. You don't know what that means to me. You've conquered so much, and I'm proud of you for it. I'm so sorry I lied. He cups my cheeks. I forgive you, for all of it. My heart sings. He forgives me. Tears spill down my cheeks. If you hadn't switched places with Jera, I never would have met you. I need you in my life. I know that now. I think I've always known it. I just didn't understand. I shrug out of his tux jacket, letting it fall to the floor. I slide my arms around his neck. He leans down and presses his lips against mine. I cling to him, hardly able to believe we're finally together. I dreamed of this for so long. And now Dustin is right here, and he loves me. My soul screams for joy as his lips pass over mine. He is everything I want, all that I need. The world will be right as long as he's in my life. Epilogue One year later, I stand before my painting of the rocky ocean shore near Dustin's new home as flashes of light blind me. Dustin slides his arm around me, pulling me to him. The gallery director stands on my other side. A podium sits a few feet in front of me. A crowd of people stand before us, but the director kept it to invitation only, so it's manageable for me. In the back, my gaze connects with my sister and I smile. She's been one of my biggest supporters as I've advanced my career. I'm glad she came. I look to her left. She's standing beside my mother and stepfather, and I do a double take. I didn't know they were coming. A thrill goes through me. Dustin is always setting up surprises for me. I lean toward him. Thank you for bringing my family. He squeezes my hand. I didn't want them to miss this. The director speaks for a bit, introduces me, and lets me take the floor. Reporters take my picture. Mackenzie, which artist inspired you? A reporter asks. Many, but I remember seeing a display from John Singer Sargent as a child, and it moved me. It was the reason I started painting. What's your favourite subject to paint? Someone else calls out. I prefer landscapes. There are so many beautiful places in the world. I like to capture them on paper. Are you through switching places with your sister? A reporter in the back calls out. The director steps forward. Only art-related questions, please. I answer a few more questions, and the press part of my gallery showing is done. I walk through the art gallery, talking with the guests and answering more questions. Dustin stays by my side and takes my hand when he thinks I'm getting overwhelmed. As soon as we have a moment alone, he turns to me. You've done a fantastic job, Mackenzie. I can hardly see any signs of your anxiety. I smile. So happy I've made it this far. Really? Yes. I'm so proud of you. I turn to look at the walls of the gallery. Every wall is filled with one of my paintings. It's my first solo show and my largest one yet. It's a satisfying feeling I can't even describe. It's been a year since Dustin and I started dating and I moved to LA. I've been painting and working on getting my own show in the hot Los Angeles market. It hasn't been easy, but I did it without Dustin or Jera pulling strings on my behalf. We mingle some more, and the crowd wanes. I try to find my family, but they seem to have disappeared. Disappointment fills me. I wanted to talk to them. As the last of the people come by to congratulate me, relief floods through me. We're almost done with the hard part. The director is the last one to come up to us. Congratulations, Mackenzie. We've sold over half of your paintings tonight. I'm sure more will go as we keep the display through next week. My heart feels light. 
Is that good? Very good. You should be proud. Dustin hugs me to him. I'm so happy for you. The director smiles at us. Let me go see these last guests out. Then the place is yours. I stare at her, not understanding what she means, but Dustin nods and smiles. Thank you. I look up at him. What's going on? There's something I want to do. So, I rented the gallery. Confused, I stare at the sly smile on his face. What do you want to do? You'll see. He kisses my forehead in a sweet gesture. I grow excited as I wait for whatever Dustin is going to do. Over the past year, he's given me many surprises. I figured out it's one of his love languages. And he knows how to give the best surprises. When we hear the click of the front door locking, Dustin ushers me through the maze of gallery rooms to a room in the back with all my sea turtle paintings. Dustin and I have a special thing going with sea turtles. It's like a secret I love you every time I paint them. The lights are dim, and as we enter the room, I notice Jera standing against the wall with my mother and stepfather. Jera is holding Squint in his carrier. Before I can say anything, Dustin drops to one knee. He takes my hand and tears spring to my eyes. Mackenzie, I can't imagine my life without you. You brought all the colour back into my life, and even though we met in unusual circumstances... Falling out a bathroom window, Jera says behind her hand. Everyone laughs. I'm so glad we did, Dustin says, continuing. I can't go on any longer without you as my wife. Mackenzie, will you marry me? Dustin pulls out a small white box and opens it. A sapphire engagement ring sits inside. I blink back the tears, but it's too late. They're flowing down my cheeks. I throw my arms around him. Yes, yes, I will marry you. I kiss his cheek. My mother and Jera clap their hands. About time, Jera says. I was betting on this months ago. Dustin stands and gives me a proper kiss. Jera hoots while everyone claps and I blush and pull away. Squint wiggles and barks. Jera lets him down. He runs to Dustin, who pulls a dog treat out of his pocket. I laugh as Squint eats his treat. I think you're officially his favourite now. Good. He brushes a strand of hair from my face. I hope I'm your favourite too. Absolutely. Forever and ever. Dustin gives me another kiss. Everything melts away, and it's just me and Dustin. He is my other half, my anchor, and my sunlight. Without him, my world is dreary and cold, and I'm so glad my twin sister convinced me to switch her places so I could meet him. The end. You have been listening to My Twin Sister's Extremely Famous and Incredibly Hot Neighbor by Victorine E. Liskey. If you have enjoyed this book, please consider leaving a review on Amazon. As an indie author, I rely heavily on word of mouth. It would be incredible if you would share this video with others, on social media, or just tell your friends about it. I don't have a massive budget for advertising like a large publishing house. I do everything myself. Thank you for listening. It means a lot to me. Check out the links in the description for more ways to support me.